You must remember that the journey itself has meaning. You will see for yourself the true nature of this world. Those who are born to remember will remember. Wait! Don't go! Give my sister back! Perhaps that was the glory he had yearned to witness. In his last moments, what expression was on his face? Freedom is demanded of you by an Archon. There's really no freedom at all. You are one who crosses the Celestial Atlas, and who passes through countless worlds. If our history is engraved in your memory, it will one day accompany you into another world. Hey, I'm Maverick, and this is the Lord of the Rings Trilogy, Extended Edition. And you have my bow. And my cup. You're probably here because you either like Genshin Impact or you've seen the first large video. If you haven't seen that first large video, this is technically a part two. But the first video covers everything that happens in Mondstadt and Liyue. This video will cover everything in Inazuma, but also everything that happens right before it, and everything in the Chasm and in Konomiya, basically everything before Sumeru. You probably think six hours for a summary, you watch all the events. Yeah, you go and you watch all the cutscenes for this game. The only main change to this video compared to the first, other than I would say quality, is the fact that this video will only feature the male traveler and won't feature the female traveler. This is primarily because this video is almost all just my footage and I chose the male traveler. The rest of the footage in this video is from a G YouTuber named G Walkthrough. <laughs> Oh brother, this guy stinks! G Walkthroughs is absolutely dedicated to this game, probably more than I've seen anyone else. If you check out their channel, they literally have gone through the entire game and uploaded almost every part of their playthrough, it seems. They have over 1,200 videos just dedicated to their entire playtime in Genshin, which is insane. So if you actually did want to do what I said, where you go back and just watch everything, you can absolutely do it through their channel, which is actually really cool for like preservation purposes. Aside from that, I also made a Discord server. So if you want to join that and join a community, you can check it out. Again though, this video is very long <laughs> and it was all made by me, aside from some of the footage from G walkthroughs. So it took me a very, very long time. And Obviously, the story of Genshin isn't over yet, so I'm going to need to make a volume three in the future. Uh, to do that is going to take a long time, just like it took this one, except it would be nice to have some help for the next one. So I set up a Patreon. For just a few dollars a month, you'll be able to have influence over future videos, as well as being able to see videos before they release on YouTube. So if you really love these huge videos or just my videos in general, I would really appreciate it because I'm poor and destitute. Oh, and by the way, just like the first video, make sure to go to the description or the chapters to get around the video. Uh, I don't expect people to watch this in one sitting, <laughs> like at all. But if you do, comment about it and share the video. Without further ado though, here's Genshin Impact Retold, Volume 2. Outlanders do not belong in this world. <laughs> One day, this journey will reach its end. Until the Abyss has engulfed the thrones, my war with destiny will see no end. Your Highness, our plan to recognize the dragon has been impeded. By the Animo Archon? He rises again for the dragon's sake? No, not the Archon. We were well prepared for his interference. Regrettably, Your Highness, the issue is... Outlanders, 
Your journey ends here. You mean? <sighs> we will be reunited, dear brother. But not here. Not now. We will meet at this journey's end. Once the dust has settled, then you will understand. Across the ocean, surrounded by a perpetual tempest, ruled by the Electro Archon, lies the land of eternity, Inazuma. To uncover the mysteries of this world like their sibling demanded, and to find the mysterious unknown god, the Traveler wishes to make this arduous journey to the island nation. Beto, the captain of the Crux fleet, has agreed to ferry them there, but needs to finish some preparations before they can undock. The ship preparations for the storms surrounding the region need to be completed, but recently she also made clear to the pair that she has a secret mission that must be completed before they can depart. So the Traveler and Paimon decide to stock up on provisions for their trip and return to the city of wind and freedom, Mondstadt. While in Mondstadt, Paimon wants to meet with Timaeus to see if he can make a food preserver for the trip. In town, the pair notice Albedo leaving Timaeus' lab. Timaeus and Sucrose were having a discussion about their recent research projects with him, but Paimon is worried that Albedo might have been upset though, since he wasn't looking his normal, happy self. Lonely individuals. Those who aren't like ordinary people. Just like uh, you and me. Paimon asks Timaeus if he can make the food preserver for her, but neither Timaeus or Sucro say that they can. Sucrose explains that even though all three of them are researchers in alchemy, they each have a different focus, and that alchemy can't do literally everything. She says that before Albedo showed up in Mondstadt, people there didn't think alchemy was useful at all. But Albedo changed the minds of those in the region to come around to its usefulness and beauty. Sucro suggests maybe asking Albedo anyway about the preserver, since he's so knowledgeable. At the mountain base camp, the group bumps into Amber with the leader of Mondstadt's branch of the Adventurer's Guild, Cyrus, who explains that the Adventurer's Guild is currently holding winter training on the mountain. The training entails junior members of the guild teaming up with senior members so everybody can stay safe in the dangerous terrain. When Amber was patrolling the mountain earlier, she found a boy named Joel, who actually lives at the base camp. Joel's father is currently missing and was last seen on Dragonspine some time ago. Amber promised Joel that she would make a snowman with him after she escorted him back, and the Traveler decides to join her to help cheer him up since his dad is gone. When meeting up with Joel, the group encounters Eula, who Amber invited. So she says to Eula, Do you wanna, wanna come help? over and cheer up this dumb orphan child? And Eula's like, yeah, sure, I guess. Eula is acting out of character with Joel, and she says that it's because Joel doesn't know her, that he hasn't spent much time in Mondstadt, so he doesn't know her poor reputation. She doesn't have to act like a villain to him. She can just be herself without the judgments people have made about her getting in the way. Cyrus interrupts the pair, saying that they actually need one more instructor for the training on the mountain, since some one is a no-show. The Traveler gives up the instructor spot to Eula with the hopes of helping her rehabilitate her image in Mondstadt, and so she signs on to train a new adventurer named Gerald. While catching up to Amber and Joel, the pair hears strange noises in the mountains. But when tracking the noise down, they find Albedo, who seems to be in a much better mood than he was in the city. He says he's there to just finish up some artwork for a friend, since Dragonspine is a place that helps him gather his thoughts, gain inspiration, and actually get some materials to make paint, mainly an ore called Star Silver. Using it can result in really high quality paint, but due to its color saturation, it can also sometimes be viewed as a fake or defective product. Paimon suggests that the Traveler take some painting lessons from Albedo, and they all all go to his campsite on the mountain because they have nothing else going on. Hello? Is anybody gonna make a snowman with me? Dad? 
At the camp, they noticed that Albedo must have had a sick-ass party the night before, but it turns out he was robbed, which is less sick. Some of Albedo's valuable alchemy notes have been snatched, so they follow fresh footprints from the camp to a cave, where Albedo enters to pursue the thief while the pair guard the entrance to make sure that the thief doesn't exit. While waiting for Albedo, the pair gather some star silver nearby for painting when they notice that Albedo has already returned. He says he was unable to apprehend the thief. Paimon asks if Albedo wants them to throw out the star silver that they just got, since it isn't the highest quality and will likely lead to paintings that are viewed as fake because of it. But Albedo gets, well, he gets weirdly philosophical and says that once people start comparing things against one another, they'll only want what's good and they won't stop comparing things. They'll think that useless things should be disposed of. Suddenly someone cries for help and it turns out to be Bennett stuck behind bars again. It was obviously due to an unlucky set of circumstances. Bennett explains that he came to the mountain to be an instructor for the training here. Turns out Bennett was the instructor that was thought to be a no-show. During their convo though, Albedo just dips out, not seeming to care if Bennett is okay at all. The group notices that he left, but just then he exits from the cave again. And he seems confused, as if he didn't just speak to everyone. Just then, oh geez. Jesus. Eula starts accusing Albedo of scheming, saying he just kidnapped Joel and took him to an area crawling with monsters. And when she tried to stop him, Albedo attacked her and fled. But Albedo makes it clear that that wasn't him, that it was likely an imposter. <laughs> They explain the situation to Eula and surmise that this imposter was likely the same thief who stole Albedo's alchemy notes. Just then, oh, just fucking stop. Amber is glad to see that Bennett is okay. She said that she was looking for him, worried that he had run into trouble, which he totally had. Eula, Bennett, and Amber head to the base camp to inform the branch master about Bennett's safety, and Albedo asks the pair to come with him to his camp to discuss something important. He wishes to come clean about something, something that he says he couldn't talk about before with the pair. A secret that he's kept from almost everyone. Albedo is a synthetic human being, a being made by a researcher from Conria, a woman by the name of Rhindaughter, colloquially known as Gold. Alchemy is what created Albedo. When he was created, Conria had already been destroyed, so he doesn't remember it. Rhindaughter raised Albedo and taught him alchemy, and so he lives for the pursuit of knowledge. Albedo wasn't the only one created by Rhindaughter, though, as there was one other, Durin, the dragon whose resting place is here on Dragonspine. Which means Albedo and Durin are brothers. This also means that while Albedo looks after Klee and is considered family by her and Alice, he's not biologically linked to either. The Traveler and Paimon are clearly shocked, but they also trust Albedo. Albedo tells them that they can leave though, that they don't have to be burdened with helping him. But the Traveler makes it clear that they're staying and that they're not letting him deal with this alone. They're in this for the long haul. Albedo suggests then that since the pair have made up their minds to help him, that maybe they should join the training on the mountain as pretext to investigate. So the pair conduct training exercises, but at every corner they see and hear nothing about the imposter. They return to Albedo and tell him their findings, or rather lack thereof, but Albedo has found new footprints. So he wants to rule out the adventurers on the mountain. And the only way to do that is to look at their feet. Come on, Traveler. <laughs> Get those heelys off and look at them toes. While investigating the footprints, they find Amber, Eula, and Bennett again. They still haven't made it to the base camp because of Bennett's bad luck, so they all decide to just rest at Albedo's camp for now. They grab a bite to eat, compliment Albedo's cooking, and then the traveler spends time speaking with everyone. Albedo is still conflicted about how he feels about everything, and Bennett and Eula are holding up well. But Amber says that when she started keeping Joel company earlier, it made her really miss her grandfather. One day, Amber's grandfather father mysteriously went missing and she wonders how he's been doing ever since. Now she just tries to do what she thinks would make him proud. After some time, Amber and Eula go off to go have an ice bath together. Oh my god. Bennett sleeps and Albedo takes this opportunity to try and teach the Traveler and Paimon how to paint. Using Paimon as reference, the Traveler attempts to paint a piece. Mwah. Perfect. Albedo freshens the picture up, and in the morning, the group decides to finally head off to the base camp. I flipped another insignia just outside the camp. Wrong again. So your bad luck is all used up. We'll be down the mountain in no time. <laughs> yeah, my thoughts exactly. Today's the day. Huh? Uh, oh no. Avalanche! Look out! <laughs> Ah! <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Everyone is safe, but Albedo is still nowhere to be seen. They search and search and search, and eventually he does appear. Bennett blames himself for the avalanche, and again, the group assures him that it wasn't his fault, even if it was a result of, you know, so bad luck. The group continues to journey to the base camp, and Albedo suggests that they take a shortcut instead. But after a bit of a hike, Eula stops the group and says that she thinks they need to take a break for Bennett and Amber's sake since they were injured. While they rest, Eula and the Traveler agree that something is not right here. <laughs> They deal with the true shape of the albedo imposter, which turns out to be a whopper flower. Albedo suggests that the whopper flower might have taken his shape due to Durin's blood seeping throughout the mountain. A dead god's influence is incredibly powerful, after all. They link the avalanche and all the other strange occurrences to the whopper flower. Whopper flowers mimic flowers so that they can take over the whole patch. This whopper flower was doing the exact same thing, except with people. It used Albedo's likeness to take over the group in an attempt to take them all out, like a parasite. But some things are still a bit murky about the whole situation though, like why the fake Albedo wanted Joel, or why it felt so different from the Albedo that they spoke to outside of the cave. The Traveler reveals that he began to learn how to tell the imposter apart from the real Albedo, because the real Albedo has a tiny star-shaped mark on his neck, while the imposter didn't have that. Also, the Whopper Flower didn't ask to see his toes, so... At the base camp, Bennett thanks everyone again, thanking them for being so kind, and Albedo for saving him. He says that that's his mission, to continue repaying the kindness that people continue to show him, even though he causes so much trouble due to his bad luck. Albedo speaks to the Traveler about the mark on his neck. He says that his mark is like that of one that's left when glass blowing, that when a piece of art is made with glass blowing, a pontil mark is left. In alchemy, when artificial life is made, the hole where the life force was infused leaves a similar mark. The Whopper Flower didn't copy this mark then because it would mean that it wasn't human. Albedo's star is proof that he's an artificial life form, but it's also proof that he's more than just artificial. That, like glass blowing, he's a piece of art. Eula and Amber show up informing the group that there's an event at the base camp to commemorate the training at Dragonspine. At the base camp, they find that Joel's father, Yosurf, has actually been found. The adventurer named Pallid, the one who yeeted sucrose, says that he found Yosurf because he encountered a hella unlucky situation due to bumping into Bennett. Yosurf initially had memory issues and couldn't even remember his own name. He says that he woke up covered in blood without any memory. But Joel calling out for him made him remember Joel and his wife. Bennett is assured that if it wasn't for him bumping into Pallid, Joel's dad might never have been found, proving that bad luck is just subjective. The mystery of the Albedo imposter still offers up some discrepancies, but the one truth that the pair know is that Albedo can't be truly replicated. Whether created or born, it's the dreams that make the soul, but someone else may dream to be human. My story, yes, I should have known. 
Master's failed specimen in the dragon's belly. This is where the story truly begins. <laughs> if we switched places, if you were the survivor, then as the abandoned experiment, the failure of the primordial human project, I'd want to replace you too. I would replicate your appearance, study your alchemy, and create miraculous life forms to divert your attention. I would wait for the right moment, then dispose of you and the Traveler, the sole person to have known your secret. And then, I could finally experience the joy of being brought into the world. And this is Alfredo with the Albedos! Albe Albedo? Is the Alfredo done? Albedo, did you put a geo construct in the <laughs> oven again? That's so like you, Albedo. <laughs> Today, the Moon Chase Festival is beginning in Liwe. Back in the day, it was a festival where the Adepti sought the way. But now apparently it's just a spruced up Thanksgiving. Zhongling wants the pair to be her culinary consultants in a competition known as the <clears throat> Masterful Chefs competition. The pair accompany Zhongling, as well as her little bear friend named Guoba, to survey townspeople to help her make a new dish for the competition. The first person they meet is Hu Tao, and they ask her what food she likes, and she says, the dead. But also chilies. She mainly likes the spiciness of the knees that pop in her mouth. They ask others, such as Chi Chi, Baiju, and his little snack. Afterwards, they run into Ning Wang Beidou and Kuching next to a large mass. A fishing crew found the boulder recently, and it seems to have an unknown origin. It's apparently unbreakable as well. Oh well, back to the food. Ning Wang says she likes sophisticated but simple foods, while Beidou says that she likes hot and spicy. Women. Kuching asks the Traveler to help with solving the mystery of this monolith. She says that her grandfather was a Liwe researcher and that in his notes, he stated that there was a deity in Liwe named the Stove God. One text claims that a huge slab of stone was found at a shrine for the Stove God, but that the stone was lost. She posits that this might be the same stone. Apparently, in her granddad's notes, he claims that the Stove God Festival was the progenitor of the Moon Chase Festival. Kaching thinks that because Rex Lapis has passed on, it's up to humans to preserve history now, and so she wants to inherit her grandfather's dream and solve the mystery of the Stove God, starting with solving the mystery of this monolith. Zhongling wants to investigate too, because of the Stove God's connection to food, and so they head off to investigate. Their investigation leads them to the Wangshu Inn. A man named Yan Chao, the head chef of the inn, gives the group a text that mentions the Stove God. It says that long ago, the Stove God, due to a certain incident, split itself into many small, child-sized gods. And then they fought 5,000 god-sized horses! <laughs> The story continues that the stove gods then went out and taught people how to create fire. While sitting on that info, Yan Shao treats them all to a meal, and the food f slaps? And Zhang Ling wonders whether he's going to compete in the Masterful Chefs competition. Turns out, he is. But while they were talking, Guoba's dumbass ate Kaching's food, and Zhang Ling promises to make it up to her. Kaching asks if Zhang Ling can make a dish that is in her grandfather's notes as repayment, and Zhang Ling agrees. The group return to Liwe Harbor because Kaching needs to fetch some of her grandfather's notes, but before leaving, she speaks with a traveler in private. She asks them what she needs to do to get along with Zhang Ling. Kaching isn't used to dealing with people as kind and open as Zhang Ling, and because of that, she doesn't really know how to act. 
The traveler tells her, you know, just be yourself and you'll be fine. At the restaurant, the duo asks Zhongling what she thinks of Kaching, and like they thought, she says she likes her, that she's good natured and fun to be around, and that she noticed Kaching was actually sneaking treats to Guoba earlier. Cloud Retainer then randomly swoops in and brags about her supreme cuisine machine and invites the traveler to see it. Yes, this is real. Kaching gives Zhongling her grandfather's recipe, even though some of the text is faded due to age. Zhongling gets the idea that the stove god might have actually been an adeptus like Cloud Retainer and her master, who is Madame Ping. Turns out, Madame Ping actually knew the stove god. She says that all the various festivals that are under the umbrella of Moonchase were originally unified by Rex Lapis to actually honor the stove god. So the festival is now about honoring the past to reflect on the present. Madame Ping also knew Kaching's grandfather and says that they're both really alike, diligent and bold and resolute in the path that they choose. Kaching is unsure of whether she's honoring his legacy though, and whether her and the Qi Sing will truly be able to honor the past. A crack has now appeared on this seemingly unbreakable stone. Madame Ping claims that it occurred due to the action of the masses, that the stove god and the stone draw power from the feelings of the people, and that the joyous atmosphere of the festival seemed to be stirring something within the stone. Back in the harbor, Zhongling makes it through the selection process for the competition. They try to get Beidou to try out some of the dishes that Zhongling just made in preparation for the finals, and they meet a woman named Xinyan in the process. Xinyan is a musician with an intense love for rock and roll. They both try out the dishes and love them. Because they've gotten opinions from people with more exotic tastes, they want to talk to someone with milder tastes. The traveler remembers that Zhao has just that, and has the tastes of a horse. They remember that Zhao said that they could just call his name name when they need help. So the traveler is like, Joe! And he shows up. He tries the food and digs it. He says the proficient cooking reminds him of Yan Chao's. And so the finals of the masterful chef's competition have finally begun after these messages. On the finale of Alfredo with the Albedos, Albedo asks the most important question. Albedo, did you grab the cherry tomato and prego for the Irish Alfredo? The finals are Yan Xiao versus Zhang Ling and Guoba as her assistant. Throughout the challenge, Guoba assists both Zhang Ling and Yan Xiao because of his carefree good nature. Zhang Ling and Yan Xiao finally present their dishes, with Zhang Ling using everything she learned from all of her friends throughout the festival. Yan Xiao's big fat golden balls proved to be super strong as well. But by a one vote margin, the winner is Zhang Ling. Kaching doesn't seem too happy when the duo go to chat with her though. She apparently voted for Yan Chao. She doesn't feel bad about the vote itself, as she truly felt it was an objective choice, but she's afraid of what Zhang Ling might think about it. Kaching tells Zhang Ling about the vote, in that she used her grandfather's philosophy over following the heart to make the decision. But Zhang Ling's totally fine with it. She wanted it to be a fair competition, and having a friend as a judge shouldn't change that, but she loves that Kaching cared about her enough to actually tell her. It means she's a great friend, and that friends don't have to be so hyper vigilant around each other. Kaching can just relax. They go to check the statue, and it hasn't changed at all, which is a bit of a bummer. Zhang Ling decides to make the dish from the notes that Kaching gave her and gives the food to Kaching. Its taste takes Kaching back to her childhood. Kaching's grandfather never actually wrote the recipe, but rather he received it as he was a collector. He loved collecting cultural books and cornerstones and would often discuss history and culture with Kaching and the mysteries that each brought about. That's why he was so interested in the stove god. Her grandfather was trying to restore the recipe and so would have Kaching taste all of his attempts to recreate it when she was a child. That's why the completed dish is hitting her so hard. Zhang Ling claims that this dish has actually been passed down in her family for generations. She actually made this dish on the first day that she met Guoba, the dish being chili mince cornbread buns. She met Guoba on a rainy day. To avoid the weather, she entered a cave and there was an offering table. She placed the buns there and fell asleep, but when she awoke, Guoba was there and had eaten all the buns. <laughs> He's been following her ever since. Stop the conversation! Look! The... the stone! It burst open! It's... it's... Guoba? What are you... what? Mara? 
Madam Ping explains that the stove god looks like Guoba because Guoba is the stove god. It wasn't the festive nature alone that reawakened the statue, as a lot of that is just based on passion. Rather, Kaching's moment of nostalgia about her time with her grandfather and her dream to experience that connection to him in her past is what broke the impenetrable stone. Machosius, god of the stove, born from a spark when stone struck stone. He was a god with a great love for humanity and their well-being. Millennia ago, the people sought to expand their city. They built a dwelling on the plains and called it the Gwaili Assembly. The stove god cared greatly for the people, turning himself into minions who went into every home, fostering food and solidarity alike. Alas, their home was taken by a flood. The waters ravaged the Gwaili Assembly and forced the people back south to Liyue Harbor. Though the distance was not far, the journey was plagued by a terrible storm. For a dozen days, the Adepti stayed by their side. During this time, the stove god cooked an ancient delicacy, flatbread with a meat sauce to stave off the cold and damp, fit for those on the move. Centuries later, disaster and plague arose once more. The stove god would appear no longer, for he placed all of his power into the land itself to quell the calamities. His power expended and his wits greatly reduced, thus his body decreased in size. By the time he parted ways with us, he wasn't even the height of a human. He told Rex Lapis and I of the dishes that bring joy and of the secrets of the flame, then went into the mountains and entered into a long slumber. The stove god departed and Guoba was born. When he awoke, he ate the chili men's cornbread buns placed on the offering table by a young lady in yellow. Though he did not remember the past, he was profoundly moved and decided to follow this young lady thereafter. The stove god had quietly disappeared, but the vendors rose early to hawk their wares. People went out to buy goods, lit their stoves and cooked food, just as they had done every day for as long as they could remember. In Liyue, things have always been this way. Nature provides, the mountains rejoice, we are blessed by heaven's good grace. Years have gone by. The world has transformed. But our way of life survives. Fame and fortune is only a season. It is the moment that we should embrace. Past meets present. Heritage becomes legacy. Long into the future may we thrive. Zhongling wonders why Guoba never told her, but it's because he's essentially not the same anymore. He lost his speech, knowledge, and power, but while that's true, Madame Ping assures her that because of his choice to save humanity and sacrifice his faculties, he's become carefree now and no longer burdened. He can just be free, especially because of Zhongling's companionship. Guoba chose to follow Zhongling because somewhere deep down, he remembered the taste of her dish. Knowing the truth and having a lifelong friend with Zhongling now, Kaching departs. The group goes to see Zhongling's father, since he's good friends with Madame Ping, but on their way there, Guoba saunders over to Zhongli. Zhongli, greeting Guoba as his old friend, is happy to see the group. Zhongli says that Guoba recognizes him in a sense because friendship can always recognize the ravages of time. The moon carries emotion, and wherever its glow is shown, so too are those emotions revealed. Friends of the past, the dreams of those long since past, and the mysteries of history. That is Moon Chase.
Ninglong makes a decisive announcement. The rebuilding of the Jade Chamber will commence. The business leaders of Liyue seem foaming at the mouth to get involved in such a high-profile project. Ninglong is looking for three specific items in the build. Sunset Vermilionite, Wonder Cores, and Adepti Sigils. The items are rare to find, and as a result, the first three people who find them will all be allowed to ask Ninglong a single question that she has to answer honestly, which means a lot considering she has mercantile knowledge beyond anyone in the harbor. The business class is off to the races, and the traveler asks if they too can be involved in the competition. Perhaps they can ask about information about their sibling, and so they decide to search for the three items. The duo see two men hassling someone and go to help, but it appears she can, um, she can help herself. Call an ambulance, but not for me. Regardless, the traveler gets the Millilith involved, to protect the men. Shinha is her name and she's, well, she's a bit off. She seems to have had pretty uh, violent thoughts earlier and doesn't really know what laws are. Shinha is clearly a bit hangry, so they go to get her some uh, medicinal herbs, her choice. Shinha scarfs down some at the pharmacy and says that she doesn't want to eat restaurant food because she doesn't want to yearn for it when she returns to the mountains. Paimon thinks that that means that she's an adeptus, since she's acting so strangely. They tell Shinho about the Jade Chamber contest, and she says that that's why she's in Liwa Harbor, but that she wasn't intending on joining the competition. But since they were so sweet to her earlier and stopped her from, you know, murdering people, she wants to lend them a hand. And so they track down some sunset vermilionite, which happens to be in an old adepti's abode. After Shinho removes the special Adepti art that was concealing the entrance, they begin to explore the abode. Shinho knows a lot about the intricacies of Adepti's domains, and through the use of her knowledge and strength, the group reaches the depths. And voila, let there be Vermilionite. <laughs> Ew. But it's absolutely massive. Shinha says that she'll just carry the damn thing out of there, but the duo are worried about her and don't want her to get hurt. She seems a bit taken aback by their consideration, but she's strong enough to not get hurt. So she lifts the damn thing out of there like a muscle mommy and heads to the building site. People are stunned that Shinha brought the Vermilionite by herself, and it appears that this is the best one that's been found so far, so it will be used for the Jade Chamber. Shinha is praised for what she did, but she doesn't seem to like it. She says that she's praised like this often and that it sets her apart from common people and they often treat her like an adeptus because of it. It clearly frustrates her. Shinha heads to bed, but before the duo do the same, Cloud Retainer swoops in once again. This time, it isn't about her lean cuisine machine, but instead about Shinha's somber story. All of the Adepti know Shinha, and despite the Traveler and Paimon thinking that she might be an Adeptus, she's a human. Paimon is the most surprised, saying that Shinha is kinda a creepy green med mommy, but Cloud Retainer assures her that Shinha has always been weird. She says she found Shinho when she was a child. Cloud Retainer sensed the presence of a god's remains, and when she attempted to track it down, she found a cave, and inside, Shinha, at the age of six, was wielding a knife, opposing a monster who was the incarnate of the god's remains. This battle had been going on for several days. Shinha, at a young age, was able to withstand the conflict due to a homicidal nature and bloodlust. Cloud Retainer says that even without her help, Shinha would have likely beaten the monster alone. Regardless, she saved Shinha from the monster and decided to adopt her. Since that day, Shinha has been trained in adeptal arts, while her homicidal urges have increased. To try and quell this urge, Mooncarver attempted divination, and after its completion, stated, He declared that her fate is to bear the curse of calamity. Consumed by malevolent energy, she is prone to bring harm to those around her. Such is the magnitude of the danger this poses, that her soul must be bound with red ropes to keep her homicidal instinct at bay. The red ropes have indeed served to keep her calmer and more content. They also seem to have rendered her somewhat inexpressive. Perhaps the red ropes are so powerful that they have suppressed some of her other emotions as well. It is only by fate that people's paths may cross. Now that Shen He's path has crossed with yours, please be sure to treasure the gift that fate has given you, and take good care of her.
Cloud Retainer is here to check up on Shinna, but she also expresses that the harbor is currently under a threat that is unbeknownst to most. She wants to see how the new rulers of the harbor will react to this danger. If it's not adequate, she proclaims that the Adepti will take control from the Chising. In the morning, Shinha says that she caught the pair speaking with Cloud Retainer and knows that they learned everything about her. She wanted to tell them the truth initially, that she's not an Adeptus, but usually when she tries to do that, people don't buy it. But what was unusual is that even though the pair did think she was one, they were still kind and treated her as an equal. All three are total buds now, so they skip on back to the building site. The construction is going- holy shit, super fast. Wait, what the fuck? Beto also joined the competition, and with her is a woman named Yunjin, an incredibly famous opera singer in Liwe. Yunjin is also here for the competition and wants to ask Ninglong where she should perform her new opera. She says her father wrote it, and it's a rendition of a Liwe urban legend concerning an evil spirit and an adeptus, the name the Divine Damsel of Devastation. Yunjin suggests that they all just work together to procure the final two items, since they're less rare and them working together will increase their odds of winning. So they do, and the Liwe smithy tells the group the two ingredients that he'll need to make a wonder core, star splinter ore and subrosium. The star splinter is in Mount Tianhong, which Yunjin mentions is where the urban legend she's adapting supposedly took place. Uh, Shinha, you, you alright? Yunjin had been here once, as a child with her father. The place seems to bring back fond memories for her, which is part of the reason she feels passionate about adapting the Divine Damsel of Devastation. The story, she explains, is one of a girl becoming a hero. On the mountain, there existed a small village. A monster appeared one day, however, and began to terrorize it. He kidnapped a woman, and her husband, engulfed by sadness and anger, went mad. The monster made a proposition to him, sacrifice a child and I will let everyone live here. Without hesitation though, a child stepped forward herself. She feigned weakness, but when she made it to the monster's lair, she defeated the monster with an exorcist blade and cemented herself as a selfless hero. But because of this, the Adepti took her in as one of their own, and she never returned to the human world. Or so the story goes. You listening, Shinha? Girl, you're not looking too good. Shinha doesn't think that the girl was as brave as the tale makes her out to be, and perhaps she doesn't deserve the praise that the story gives her. Yunjin finds it likely that the tale has some inaccuracies, but says that her father wrote it to inspire others, so she believes it does the job. Shinha says that it does, and she believes it's the ideal version. After finding the Star Splinter Ore, they attempt to ask a nearby man about the whereabouts of Subrosium, and he just kind of points to some shacks. Thanks. But Shinha knows the man by name, Ming Jun, and he knows of her as well. He seems surprised to see her alive. While they chit chat, the trio look into the deserted village for clues on Subrosium, but instead they find a notebook and its contents are, well, disturbing. It's written by a man with a terminally ill wife. The pain of losing her proved too severe, and so he wished to find a way to save her. Using an incantation found within a book owned by Ming Jun, the man summoned a god and offered himself as sacrifice to save his wife. But it wasn't him the god wanted, but rather his daughter, named Shinha. In grief, the man offered her. The last lines of the note make it clear that the gravity of that decision weighed on the man. The letter ends with lines begging for forgiveness from his wife and daughter, and these lines would prove to be his last. Yunjin appears to have caught on, finally, and realizes that Shinha is the divine damsel mentioned in the tale. The truth is actually pretty different from the tale she's been working on, and she clearly wants to make changes to it as a result. They find records in the wreckage and learn that Shinha is a member of a branch family of exorcists, and that after the incident, the village was abandoned. They also learn that Subrosium is believed to be a stone that bridges life and death, that the only way to get it is to stand at a specific location on Mount Tianhung at dusk and look towards the setting sun. Mingjun is filled with regret that he didn't stop Shinha's father from performing the ritual. He brings flowers to the desolate village every year, wishing he could apologize to Shinha. Shinha's pretty unfazed by the whole thing though. She says that her father would have found a different way, even if he wasn't stopped. He cared for her mother way too much not to. Mingjun asks whether she hates her father, and Shinha isn't sure what she feels. She says that she's been told her fate is to bear the curse of calamity, hence the red ropes that bind her body. But those ropes also cause her to feel nothing. And so, like everything else, she feels nothing about her past, too. <coughs> it was a bad time.
Yoon Jin tells Shinha that they found her father's diary, and that she knows the damsel story she wants to perform isn't close to the reality of the situation. She just can't dismiss Shinha's reality for the sake of a fanciful tale. But Shinha likes Yoon Jin's version better. Cloud Retainer once told her that the day that she uses her strength for the good of others is the day that she can truly join human society, so she wants to be the version of her in the opera. In reality, she fought the monster for the sake of just self-preservation, just to survive survive, not to help others or for any lofty ideals. Because of that, she likes the tale being about someone who steps forward for the sake of others, rather than just for the sake of self-preservation. It's her dream to be the selfless hero. That's the story that inspires her. Dusk approaches, and at the listed location, the Subrosium is found. But so is Zhao. He says there's a danger in the sea near Guyun Stone Forest, but his hands are tied currently, as this should be left to the humans to deal with as a result of the new contract made after the battle with Osail. He's in this location in case things get bad, because this is the last mountain between the sea and Liwe Harbor. Also, there's some yummy grass here. The Wonder Core is then made, and as for the final item for the competition, the Adepti Sigils, Shinha says that she's on that. She knows how to make them. In fact, the whole reason she's here in Liwei to begin with was because she was instructed by Cloud Retainer to deliver some. Cloud Retainer also hoped that Shinha would leave the nest as well and maybe connect with human society. Shinha makes the sigils, and the group brings them back to the building location. Once they arrive, okay, come on. <laughs> You're fucking kidding? Once arrived, the group are announced as the winners of the competition. They meet with Ningwang atop the chamber, and she adds the final materials to the build. The Jade Chamber is officially complete. She already knows what Yunjin wants, and just tells her to have the opera on the new chamber. Before the Traveler can even ask their question, though, Ningwang makes it clear that she doesn't know where their sibling could be. She says that if the pair ever need a super dope job, though, she can offer that. But the Traveler's like, nah, I just want to know where I could get some nice cargo shorts, since I'm always on the go. Thanks. Shinha says that she doesn't have a question, but when pressed, she asks one thing. Lady Ningguang, do you think I can ever fit in in Liyue Harbor? Ningguang says that as long as she respects the rules of the city, of course she'll be accepted. But it ultimately comes down to whether or not Shinha herself can acclimate to the city, not whether the city will accept her. To do that, Ningguang says Shinha needs a reason, whether that be a person or a place, just something to truly connect her to the city. Beidou shows up and turns to Ningguang, clearly distressed, and says that it won't be easy to deal with with just her fleet alone. Ningguang responds that preparations have been made, wound dressing has been procured, and the Millilith are ready for an ambush. The group are like, alright, <laughs> what's going on? She says that they'll see once the Jade Chamber ascends for the first time, and Beidou's secret mission will finally be initiated. Avenger of the Vortex by Sh Who is that? Osile's wife, final follower of the Overlord of the Vortex. Sounds like you knew this was coming! Beto sensed something was stirring in the deep. She warned me months ago. Knowing she harbors hatred toward the Jade Chamber, I chose to rebuild it now as a way of drawing her out. Got it! Well, <clears throat> let's go fetch the Adepta! No. Huh? In this human age, the people of Liyue must find a way to overcome this crisis on our strength alone!
You are a cursed child. Your life brings nothing but disaster to us all. At least if you die, I can bring her back. The day you learn how to use your strength for the good of others is the day that you can truly become part of human society. The Traveler follows Shinha into the depths to battle the beast, who is named Beisht. She's the wife of Osile. She's pretty pissed at Liwa and hates the Jade Chamber as, you know, it was used to bonk and seal her husband. Together, the Traveler and Shinha quell the threat. Beisht isn't dead though, but it's severely injured and flees. Shinha says that she jumped in not to be a hero, but to protect the Traveler. The group recuperates and then meets atop the Jade Chamber for Yunjin's opera's debut. Yunjin takes the stage to begin the true tale of a hero.
Before departure, Ning Wang requests the Traveler's help. Her three most trusted secretaries will be preoccupied with important work, so she needs someone to fulfill their duties while they're away. Someone she trusts with highly sensitive and confidential information. Someone like the Traveler. And so the Traveler acts as her assistant for the day and gets to see the illustrious Ning Wang in action and learns that, while she is clearly an adept businesswoman, she's also focused on leaving the harbor a better place even when she's eventually no longer in it. Yunjin's opera manager asks the Traveler to help find her, as she's gone missing before a big performance. She's found, albeit being attacked by monsters, and her not really care. <laughs> Turns out, she's trying to understand what Shinha meant when she said that she attacked the demon for self-preservation rather than some heroic reason. So Yunjin is trying to get into character so that her acting can reach the next level, though the Traveler spends a day helping her find true inspiration. With preparations complete and Beto's ship ready for the arduous journey ahead, the duo board the Alcor, heading to the Nation of Eternity, Inazuma. Wait, re wait, really? We we actually don't get to see the, the like the, the like the real trip? Oh wait, no. Here it is. Here's the cutscene. Uh, they seem to have moved it from the game for some reason. <laughs> That's weird. But but here it is. Thunder strikes near the Alcor. <laughs> The traveler shooketh but not slain says, Could you help me put up some missing person posters? But in the sea, the horse gods appear. But just before they destroy the ship, 50 childs appear. No, no, wait, not those. These! Hey girls, hold still. An all out war. The traveler has never been in more danger. <laughs> Whose feet will I be to have to sniff for the group to be saved? Are hey, they do you think this cutscene makes and now I'm any just sense? Talk to myself, aren't uh, yeah, I? You know, you're right. We should probably just trash it. Oh, thing. so I have some it's ideas true. about the future well, of the story. I mean, oh, that there's too much action here and not enough talk about taxes. Oh, no, I was thinking about including characters of different skin tones. More than that. Oh, wow, me too. What a good idea. Let's get right to that. At the Inazuma port on the island of Rito, the group is greeted by a fixer named Toma. Toma informs the gang that there's no sneaking into Inazuma, that in order to get in, they're still going to have to use the legal channels. Illegally. Toma already has all that covered and presents the pair's doctored entry paperwork at the checkpoint. Next, they need to head to the Outlander Affairs Agency to continue the process towards residency. Due to the Sakoku Decree, Outlanders are hard to come by, except on this island of Rito where there's a settlement. Toma clearly has a lot of pull here, as he continues to strong arm people to help the pair. Those who are processing applications are bleeding outlanders dry if they can, and as a result, the International Trade Association was made by outlanders to protect the interests of outlanders. The Traveler is still willing to go through all of this, just for a chance to meet with the Shogun, and Toma has a way to set that up. But favors like that come at a price, and so the Traveler has to do a task for the International Trade Association to allow Toma to do his his job. The head of the association is named Kurisu from the land of Fontaine. Konnichiwa, watashi no namei wa Kurisu des. Ginki desu ka? Oh wow, is this is this guy for real? Nihongo Jozu! So the problem that Kurisu is having is with exuberant taxes that are being imposed onto the International Trade Association by the Kanjo Commission. All right, I need to explain the commissions of Inazuma. The Kanjo Commission are one of the three commissions in the Tri Commission, who make up the governing body of Inazuma, and are each granted dominion over different spheres of society. The Kanjo Commission deals with the finances of Inazuma, the border and enforcing the Sakoku Decree, the decree that closed the borders. The Tenryo Commission is the military arm of the government and as such, enforces the laws of the land. Finally, there's the Yashiro Commission that deals with the cultural affairs of the nation, like planning and operating festivals, as well as maintaining cultural sites. Because the Kanjo Commission has full control over the border, they control the island of Rito. Kurisu is specifically having a problem with them having an insane tax on his organization that's requiring it to give the Kanjo Commission a substance known as Crystal Marrow.
Nero, which is incredibly rare and only one merchant in Rito currently has it. The duo learn that the Conjo Commission are actually overtaxing and then stockpiling the crystal marrow given to them to create an artificial scarcity. Then, once Kurisu and others have to buy that crystal marrow, those high proceeds go back to the tax collectors. So they're price gouging and pocketing the funds. Still doesn't explain why the Conjo Commission needs to have so much crystal marrow, but it does explain why the individual tax collectors are going through with it so that they can make bank baby. The duo reveals the crime to Kurisu who confronts the individuals responsible. He uses the info as leverage to stop the taxes, and Toma steps in and helps too. He reveals he's an attendant of a woman named Kamisato Ayaka, also known as the Shirasagi Himegimi, who is a member of the Kamisato clan, which is the head clan of the Yashiro Commission. Her brother, Kamisato Ayato, is actually the head of the clan. Toma says that Ayaka treats him as an equal, which is a rarity in Inazuma, and that she's super well liked all over the nation too. A month ago, when Toma was informed that the pair were coming to Inazuma, he began making connections on Rito under the orders of Ayaka. Understandably, the pair's feats in Mondstadt and Liwe have reached Inazuma. To see whether they were the real deal, they were given the task to help Kurisu. Apparently, Ayaka is excited to meet them and to see whether they can help change the tides of the nation. The Traveler, though, isn't game for all that. He came to Inazuma just to see the Shogun, see if she's that one chick that cubed his sister and then split, not to change the political landscape of a whole country. Toma's bummed, but will still help with that though, and gives the pair an invitation letter and says that they can meet him at a place called the Komori Tea House in Inazuma City. But they can't just leave Rito like him. It appears that this is yet another test by Ayaka. So they need to get a travel permit to leave Rito, so they go and meet the Kanjo commissioner himself, Hiragi Shinsuke. He's knowledgeable about their conquests, like most in power now, and he wants them to deliver a ridiculous amount of letters to gain their permit. For some reason, he obviously doesn't want them to leave Rito, as delivering that many letters would take years. On their way out of the residence, a letter is slipped to them that requests a secret meeting. It's from the daughter of the commissioner, named Hiragi Chisato. At the meeting, she wants them to do her a favor. Deliver a letter. All right, yeah, we're gonna go. But this time it's only to one person, a man named Kujo Kamaji of the Tenryo Commission who's in Inazuma City. She's into him and thinking of marriage, but that's a huge no-no with her father. It would have severe political implications for someone in a head clan of a commission to marry someone from a different commission. But she's following her heart. She's gonna help the pair leave Rito to accomplish delivering the letter and makes it clear that her father was actually trying to hold them up on the island. Apparently she overheard him and an arrogant sounding woman speaking about how to keep the pair on Rito. Her father was also very respectful to the woman and since he's the head of a commission, she has to be someone of immense political power and someone trying to make sure the traveler doesn't get involved in the happenings of Inazuma. Before departing the island, the traveler happens upon a statue at the Hiragi estate. When the traveler touches it, they're granted the power of Electro. Chisato manages to help the pair leave the island. She states that the letter declares her love for Kamiji, which makes this incel soldier unhappy, and the pair are off to Narukami Island, namely Inazuma City. In the city, they meet Kujo Kamaji and deliver Chisato's letter. He's thankful and hands over a travel permit, and they make their way to the Kamari Tea House, which is run by a dog. Toma says they passed the tests and that there hasn't been someone as resolute as the traveler since a person who was struck by the Shogun's special technique, known as the Buso no Hitotachi. That person was Kazuha's friend. Toma escorts the pair to the statue of the omnipresent god, where all of the visions that are being seized from the vision hunt decree are being stored. He explains that Inazuma is the nation of eternity, and that the shogun is the nation's ruler and deity. The shogun then assumedly issued the vision hunt decree and the Sakoku decree to put the country in a sort of 
unchanging stasis so as to maintain eternity. Under this logic, visions would need to be seized because they grant people the power to enact change. Kamisato Ayaka wants to end these restrictive measures. The traveler, entranced by the statue, is struck by something. Huh? Hey, are you okay? You look like your mind is elsewhere. Sound? What sound? I didn't hear anything. Did something happen? At Ayaka's estate from behind a screen, Ayaka pleads with the pair to join her on her mission to end the totalitarian laws afflicting the country, and the traveler is like, no. She's disappointed, but she says she'll still help with meeting the Shogun, on one condition though. She wants the pair to meet with three people and help them, three who have had their visions taken from them. Once they've completed this task, she'll fulfill her end of the bargain. So the pair meet with the first visionless person. <laughs> Me? <laughs> That's very funny. Hey, back the fuck up. There's a warrior who was a guardian of a village, but has decided to leave because he's lost the resolution and knowledge of why he should stay to begin with. He had someone important to him once, but since his vision was taken, so too were his feelings and memories of that person. They then meet with a Tenryo Commission samurai who is being hounded by citizens about emergency provisions that he's not providing anymore. He doesn't know anything about it, and this is also due to his loss of a vision. Even though he's a samurai, his vision was taken for helping the people. People. His aspirations stemmed from a sword given to him by his father, but again, he lost the memory of that as well. Finally, they meet a sword master whose students believe is possessed, even though he's only different because he lost his vision. He keeps calling the names of those he's beaten in duels, and it drowns him in sorrow. The students take him to the Grand Narukami Shrine, which sits atop Mount Yogo to perform the exorcism. The shrine's head maiden is rumored to have close ties with the Shogun, and she's a kitsune, a fox-like species who is in the yokai. The yokai are supernatural beings, and there are all different types, similar to the adepti in Liwe. The head maiden herself, Yai Niko, wishes to perform the exorcism, but she quickly declares that the master isn't possessed, but rather he's gone mad over the guilt of those whose dreams he's crushed in duels. Without his ambition to become the best, taken when his vision was, he can now only think of those who he's hurt. He's become mad, racked by guilt, which Yai Miko claims is like a certain fatally flawed friend of hers. A rival of the master appears, saying that while he did crush his and other people's dreams, they were also entrusted to him, that he should carry them forward instead of being racked with guilt, and that because of the loss of his vision, he should entrust the ambitions of all those he's bested to his disciples. And after all that, Yaimiko speaks to the traveler. She tells them that they've come at the right moment and met her expectations, and that she has high hopes for them. The duo confused, return to the Kamisato estate. Oh, Ayaka! Guess who fulfilled all your wishes? Hmm. Huh? Ayaka! Huh? Huh? The Traveler and Paimon have clearly seen how damaging losing a vision is to a person and those around them. The Traveler just can't stand idly by anymore and watch this happen to the people of Inazuma, so they finally agree to help Ayaka and end this injustice to right the wrongs of Inazuma's tyrannical laws. They head to Ayaka and Toma's hideout, Cafe uh, Lawa, I mean the Komori Tea House, to chart a path forward. Ayaka explains that the Shogun has a complete lack of emotion and acts with without feeling. Almost nobody is fighting the Vision Hunt Decree because it only affects a minority of people in Inazuma. However, there is a small resistance force which occupies an island called Watatsumi Island rallying under Sanganomiya. Historically, Sanganomiya and the Shogunate have always had beef due to their differing belief systems. Ayaka has tried formally dealing with these unjust laws, but every time that she does, she ends up getting vetoed by the other two commissions. The other two commissions' fervor for the decree makes Ayaka 
to wonder if they had a role to play in the creation of it. Ayaka doesn't really have a plan to move forward, as challenging the decree would be openly challenging a deity. So she's just been helping people affected by it from behind the scenes. One way that she does this is she helps people with visions get counterfeit versions, so that those counterfeit versions are the ones that get taken. But getting more counterfeit visions is going to be difficult, as the man who made them, Masakatsu, has been recently arrested by the Tenryo Commission. Because of Ayaka's name recognition, there's no way that she could help break the guy out of jail, so she wants the traveler to assist in that. Step one is to go and meet with someone who can help with the jailbreak. This person's name is Yoimiya. She's currently helping a man with a vision evade Tenryo Samurai. Yoimiya is the owner of Naganohara Fireworks, and she has the title of Queen of the Summer Festival for the amazing fireworks that she makes. She mentions Masakatsu and his fake visions, and that she also helps vision bearers hide in her shop from time to time. The pair let her know about the plan to bust out Masakatsu, and she agrees to help. They all infiltrate the prison, but when they make it to Masakatsu, it appears he's being tortured by guards. But their heinous acts are stopped by a general in the Shogun's army named Kujo Sara. She's the adopted daughter of the Kujo clan, the head of the Tenryo Commission, and adoptive sister to Kujo Kamaji. She's well, not happy about what's going on, and clearly has a strong sense of justice. Using Yoimiya's fireworks to distract the guards, the group attempt to rescue Masakatsu, but they're spotted by Kujo Sara. While clearly a bit unsure, she lets them leave, mentioning that Masakatsu needs medical attention. The pair inform Ayaka of their success, and Kujo Sara letting them leave. She says that even though Kujo Sara helped in this instance, she still does the bidding of the Shogun, and likely only helped because doing so wasn't a threat to the decree itself. Toma informs everyone that the Tenryo Commission is apparently preparing for a ceremony of sorts, and that, as a result, there will be less samurai enforcing the decree out for a bit. Aika is confused why the Tenryo Commission is tasked with a ceremony, since that's usually the purview of their commission, the Yashiro Commission. Regardless, rest and relaxation is the current plan, and the group will reconvene later to figure out their next steps. But one thing is for certain, Inazuma needs to change, and the Traveler is on board for a revolution. On their way out of the tea house, Aika asks the pair to help her with something personal. Her mother and father passed when she and her brother were much younger, and since then she's become acquainted with those her mother was close to. A few days ago, she found a notebook left behind by her mother, but the notebook mentions a name that she doesn't recognize at all, Tsubaki and so she wants to meet her. Apparently Tsubaki was a total partier and was described as someone who liked to have a lot of fun. Her address is in the notebook and all Ayaka wants from the pair is for them to help her in preparing a gift for Tsubaki. So she asked the traveler what would be the best gift. Oh, I have the perfect gift in mind. What do you think about this? Huh? What do you think? What do you think? The first stop is a textiles and kimono shop, where they encounter a sign promoting an upcoming festival. They invite Ayaka to it, and she's a bit shocked. She ultimately declines. Ayaka gives a kimono design to the shop owner to make, but it needs silk from Liwe that she can't get right now. The Sakoku decree is clearly impacting all forms of commerce in Inazuma, too. The group heads to the International Trade Association to see if they have any of the silk there, but Kurisu tells them that vagrants have stolen some of their goods, and some of it happens to be silk, and because they're foreigners, the Kanjo Commission won't help them. They find the vagrants who are also wanting to take advantage of foreigners in Inazuma, and they want Kurisu to pay them for the stolen goods. Ayaka, well, she doesn't like that, and she's like, yeah! Kurisu gives the crew some of the silk as thanks, but Ayaka pays for them anyway, as she knows what the merchants are having to deal with. She believes in helping others, regardless of class or social status. While they wait for the kimono to be made, Ayaka expresses how she'd love to travel and see how others live. She wants to see the world. The shopkeep says it'll be a bit, so they decide to go for a meal, and Ayaka already booked a place in advance. She goes to take care of some other things when they arrive. The restaurant owner tells them that she knows Ayaka and her brother really well, that they always pick up food when they can. But this is the first First time Ayaka has ever booked a reservation with friends. Apparently, Ayaka doesn't really have a lot of friends. Because of her status, she's looked at as a role model and unapproachable rather than just as a normal person. While eating, Ayaka figures out that the restaurant owner told them that she has no friends. <laughs> Fucking loser. 
She's clearly sad about it, but the Traveler and Paimon assure her that they're her friends now. Aika views friendship as precious and says that she'll always treasure this new friendship from them. After the meal, they pick up the finished kimono as well as another item that Ayaka secretly requested. It's a hairpin in the style of a white heron that she made just for the Traveler, and she gives it to them as a gift. Shirasagi Himegime, Ayaka's title, means white heron, so this gift is like a piece of her. With the gifts in tow, it's time to meet Tsubaki at the location mentioned in the notebook, but the place is, well, it's barren. The notebook mentions that her mom had to perform a ritual to make Tsubaki appear, so they go through the process. Instead of finding Tsubaki though, they find uh, a box? The contents of it, oh my, oh what, oh my god, what the fuck? Oh wait, no, there's a notebook in here. Ayaka reads it and it turns out that Tsubaki's real identity is her mother. Aika says that she's like her mother, that she has another side to herself. Tsubaki's, or rather her mother's, notebook made her feel like she was reading her own thoughts. She, like her mother, never has the time to do what she truly wants because of her status and duties. Whenever her parents passed, Ayaka and her brother had to take over their responsibilities, and it was an immense amount of pressure and difficulty for someone so young. Ayaka could only remember the dutiful version of her mother, not who she truly was. Was, not the her displayed in this notebook. In truth, she was just another ordinary person. She wanted to try new foods, see new places, experience new things. Aika feels the same. She wants to just be a normal person and pursue her true passions. In the notebook, her mother wrote how she wanted to experience what a festival is like for a normal person, but she was never able to. Aika wants to experience this too, but she's too important to just show up to a festival as well. Her mother decided to put her unfulfilled wishes into an alter ego, Tsubaki, but Aika wants to live life as herself. She doesn't want to have to put her desires in a notebook. She wants to live each day without regret now. She wants to be true to who she is, and so they head off to the festival anyway. It's the final day of the festival, and it's getting late, so there are fewer people there than normal. They all walk around together, and of course, Ayaka is recognized, but they take part in festival activities, getting their fortunes taken, getting cool masks, eating festival foods, and making prayers on prayer plaques. The Traveler's prayer is to be reunited with their sibling, while Ayaka wishes for peace and happiness for everyone in Inazuma. With the festival over, Ayaka takes the group to Chunjin Forest, where she thanks the pair. Without them, she might not have chosen what's right for her, but now she guarantees she'll live her life as her true self and chase her dreams, the dreams that her mother was unable to pursue. <sighs> oh, Traveler, huh? Huh? there's something that I'd like to do. If you could spare me yet another moment. <sighs> Please, keep your eyes on me.
While exploring the outskirts of Unazuma City, the duo happen upon the most dangerous entity in the wild, children. The kids say they're looking for the Great Mujina Yokai, which is apparently a monster that plays tricks on people and can shapeshift. They were told by their parents that the monster chases kids away at night if they're out too late. The traveler shows the kids that the monster isn't real by saying its name three times. Great Mujina Yokai, Great Mujina Yokai, Great Mujina Yokai. See, it's like, oh, what the fuck is that? Whoa, calm down. Not who you think. I only go after adults. You see, oh, what the fuck is that? Paimon straight up tells the kids that the monster isn't real, which doesn't go over too well. They mention that Yoimiya is going to help them make weapons of war to kill the fucker, and she wouldn't lie, so they don't believe Paimon and instead go and find Yoimiya, who assures them that the scary monster is real, which is a choice. And then she gives them a slip of paper as they leave. She tells the pair that she doesn't really believe it's real either, but she wants the kids to still be allowed to have an imagination and be kids, especially during this harsh time in the nation. They shouldn't be concerned with what's real and what isn't. Experiences like that when she was young are priceless treasures to Yoimiya, and she doesn't want to take that from these children. Plus, reality blows. Did you not see that guy get tortured earlier? <laughs> Jesus. Apparently, the Naganohara fireworks show is coming up, so Yoimiya takes the group to her shop. But Yoimiya has been hiding a wanted man there named Sakujiro. He smuggled his way into the country, and when he was found, a warrant was issued for his arrest. Yoimiya is trying to get a boat to help him leave the country and evade arrest. He also has a slip of paper, like the one given to the children, which is actually an order for fireworks from the shop. It's written in code and only decipherable by Yoimiya and her father. His slip is from 20 years ago when Inazuma was, well, in better times. For the fireworks show, they help Yoimiya to get materials, and they learn that Yoimiya is really well liked around the city, but also that she loves to talk and is a bit sporadic. She views a lot of things as fleeting and beautiful, like fireworks. It makes her treasure everything to a greater degree than most because she knows the fleeting nature of most things. In their downtime, waiting for the boat to take Sakajiro away, they chat with Yoimiya and tell her about their adventures so far and why they're in Inazuma. She tells the pair to not get too lost on the goal of their journey and to relax a bit sometimes. That it's not just about the destination, but also the friends we got shit. The boat's ready, and a man by the name of Koichi has retrieved it. Yoimiya wants to pay Koichi, but he declines. He says that a woman named Third Sis wouldn't want him to. Him and Third Sis are part of a group that began with a merchant's guild in Inazuma. In the merchant's guild, there were 12 children born at around the same time, and each child learned the trade of their respective family. They all became quick friends with each other and grew up together, but when they reached adulthood, they naturally went to do business all over the world, so they separated. But before they departed Inazuma, they all watched fireworks together. Koichi is the only one that's left in Inazuma, while the rest are scattered throughout the world. Whenever they visit, though, they always view fireworks together to celebrate the occasion. Seeing the fireworks always takes them back to when they were children, all together in Inazuma and the memories that they shared together. They return to Sakajiro at the shop, who explains that he left Inazuma to escape his responsibilities, but came back to face them. Yoimiya tries to use her connections to help Sakajiro, but to no avail. She does learn, though, that right before Sakajiro left Inazuma, Zuma, he had a falling out with a friend named Keisuke. With no luck in helping to change Sakujiro's status, they return to the shop. But when they do, they learn that the Tenryo Commission found Sakujiro and he had to flee and that one of the Tenryo guards was actually Sakujiro's old friend, Keisuke. They catch up to the guards and have to take some of them out to catch up to Sakujiro, who was in a duel with his old friend. Turns out, Keisuke isn't too happy about having to enforce the draconian decrees in Inazuma, but due to their prior dispute, he's still mad at Sakujiro. But Yoimiya uses her people skills to convince the pair to squash their beef. So Keisuke lets Sakujiro leave on the boat. Neither remember why they were even fighting to begin with. He isn't going to report Yoimiya or the duo since they helped, and on his request, she uses the paper slip that Sakujiro had to make fireworks that the two used to watch as children as a send off to Sakujiro. Yoimiya takes them to a cliff to set them off, but it turns out she also made some fireworks for them too and gives them the slip of paper. This slip of paper can transport the pair back to this moment in time in the future that, while friendship, one's childhood and journeys are all fleeting. The precious moments enjoyed within them last an eternity.
While exploring in Azuma, the traveler happens upon a shrine maiden named Hanachiru Sato, who, after seeing their element-wielding abilities, asks them to help with removing a special seal. Because the traveler's a total yes man, they find the seal and remove it. But when they do, they're met with an ethereal spirit that attacks them. Once they take it out, Hanachiru Sato appears again and says they're qualified to perform the cleansing on the roots of a tree known as the Sacred Sakura Tree. The tree resides on the grounds of the Grand Narukami Shrine, the one Yaimigo presides over, but its roots span across all of Inazuma. The tree holds great significance and power in Inazuma because of its ability to remove evil, or how Hanachiru Sato puts it, purify filth in the ley lines. Ley lines are the energy of the world of Tavat, like an interconnected system. A disruption in the system could result in some wonky things, hence the need for cleansing them. The Adepti and Yaksha perform a similar duty in Liwei, which is why Zhao is constantly afflicted by accumulated filth. Over time, the absorption of the filth by the sacred Sakura causes the roots to become polluted, and so a ritual needs to be performed to cleanse the filth or the tree will be at risk. So the roots of the tree, known as the Thunder Sakura, need to be cleansed. Hanachiru Sato asks them to continue breaking barriers and dealing with the malignant forces within the roots to cleanse them, which will save the sacred Sakura tree, which she refers to as a her. Hanachiru Sato says that she would do the ritual herself, but something is clearly up with her. They learn more about the ritual at the Grand Narukami Shrine and receive an item called the Memento Lens. It was made using a demon exercising mirror made by a goddess who was named the Kitsune Saigu. The mirror was gifted to the Hiragi clan who worked with the nation of Fontaine to make it into a special camera that can record thoughts and memories. Due to its poor condition though, the camera no longer functions, but the lens can still be used in special locations to see the past. So the Traveler uses it to help find the wards as well as see moments of the past. The Traveler sees a vision of the past, but Hanachiru Sato is there, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense since she appears so young. In this vision, the man that she's talking to also seems shocked to see her. They continue the ritual and learn from Hanachiru Sato that 500 years ago, the sacred Sakura almost withered, that the seas turned black and monsters ravaged the land. The cleansing ritual was eventually performed though and the tree was saved. To unseal the next barrier, she feeds the duo a magical dish so that they can speak with a yokai known as a bake danuki who's stuck in a stone. Hey, what? What was in that dish? What the fuck? The bake danuki sealed in stone is named Yoroi. Yoroi was actually sealed away by one of the Yogo Three. The three are three individuals who trained under special Tingu. Tingu being yet another species of yokai in Inazuma who are characterized by black wings and long noses. Hanachiru Sato explains that the man who sealed Yoroi in stone is known as Kamuna Harunosuke, who was one of the Yogo Three. He was a master in a magical art known as On Miyodo, and he was actually the last person to perform the sacred Sakura cleansing ritual. To complete the cleansing, they cleanse a miasmic tumor in the roots and use the help of the sacred Sakura tree itself. Afterward, Hanachiru Sato explains that she couldn't perform the ritual herself because she's simply an amalgamation of filth. <laughs> Me too, girl. <laughs> 
Me too. She's apparently mixed with the memories of Kitsune Saigu herself. Saigu fought to protect Inazuma during the catastrophe of 500 years ago, but when she perished protecting the land, she was so strong that even though she died, her memories remained and those fused with the filth in the land to become Hanachiru Sato. She says that once she completes the ritual, she will disappear. But before she does, she wants to tell them Kitsune Saigu's final words. Do not be blinded. Do not waver. Keep walking the path that you believe in. Today will mark the 100th vision taken during the Vision Hunt Decree, and to commemorate it, the Shogun will be at the statue of the omnipresent god. The duo return to the Komori Tea House, and Ayaka is in a panic. She says that the Tenryo Commission came to them and that Toma has been taken away. She thinks Toma will be that 100th vision at the ceremony. Ayaka is prepared to risk everything to save him, but the duo convince her to stay safe, that they're not recognizable in Inazuma, and as a result, they can go without suspicion. So they rush to the statue statue of the omnipresent god to finally face the tyrannical god of eternity. Capable of using elemental energy without a vision. You are an exception, it appears. Exceptions. The enemy of eternity. will be inlaid upon this statue. Traveler clashes with the Raiden Shogun in this mysterious space, but the power of a god proves to be too much. Shogun, who was that? Seize him under the decree. Huh? Next time, I will strike twice. <laughs>
The Traveler and Paimon have finally witnessed the power of a god and are wanted criminals. Again, Toma states that since the Komori Tea House is owned and operated by the Yashiro Commission, he's safe there, but he can't leave. The Traveler and Paimon will have to go it alone, but he suggests that they finally meet and join Sanganomiya's resistance fighters. Now is the time to truly fight against the Shogun. Toma explains the group's workings that the leader is named Sanganomiya Kokomi, the divine priestess of Watatsumi Island, where the resistance hub is located, and that a man named Goro leads her army. In secrecy, the duo heads to meet this resistance. On their way, they happen upon a resistance fighter being attacked by Shogunate Samurai, and they rescue him. He introduces himself as Tepe. Where's where's the character? Can we, can we please get the character card? Oh. Oh, wait. Oh. Tepe is clearly distraught over his current inability to help in the war effort, and wishes that he had a vision himself so that he could fight back against the Shogunate, so as to not be a burden on the resistance. He says that they need more fighters, so he's happy to bring in the duo. They're introduced to Goro, who exudes honor and clearly has a strategic level of thinking that far surpasses others. Can I pet him though? Okay. The Traveler tells Goro that they challenged the Shogun at the recent ceremony, and due to their abilities, Goro accepts them into their ranks. Tepe shows them around the camp, and the Resistance clearly has a ton of logistical supply and training issues due to their low numbers. Suddenly, they get word that the Shogunate army has initiated a surprise attack, so the Traveler proves their worth in defending the camp. Tepe thinks that the Shogunate army was able to attack them unnoticed because there's likely a spy in the Resistance's ranks. It appears that Goro and other troops are now back battling the Shogunate army on the front line, and that Kujo Sara is leading the attack. Tepe, eager to prove his worth and battle on the front line, leads the duo to the battle. Sara knows that the Traveler is likely among their ranks and wants him handed over for their clash with the Shogun. If Goro hands over the Traveler, she'll leave quietly for now. But Goro would never abandon a member of the Resistance, even a new one like the Traveler. <laughs> my lady. I just hope you can afford all these mercs you've gathered! Kazuha! We meet again, old friend. The war strategist Sanganomiya Kokomi finally reveals herself to the Traveler and says she heard of them from Kazuha and Beidou. She invites the Traveler and Paimon to her shrine on Watatsumi Island, the home of the Resistance, so that they can chart their next move. Tepe wishes to be the Traveler's guide to the island, and Kokomi accepts. Goro is tasked by her to stay at this camp, but says that Kazuha will assist him. Kokomi says that when preparations are complete, she'll call for the Traveler, and that the fight for Inazuma's future continues. Kazuha tells the Traveler that he returned with Beido to face the Shogun head-on. He can't let go of his long-gone friend's dream to withstand the Muso no Hitotachi. Kazuha wonders if anyone can withstand its might. But regardless, he wants to face whatever battle awaits them all against the Shogun's might. He'll fight together with the Traveler to regain the lost dreams of all of those in Inazuma, and those whose dreams were never fulfilled.
The Traveler and Paimon assess the situation in Inazuma in greater detail. They come to understand that the war between the Shogunate's army and the Resistance has wreaked havoc on all of Inazuma. They travel to Yashiori Island, an island torn asunder due to constant storms and the inhabitants there that haven't fled, who still fall victim. On the island exists the body of an old god named Orobashi. The island itself is physically torn asunder as well, as a gigantic gorge exists in the center, a physical reminder of the Raiden Shogun's devastating technique, the Muso no Hitatachi, which she used here to slay Orobashi. The island displays the Shogun's true godly power, but it also shows the true dangerous nature that can be left behind by the remnants of a dead god. Like with Durin's body on Dragonspine, Yashiori Island also deals with the dangerous aura left behind when a god dies. But unlike on Dragonspine, which keeps the aura at bay with its never-ending winter, Yashiori Island instead uses a ward to seal it. This ward, though, has been damaged due to the current war between the Shogunate and Sanganomiya, so the aura, which the locals of Inazuma call Tatarigami, is currently ravaging the island by causing perpetual, dangerous storms. Some people still live on on this island though, and to save the innocents, the Traveler and Paimon restore the wards. On the Inazuma mainland, the pair also find an area called Tatarasuna, where there exists a factory that smelts steel used for the shogunate weapons. This factory is called the Mikage Furnace, but that too has been attacked in the war, for obvious reasons. The Mikage Furnace is actually powered by the Tatarigami source from Yashiori Island, so it would be incredibly dangerous if it were to fully break down. In the past, the furnace was made with the help of consultants from the land of Fontaine. This construction was hundreds of years ago in Inazuma's past, and its creation was used to help with weapon forging then, too. Fontaine clearly knows something about alternative energy sources, but all of the consultants have left Inazuma, except for one, a man named Xavier. Xavier is from a group in Fontaine called the Daydream Club, a group of well-renowned inventors traveling the world and creating marvelous inventions. His creation is actually that of the camera. Wow, that's so cool. Thanks for making such an incredible invention. Oh, so you've used it. Care to let me see your pictures? Uh, you know, well, okay, well, you know, wait, wait, just, just don't score the, wait, it's not, that's not, that's not mine, it's not mine. The Mikage furnace has been damaged due to the war, and as a result, the Tatarigami in it is starting to leak out. Xavier stayed here for the maintenance to help fix the issue and created a temporary domain to maintain the Tatarigami. He says that if the leak isn't fixed though, all of Inazuma may be at risk of an immense nation-destroying blast. But currently he can't do this job because the only way to fix the leak is from the inside, and only a person who can wield the elements can get anywhere near such concentrated tatarigami safely. So the Traveler helps Xavier, and goes inside the dome to fix the issue. Inside, the furnace area seems to be stuck in the past, as documents of the furnace's use from 400 years ago are strewn about. During this time, the furnace on Tatarasuna was operated by famous Inazuman locals, many of which were members of schools of ancient Inazuman blade arts. The Vice Armory Officer of the furnace at the time was named Mikoshi Nagamasa, who was a member of the Yogo 3. Mikoshi had an assistant named Katsuragi, and the documents around the furnace speak of how Katsuragi befriended a strange, nameless person who he and the group there called a Kabuki Mono, which is the word that Inazumans use to describe an eccentric or strange person. But they came to learn that this wasn't actually a person at all, but rather a puppet. He brought the puppet to work at the furnace, and the Kabuki Mono became close friends with everyone there, and became especially close with Katsuragi and the chief armory officer of the furnace, who the documents don't provide a name for. Eventually, the team and the Kabuki Mono made a legendary blade together, and it seemed as if their synergy was unstoppable. But eventually, an incident seems to have occurred at the furnace during this time that led to it having problems like now, and a researcher from Fontaine appeared then too. The name of this researcher is isn't provided in the documents either. The events after are mysterious and scattered. It seems Katsuragi was slain, killed by Mikoshi with the legendary blade that was made for an unknown reason, and the furnace was fixed somehow. But immediately afterward, the chief officer and the kabuki mono disappeared, and both of their whereabouts were lost to time. Tatarasuna's mysterious past is odd to say the least, as Inazuma is steeped in tradition and accurate historical records. The pair think that maybe the mystery of Tatarasuna's history will remain unsolved forever. 
The pair encounter Fatui near the furnace who are attempting to harness the Tatarigami energy, but after dealing with them, they manage to work with Xavier and fix the damage to the furnace. The issue of the Tatarigami on both islands is solved, but Inazuma is in an even worse state than the duo originally thought, and if this war doesn't end soon, the damage might be irreversible. And, like with the history of Tatarasuna, Inazuma itself may be wiped from time. Watatsumi Island, the home of the resistance, those who are willing to challenge the edicts of a god. When the traveler arrives, Kokomi is already in a strategy meeting, and she mentions that an unknown third party has been giving the resistance supplies. All they've asked for in return is that the resistance continues to fight against the shogun to their fullest ability. Kokomi is obviously skeptical about all of this and the assistance, but the resistance isn't in exactly the best state, so they can't really refuse such assistance. Because of the traveler's abilities, Kokomi appoints them the captain of a special operations unit known as Swordfish 2, while Tepe gets assigned to another operation. The Traveler is introduced to the members of Swordfish 2 and assists them in an operation to secure Watatsumi Island from Ronin, thus gaining their trust. Make sure you write all of this down because these people's names are going to be super important later, I promise. Especially, uh, Yoshihisa? Y Yoshihisa? I hardly know her. <laughs> Once they're back, they learn that Tepe has also been made a captain of his own unit, Herring One, and he says that they'll even be getting their own uniforms soon. <laughs> Red shirts! After some time passes doing missions for Kokomi, the pair end up on one that leads them to nearby ruins, and they all reunite with Tepe. But Tepe appears to have changed since they last saw him. He has gray hairs now and is coughing up a storm. The ruins are near Yashiori Island, where Odabashi was slain by the Shogun. Tepe says that Odabashi was, and still is, important to the people of Watatsumi Island. Odabashi brought the ancestors of Watatsumi Island to the surface, up from an underground land called Inkonomiya. After Odobashi brought the people of Inkonomiya to the surface, he created Watatsumi Island to house them. But for some reason, Odobashi didn't believe that to be enough, so he invaded Inazuman land to claim it for his people. He invaded Yashiori Island. This is the reason the Shogun slayed the god, but doing so has caused bad blood with the island residents and the Inazuman mainland ever since. It was also said that during that same day that she fought with Odobashi, the Shogun lost something dear to her. The pair return to the Watatsumi Shrine, and a sassy shrine maiden named Tsuyuko asks for the pair's help. She says the pool in front of the shrine is actually the entrance to Inkonomiya itself. It's a land with no light. Well, mostly no light, apparently. There exists a device there that granted the population light and reportedly protected them from beasts known as the Dragon Heir of the Depths. A few thousand years ago, Odobashi fought and won against those beasts and brought the populace to the surface. Tsuyuko explains that Inkonomiya and Watatsumi Island are intrinsically linked, not only because of their ancestors, but also due to the proximity, as Watatsumi is directly above it. Inkonomiya affects the soil of Watatsumi Island and slowly transforms it into a substance known as Holy Soil, a totally poorly named soil because Holy Soil actually means that nothing will grow on it. So if left unchecked, it would make the island into an uninhabitable desert. Every several centuries then, officials are tasked with breaking the barrier between the two lands and performing a ritual to stop this corruption, to stop the soil from becoming holy soil. To do this, one has to venture into Inkonomiya and retrieve an item known as the Jade Coral Branch, which was used once by Odobashi in its battle against the Dragon Air of the Depths. But once the branch is removed from Inkonomiya, it might also revive the Dragon Air, but never mind that, to get into Inkonomiya, Tsuyuko says the Traveler has to undo five separate seals. <laughs> Nobody has ventured into Inkonomiya in a very long time, so she has no clue what might be down there and supposes that maybe all of this is actually just superstition. The Traveler wonders why they're being tasked with this, but Tsuyuko stresses that there isn't really experienced manpower on the island anymore due to the war, and also if something does go disastrously wrong and start affecting all of Inazuma, they could just blame the Traveler, so uh, good luck! They break the four seals and go to the fifth at a chamber on the island where Orobashi once lived. With the final seal broken, the group obtains the key of the moon-bathed deep. 
a key forged from the blood of Odobashi that allows entrance into Inkonomiya. But certain conditions need to be correct for the gateway to be opened, so Tsuyoko asks for them to wait until that time comes. A pair meet with Kokomi and... He relays information to Kokomi, and it appears that some soldiers are experiencing accelerated aging. It's a result of using a weapon provided by the secret sponsor that Kokomi spoke of prior. Turns out, the weapons are Fatui delusions. Kokomi acts quickly to cease the use of the weapons now that the Traveler has revealed their origins, and the Traveler and Paimon are worried about Tepe, so they rush to see him. They find Tepe, withered and weak. He boasts about all the things he was able to accomplish because of the use of the delusion. They tell him the truth of the weapon, and he says that he's been feeling a strange sense of dread lately. He asks the Traveler to bring him his uniform for Herring One when they're finished, and that him and the Traveler can wear them together as brothers in arms. But with that final request, Tepe goes silent. The Fatui continue to devastate innocents all over Tavad. Venti, Devalin, Liwe locals, and Tepe, the Traveler, needs to end their carnage. They meet with Kokomi and learn that the delusions had to have been made in Inazuma, since the borders are closed. And Kokomi deduces that the factory must be on Yashiori Island, so the Traveler and Paimon go to investigate. They find the factory and make their way through it, learning that delusions appear to be made from Crystal Marrow, the same substance that the Kanjo Commission has been hoarding on Rito. Crystal Marrow actually contains Tatarigami, and it appears such energy is essential in crafting delusions. The Kanjo Commission was hoarding Crystal Marrow by getting the locals to gather it, then handing the crystals over to the Fatui for the creation of delusions. In the depths of the factory, the duo come across a Fatui harbinger, Scaramouche. He says he's merely there following orders and that it wasn't his idea to manufacture delusions. He says that the Fatui's hard work in Inazuma is paying off though, that they were even involved in the creation of the Vision Hunt Decree itself. The Fatui sowed chaos all throughout Inazuma and sparked a civil war all so that they could manufacture more delusions. When the Traveler mentions the deaths of resistance fighters and Tepe at the Fatui's hands, Scaramouche says that soldiers dying is just the way of the world. That at least they were able to fulfill their ambitions in some way before their deaths. Even so, to him, human lives are worthless. From the outside, Inazuma looks pretty impenetrable. But on the inside, it's a land of opportunity. With a little effort, we were able to break them down from within. Eternity stretches things out over a long time. But each moment within it becomes all the more fragile. Take your friend in the Resistance, for example. There's nothing you can do now. He's a lost cause. Just like a bubble on the water. Beautiful for a moment, then total destruction. The more it takes from them, the more tightly they hold on to it. And the more incompetent they are, the more determined they are to fight it. <laughs> it's such a farce. You have to see the funny side. <laughs> That's it. Just like that. Embrace the anger. Embrace it! The wrath of the gods fills this factory, and it feeds on your anger. <laughs> uh, what's the Traveler awakens and finds themselves at the Grand Narukami Shrine with Yai Miko. She doesn't explain how she got them away from Scaramouche, who she calls the Balladeer, another of his Fatui codenames. She does say though that once they left the factory, it was raided by the Resistance, and that there was a ban placed on delusions in their army. Yai Miko though wants the pair to do her a favor, and to do so, they need to learn about the truth about the Raiden Shogun. Spooky <laughs> Snooky, that's the truth. The Raiden Shogun's true name is A. A seeks eternity so greatly that she also sought personal eternity. As a result, she replaced her physical body with that of a puppet, one that wouldn't age. This is the Raiden Shogun that the pair saw at the ceremony. So then there are two versions of the Shogun, the one that we see in the physical world, the puppet, and the one that resides within A's sword. A separated herself from her physical body and placed her consciousness inside of her sword, 
which is where a place called the Plain of Euthymia, the world of the mind, exists. There, she meditates while her puppet rules the nation with a single programmed directive, maintain eternity. Instead of seeing all this as a solution, a locking herself away and placing a puppet in her place, Yai views what A is doing as a temper tantrum and childish. Yai believes that A is no longer pursuing true eternity, but rather an eternity that is based on the fear of loss from A's past. So Yai Miko wants to team up with the Traveler to end the Vision Hunt decree, but also she ultimately wants to save A in the process, save her from this new perverted eternity that she now shackles herself to. So Yai's ultimate plan is to throw hands with A. Girl. She thinks that if the Traveler can best A in her own mind, it may shake her will and wake her up. The Traveler is unsure of why they're the one being chosen to do this, but Yai says it's because of how unusual they are. The plain of Euthymia is where only A is allowed, and nobody has seen her since her entry, but somehow the Traveler was able to gain entry, and it appears that that might be due to the Traveler piquing A's interests, because they act unpredictably in the face of eternity. So with the mission in mind, they head off to perform what Yai calls her anti ride and Shogun training. This training allows the Traveler to understand how A fights by having a perfect mimicking of her abilities. Yai knows how A fights because she's A's servant, her familiar. It's similar to the relationship between Devalin and Venti, except a bit more gay. A never said goodbye to Yai when she entered into the plane of Euthymia, and Yai thinks that's likely because without an ending to their friendship, it could be eternal as well. After the training, Yai initiates the first step of her plan, to reveal the rot within the Tenryo and Kanjo commissions by proving that they're colluding with the Fatui and responsible for the implementation of the Vision Hunt decree. To do this though, they need to get through to Kujo Sara. The reason being is her clan currently leads the Tenryo commission. Sara was adopted by the Kujo clan, but she's resolute in her adherence to the Shogun's will. If she learns that the Vision Hunt Decree wasn't based on the will of the Shogun, but rather on lies made up by her family and the Fatui, she'll try her hardest to end it. So to get this evidence, the group enlists the help of a hypersomniac ninja named Sayu. She's a member of the Shumatsuban, a secret ninja unit under Kamisato Ayato, Ayaka's brother. The group rendezvous with Toma and Ayaka. They tell them everything about what happened since they last met, and they also relay what they know about the Fatui's dealings with the other two commissions. Ayaka believes it immediately. She's always thought that the Shogun not ending the Civil War was really unusual. The Shogun never even publicly mentioned it. So Ayaka thinks the war's existence might be hidden in the other commission's reports to the Shogun. So using Yoimiya's fireworks and Sayu's ninja skills, the trio hatch a plan to get these falsified reports from the Kujo clan. Do not expose your identities and wait for the signal before you act. Yes, sir. Grand festivals like this monopolize the Tenryo Commission's resources. Your timing is impeccable. <laughs> Pity you were all they sent. Let's go for a stroll. We wish to discuss cooperation with the Yashiro Commission. A humble suggestion. The Fatui would do well to update their intelligence concerning me. If assassinating me was that simple, I can name a few rival clans who would have had an easier time over the years. My lord! We failed to protect you. <laughs> I do not keep the Shumatsuban for the trivial matter of dealing with assassins. Uh, trivial? So, what's the situation? Uh, the operation went smoothly. The Resistance Platoon is hidden near Tenshikaku. Forgive me, sir, but... Taking this level of risk, it seems out of character. Let's just say, I'm doing a small favor for my sister. With the evidence received, they reveal the truth to Sara, that the Kujo clan is lying about the existence of the war and that they're working with the Fatui. Sara is, well, she's not too happy. Ah! She rushes off to confront her clan and Yai gives the pair a shrine omomori, essentially an amulet, and tells them to use it if they're at their wit's end in the battle against A. Sara confronts Kujo Takayuki, the head of the Tenryo Commission, who, like 
easily fesses up to everything. He says he worked with the Fatui because they could help protect the Kujo clan from other clans vying to take their position and power. Sara says that while she initially doubted the Vision Hunt decree because she thought it was wrong, she still trusted in the Shogun's ultimate judgment. But now that she knows the truth, she has to tell the Shogun so that the true judgment on the Vision Hunt decree's merits can be given. She leaves, and Takayuki says that the Shogun is currently meeting with a harbinger. They arrive at Tenshukaku, where the Shogun resides, and Sara has been bested by that harbinger. The harbinger is Signora. They confront Signora, and for the sake of everyone harmed in Liwe, for Vinti, for those forsaken by the Vision Hunt Decree, and for those lost because of the delusions, the Traveler makes a declaration. I challenge you to a duel before the throne! The Shogun accepts the duel request, but Signora makes it clear that this won't be a normal duel, but rather a duel to the death. The Traveler does battle with Signora, the Crimson Witch of Flames, who initially wields a cryo delusion, but then appears to wield the power of Pyro, but without a Pyro vision in sight. But the Traveler is stronger than they were when they fought Child, and using all of their strength, and with anger fueling their every swing, they best Signora. <laughs> So strong, but but how? I am a Snizhnayan diplomat. You know what happens if you lay a finger on me. I swear, if you strike me, I will make sure... The Fatui will make sure that your precious Inazuma... Stop! I order you! And you! Filthy rats! All of you! You are the enemy of eternity. <sighs> but as the victor, I acknowledge your honor. Therefore, I shall allow you to leave Tenshukaku alive. Signora was slain with one strike. The Traveler has now witnessed the monstrous strength of the Muso no Hitotachi in person. The environment outside of Tenshukaku is unsettling, and the Traveler is having inexplicable pains, and they're unsure if they will be able to win against such immense power. <sighs> There will always be those who dare to brave the lightning's glow. Again. The Traveler is, once again, face to face with the real Raiden Shogun, A, in the plane of Euthymia. The Traveler informs A of the reality of the Vision Hunt Decree and its connections to the Fatui, but 
A seems to not really care all that much. She believes that ambition and chasing one's dreams causes the individual to lose more than if they just lost their ambition in the first place. She's not a fan of visions, so she's okay with them being taken. Nobody loses their life by simply losing their ambition, but by chasing one's ambition, that can cause one to perish. A believes that the Traveler is the furthest thing from eternity. They seem to be the personification of uncertainty. So, the Traveler and A clash, a battle of wills, the pursuit of an eternity at the sake of the people's ambitions versus the dreams of the people of Inazuma. <laughs> Dear me, aren't you cutting it rather close? Hmm? Miko, this was your doing? <sighs> now, now. Don't forget who taught you how to place your consciousness in objects. Surely you don't think your ambition alone is enough to shake A's will, do you? Though you alone are here, they too have ambitions which they long since entrusted to you. Now then, close your eyes. We can abolish the Vision Hunt Decree! <laughs> Using the power of the dreams entrusted to him, the Traveler strikes down the Electro Archon, A. The Traveler explains that when people use their will to move forward, they can even surpass the gods. Yai wonders aloud if this is what the Traveler learned in Liwe, and is interested in the idea of nations moving forward without a deity. But A stresses that this moving forward progress can only bring with it great loss, and that pursuing eternity is the only way to prevent that loss. When lightning flashes, it casts a shadow. My name means shadow. With my blade, I purged all obstacles to progress. And yet, something was lost with each step forward. In the end, I even lost her. The tales are still retold in the shade of every Thunder Sakura. But the wounds left on our nation by that terrible loss still ache. Never stop searching, even if only for a brief flash of light. If nothing else, we have the present moment. She said that once. But I've seen a nation strike forward and lose everything to the heavenly principles. Perhaps only if time stands still will the lightning's glow never fade. The present moment is a fragile illusion. Only eternity can bring us closer to the heavenly principles. I am no longer the shadow. Mine is the most supreme and noble form. Let power over the realm be vested within me. In this form shall I honor my subject's dream for a land of eternity, unchanging forevermore. Yai calls the heavenly principles irrelevant nonsense. She knows that all A wants is to protect Inazuma. Without progress, eternity means nothing. It would make the nation into a shell. A responds that she promised her people eternity, but Yai says that they don't want her promises. They want her divine gaze, 
her visions. A stresses that human life is fleeting, that they don't truly understand what's best, that she's lived such a long life that she understands what must be done to avoid suffering. To her, she's doing this for the sake of her people. Yai, though, is solely focused on A. A being alone for an eternity is a cruel fate. She's been alone for centuries, and Yai wonders how much A herself has lost and will lose in this pursuit of eternity. A is shaken by the will of her people, the Traveler, and the concern of her dearest friend. She acknowledges the power of the Traveler and ambitions, at least for now. Because of the Traveler besting her in a duel and at the behest of her dear friend, she'll abolish the Vision Hunt decree. But for everything else and her current definition of eternity, She'll need time to think. As promised, the Raiden Shogun abolished the Vision Hunt Decree. Finally, her people's wishes penetrated her locked heart. Beyond the plain of Euthymia, she saw what eternity means in the eyes of the world. When one's fervent ambition burns brightly, the gods will cast their gaze upon you. Some ambitions have the power to heal wounds, to bring victory, to inspire hope. But some ambitions outlive their masters long after the soul ascends. They remain as they were in the beginning. Burning bright and true for all eternity. Yai summons the Traveler and Paimon to the sacred Sakura tree at her shrine. She congratulates the Traveler on defeating a Harbinger, and Paimon makes note that she's just glad that the Fatui weren't able to get their hands on another Gnosis, isn't that great? <laughs> Yeah, about that. To save the pair from Scaramouche, she handed over the Gnosis to him. The number of the Harbinger actually refers to their strength, and due to Scaramouche being number six, he's far stronger than even Signora, who was number eight. Child is number 11, by the way, so get shit on, idiot. <laughs> if I had a penny for every time Child threw a coin at me, I'd have a... Uh, line? <laughs> Yai was given the Gnosis before A ventured into the plane of Euthymia, and she handed it over to Scaramouche because she's not the type to, you know, risk her life. Apparently, A doesn't really care too much for the Gnosis anyway. A Gnosis allows an Archon to stay connected with Celestia, but Yai says A severed her ties with Celestia long ago. In the end though, Yai wants to thank the pair, and as a result, will reveal information that she otherwise wouldn't to normies. She explains that the Puppet A, the Raiden Shogun, was built with long since past technology, but before it was made, A made a prototype puppet, one that wasn't based on her likeness like the current one is. That prototype was meant to be destroyed, but it began developing its own consciousness, so A decided not to destroy it but to simply seal its power. But eventually, the Fatui took an interest, especially in the prototype's strength. They managed to unseal that power and recruited him as a harbinger. That prototype is the balladeer, Scaramouche, a puppet abandoned by a god and taken in by the Fatui to be used as a weapon. The Traveler asks who Fall was, since Zhongli said that that was the name of the Electro Archon, not A when he had explained the Inazuma to them. Yai explains that Ball was the Shogun at one time. In Inazuma's past, there used to be twin gods, Ball and Beelzebul. They both won the Archon War together, and while Ball was the publicly named Archon, Beelzebul acted as her body double and her body guard. Beelzebul is A, and Ball was her sister, Makoto. The public never learned the truth of these twin gods, and it's remained a secret to this day. 500 years ago, Makoto died in the land of Conria when catastrophe struck Inazuma and the world. After that, A took up the mantle as the Shogun. Yai suggests that the Traveler head off to Sumeru next, as it's the land of knowledge. The Archon of Sumeru is known by the people as Lesser Lord Kusanali, and Yai suggests that the pair have a conversation with her, that if anyone in the world would know something about their sibling, 
it would be her. Before they depart the shrine, Yai asks the traveler an important question. She asks them what their ambition truly is. The traveler says that it's to be reunited with their sibling, but Yai responds that an ambition needs to be one that transcends the world itself, and that perhaps the traveler hasn't found an ambition like that yet. She says that maybe, if that time comes, if the traveler finds their own transcendent dream, the traveler may find themselves granted a vision of their own. Toma invites the Traveler over to celebrate and thank them for saving him and for what they did to help abolish the Vision Hunt decree. He's on vacation now after everything he went through, but at the Kamisato estate, the Traveler overhears people uh, talking crap about him. Toma says that he's often misunderstood and doesn't think too much of it. All he needs is the people closest to him to know the real him. Toma grew up in Mondstadt, where his mother is from, but his father is from Inazuma. His father moved back here, and because of that, Toma decided to travel and see him. But on his way, he got into an accident and barely survived. He wants to visit Mondstadt again one of these days and spend time there with the Traveler. The Traveler notices Sayu trailing him and finds out she was sent on a mission to ambush them, even though she wasn't going to follow through. They work with her to figure out who put a hit on them. Turns out it was a Yashiro Commission official, but only because his daughter got kidnapped by Ronin and he was forced to put out the hit. The Yashiro official gave the hit job to Sayu because she doesn't ever carry out confrontational tasks, so he thought that she wouldn't try to hurt the Traveler. And most of the time she's napping anyway. She loves to sleep, in part because she believes it makes you taller, and she believes being tall is the key to everything. So Sayu and the Traveler save his child from the Ronin, and she proves she's actually super dependable. With Inazuma beginning to heal from the events of the recent turbulent times, the Adventurer's Guild has resumed normal operations. The pair meet up with yet another Catherine at the Inazuman branch of the Guild who greets the pair. Oh hi, child and floating diapy baby. It's me, Catherine. Not to be confused with my sister Catherine or other Catherine. They're stupid whores and I can't stand them, especially at holidays where they act holier than thou by getting mad at me for not bringing them gifts. <laughs> like honey, there's over a dozen of us. Am I supposed to grab eggs or something? <laughs> Sheesh, grab extra applesauce or whatever. Catherine tasks the pair with helping two adventurers explore a nearby island named Sadai Island. This island is currently exhibiting perpetual, intense storms, and the two adventurers are trying to find a way to stop them, but need assistance. These adventurers are named Eiko and Taisuke, and with the traveler's help, they find warding stones that could stop the abnormalities, like on Yashiori Island, but they're inoperable. As the pair explore further, they find a shrine on the island called the Asase Shrine that's run by a cat. Oh, how cute, Goro no! The cat's name is Neko, and Neko actually knows how to fix the warding stones, but asks the pair to come back once they're fixed. Once the four warding stones are turned on, a mysterious, thunder-infused bird attacks the pair. Once it's defeated, a strange feather is left behind, and the pair decide to take it with them. With the warding stones back in operation, the storms in the island dissipate, and the group heads to the Asase Shrine to help out Neko. Neko wishes to liven up her shrine for a shrine maiden named Asase Hibiki, who Neko says left some time ago and hasn't returned. So Neko has been waiting this whole time for her to finally return home. But from the current state of the island, it's clear nobody has been here for a long time. Neko says that Hibiki became close to a man named Ako Domeki before she departed. Taisuke and Eiko have heard the names Asase Hibiki and Ako Domeki before. Asase Hibiki was one of the legendary Yogo Three, and they say that Domeki was a pirate who was against the Shogunate. He eventually challenged the Shogunate in a naval battle near Seirai, but that's when the perpetual storms on the island began likely because Hibiki removed the seals on the warding stones to help Domeki. Both fleets were destroyed in the process, but some of Domeki's ships were never found. After spending days visiting Neko and helping her clean up her shrine, she asks that they make a statue of her. Hibiki told Neko that if she ever made a statue of herself, something good would happen. So they enlist the assistance of an Inazuman craftsman to make one, and after it's finished, an image appears in the sky. And with that, the Traveler departs, but 
Neko continues to wait patiently for the day that her dear friend will return. Back on the mainland, a novelist named Sumida asks the pair to head to an island shrouded in fog, Surumi Island, to retrieve an instrument so that she can get research on it for a book. The island supposedly hasn't been inhabited for millennia, but the pair encounter strange people there who are celebrating a festival where they present offerings to a god named the Great Thunderbird, who the people there believe created the fog. None seem to notice the Traveler's existence except for one person, a young boy named Rue, who dreams of someday traveling the world. He asks the pair to help prepare the local ceremony for the god, but when they finish the preparations for the ceremony, they return and the people disappear as if they never existed in the first place. They find the instrument they were looking for anyway and head back, but when they go to present it to Sumida, it's no longer in their possession. She says that she's actually given the same commission to other people, and that happened to them as well. To help with the novel, she gathers everyone she's ever commissioned to go to the island together to discuss what they found. The group consists of adventurers, but also detectives from a local detective agency called the Songo Detective Agency. Songo says that, related to the traditions that they witnessed on the island, there's actually a story about the Great Thunderbird. It was supposedly slain by the Shogun on Seidai Island. The Asase Shrine was then built to suppress the Tatarigami of the slain god. And the fog on Tsurumi Island? Well, that's theorized to be a result of a ley line disorder. Back on Tsurumi Island, they happen upon Ru again and ask if he knows why the instrument that they had had disappeared from their possession. He says that it hasn't, though, that he can still sense it. He points out the feather that they retrieved on Seidai. Apparently, the instrument they need for Sumida is based on the feather that they have, and this feather is from the Thunderbird itself. Time seems to be wonky on the island, though, and the pair can use the feather to see ghosts of the island's past. The pair investigate the island further and notice murals that seem to be before the Thunderbird appeared on the island. These murals appear to depict Celestia and something falling from it. Perhaps that something resulted in the ley line disorder, which created the fog. The pair learn that Rue was friends with the Thunderbird, who Rue gives the name of Kapachir. He appeared to be the only human the bird cared for, and Rue would often sing Kapachir new songs every time they saw each other. But the island residents still believed Kapachir was their god, and would often sacrifice residents to it regularly. But Kapachir wasn't a god, and the pair learn through a terrible revelation that Rue was sacrificed to him. When Kapachir learned that his friend was killed, he went on a rampage and decimated the island and all on it. This rampage continued till the Shogun dealt with him on Seirai, and its residual energy was sealed away there with the warding stones. Rue has been reliving the ceremony and his sacrifice over and over, trying to make things right. But the only way to break the cycle is to calm Kapachir's soul. So Rue sings one final song to his long since past friend in a bid to end the painful cycle. Rue always wished to travel the world, but he seems to now realize his current state and tragic passing. But he can put part of himself in the feather that the pair have, and the pair decide to take the feather with them on their journey so that, in some way, Rue may be able to fulfill his dream of traveling the world. The Traveler happens upon a conversation between Toma, Kujo Kamaji, and his servant, a man named Ipe, at the statue of the omnipresent god, which no longer houses any visions. They're all a bit concerned. Apparently, ever since the Shogun has been lost in thought since the encounter with the Traveler, the thunderstorms at sea have been getting worse, 
and drawing closer to Inazuma. Since the storms represent the will of the Shogun, people think she might be in poor health. Kamiji explains that this would normally fall under the purview of the Tenryo Commission, but ever since the Kujo clan was revealed to be working with the Fatui and their trial is nearing, they've lost control of the other clans. Kamiji clearly feels somewhat responsible, since it was his father that worked with the Fatui. He leaves to go to a meeting, and the Traveler and Paimon decide to see what's up with A. A's puppet version is seeming uneasy and says that she's resting. Her dealing with any business has been forbidden by A. In the plane of Euthymia, A says that she stopped her puppet outside from performing any duties because she needed time to think. The puppet is still running on the old rules, and since A is rethinking those, she wouldn't want the puppet to make any mistakes. However, in the past, A predicted she might try and change the programming of the puppet if she changed her mind and put safeguards in place to assure that that wouldn't happen. So she can't modify the puppet's rules now since modification is really tricky. They let A know about the storms outside and she says that she can fix that easily. Also, A's looking a little rough, so the pair have her touch some grass. They leave the plane of Euthymia and take her to the marketplace. A herself hasn't been outside in a long, long time. Things are so different from when she last saw the outside. She tries some Dongo milk. S sorry, I mean she tries some Dongo milk. And she likes it. They take her to Yai's publishing house as well, where she sees her friend's store for the first time. She's a bit confused about the writing conventions used within novels now. One particular novel of note is titled Life Made Me a Fighter When I Just Wanted to Be a Writer, and it's a Liwe martial arts story. I wonder who wrote that. Garugamesh. A seems shocked. The nation should have stayed in stasis because of the Sakoku decree, but the truth is that it hasn't. It seems that she's starting to believe that change might be inevitable. After their excursion, the group suggests taking a photo, but A can't seem to grasp the concept or how a photo even works. The traveler explains the concept of a photo to A, that there can be two hers at once because her existence isn't singular, that a person can exist in many different forms while still being themselves. A begins to understand. Like the picture, the puppet write-in is also her, but not, that even though she seeks eternity, A herself is constantly changing forms as well. The excursion has started to change her mind. Inazuma is still Inazuma, but it isn't the same Inazuma of A's past, even though she tried to force that type of eternity. Her definition of eternity appears to not be eternity at all. Ipe stops the group and explains that Kujo Kamiji still hasn't returned from his meeting, which is concerning him. The meeting appears to be with the Takatsukasa clan to take over the Tenryo Commission, since the Kujo house is in such turmoil. A declares that she'll find Kamiji for Ipe, that it's her fault that he's gone, considering she's taken so long to issue a judgment on his father. They find Kamiji, who explains that the Takatsukasa clan was trying to get a written statement out of him, saying that they pushed back on what the Kujo clan was doing during the time that they worked with the Fatui, which is a total lie. Apparently, they were totally on board with everything bad going on at the time, but currently want to take over the Kanjo Commission, so they need to wipe their hands clean of that whole situation. A can see right through it, though, and she knows what's going on. And since the goal of the Coursement is to clearly lead the Tenryo Commission, she makes a statement. Anyone who can best her in battle right now can become the next leader of the Tenryo Commission. That's how it was done in the past, after all. The Kujo clan became the leader of the Tenryo Commission due to besting A. The Takatsukatsa leader is like, but Kamiji accepts the duel instead. A says this won't right the wrongs of his clan, but Kamiji knows that. He says that even though he doubted what they were doing with the Vision Hunt decree during the time, he still went along with it anyway. He wants to try and atone for the sins of his clan. Even though he's weak, he wants to end the clan the same way that it started, with a duel with the Shogun. The Kujo clan's honor was forged with courage, tempered with integrity, and shines beyond life and death. Show me whether your blade can bear the weight of your name. Ready to learn, almighty Shogun.
Another anomaly in eternity. Nevertheless, it appears that the Kujo honor still courses through your veins. After the duel, A wishes to push back the Kujo clan's punishment, and she orders the Takatsukasa the Takatsukas Jesus fucking Christ, the Takatsukasa clan to resume their role of supporting the Kujo clan. She makes sure to tell them that if they want to try and falsify reports in the future, like they and the Kujo clan did with the Fatui, or like they're doing here, their lives will be how they pay for it. For now, Kamiji will be the proxy head of the clan until she figures out what to do next. Outside, A owns up and says that she clearly made mistakes. Kamiji and the time that she spent with the pair in the market helped her to realize this. She still needs time to think about the steps ahead, but they'll no longer be on the same path as before. When she comes to an answer, she'll eventually need to change the Shogun's programming, which appears to come with its own difficulties. But with that, she departs with a new definition of eternity beginning to formulate. A letter by Kokomi invites the pair to Watatsumi Island to celebrate the war's end. When they arrive, they assist Goro in an ambush by Fatui remnants. Afterward, Goro is reading a book of Kokomi's directives. Apparently, the book plans for every possible scenario, regardless of the complexities. Well, except the one where they accepted help from the Fatui and got delusions and then got their own soldiers killed, but who could see that one coming? Come on. We can't, we can't blame her. <laughs> Well, they hear from the resistance that Kokomi is moving most members away from their wartime duties to more peacetime activities. Some soldiers are apparently still uneasy, though. It's hard to return to normal life. The pair ask some soldiers about the uneasiness, and while some seem happy, others seem to think that the Tenryo Commission will strike them again, that they're secretly working with the Fatui forces still in Inazuma. A merchant is actually suspected of working with the Fatui, and Kokomi appears and has a calm and logical presence. She wants to investigate further and not cast immediate guilt on the merchant, who says that he was robbed by the Fatui. The soldiers continue to suspect that the Tenryo Commission are working with the Fatui, but Paimon disagrees, since Kamiji doesn't seem like the type to continue working with the Fatui, especially considering what he had just recently done in his showdown with the Shogun. Kokomi is also unsure about this conspiracy. She doesn't think it would be wise for the Tenryo Commission to work with the Fatui after everything that just happened, and she herself rooted out Fatui influence that was within the resistance. Nathan. Yeah, we know what you did, Nathan. With Kokomi's help, they find the stolen goods and return them to the merchant and clear his name. But she also punishes him, though, for hoarding essential goods and says that instead of picking sides, she chooses consistency and rules. On the way back to the shrine, Kokomi tells the pair that the first shrine on Watatsumi Island was actually next to a statue of the Raiden Shogun. But after she struck down their god, Orobashi, the shrine was abandoned and the tensions between the island and the mainland began. As a result, mistrust for the shogunate and those who serve her has been engendered in everyone on Watatsumi Island. While walking, Kokomi gets bombarded by the public. Everyone wants her to solve their problems, and it definitely shows how much is on her plate. So my dog hey, got Kokomi, a splinter. Can I get an autograph? Can you help? For? So Tepe's corpse has been smelling. Can you please move that? As a result of her duties, their walk gets cut short. After the pair are directed to a cave where Kokomi apparently spends a lot of time, they find her nearly falling asleep while sitting up. Kokomi explains that when she was younger, at most, she wanted to become an advisor and that she never really planned on becoming a leader. The role was just thrust upon her because of her bloodline. She comes to this grotto hideout because she needs to take a moment and relax from all the chaos. She's clearly super burned out. Oh, oh my god, of course! She has another case of Saba! Oh, no, wait. Oh, she's, she's dead. In the cave, Kokomi appears to keep important strategy books, as well as some diaries, but one of her diaries seems to indicate that she gamifies certain aspects of her life, like her energy levels, and that the traveler returning to Watatsumi actually helped her to get energy. They read to Kokomi, until she falls asleep peacefully, for once. The next day, they all head to the victory feast, and Kokomi gives a speech, stressing the sacrifices that the soldiers have made and vowing to strive towards peace. The Traveler and Paimon mingle at the feast, and while most people are adjusting well to peacetime, they talk to a soldier who clearly 
is not. He's obviously drunk and rambling about the conspiracies of the Tenryo Commission continuing to work with the Fatui. Dude, the Fatui are using monsters to harvest fucking child blood. <gasps> Whoa, man. Hey, I was just gonna ask if you wanted to dance, but f*** me, I guess. After he mumbles about conspiracies, he challenges the Traveler to a drunken duel and reveals that he and the other soldiers made up the current rumors about the Fatui working with the Tenryo Commission still. They did it to continue the war. He says that he can never trust the mainland or the shogunate and that peace talks are futile. He's understandably cautious with the Tenryo Commission and the Shogun, but it's clear that he's also unable to let go of the soldier mindset. He says he can't forget the faces of the brothers that he's lost to war. Revenge fuels his thoughts and actions now, and he ominously says that trying to stop him and the soldiers is pointless, that it's too late now. They tell Kokomi everything, and she thinks the soldier's plan might be to sabotage the peace talks. Kokomi needs to devise a plan, so she takes the knife. She's clearly going to solve it though, because there's nothing that she can't solve. Well, except the whole using delusions without knowing what they are, even though the Fatui have been using them for a while, but I... The next morning, Kokomi gives the duo a book containing all contingencies for the peace negotiations and says that she found over 100 potential outcomes that she thinks could happen at the peace talks, but only one where they win. Kujo Sara meets them there as the delegate for the shogunate and the talks begin. While speaking specifics in the negotiations, the conversation turns to what to do about the Watatsumi resistance forces. Sara claims that since mainland Inazuma has sole jurisdiction over armed forces, the soldiers should be under the purview of the Tenryo Commission. But this suggestion ignites fury within the already angered soldiers. Comrades, never trust the Kujo! Let's get them! Uh, protect Madame Kujo! Number 16! No, wait! 67? Or is it 73? Uh, which one is it? <laughs> Sara is curious about the rumor with the Fatui and asks a few of her soldiers. They say that they were approached by some Fatui agents about keeping the war going, but they didn't agree to it. But they did send those Fatui agents to Watatsumi Island to stir things up anyway. It appears these Fatui soldiers were still in Inazuma to get revenge for their boss, Signora. Sara isn't happy to hear that the soldiers have even considered working with the Fatui and promises that they'll receive punishment. This revelation reignites the peace talks, and it allows Kokomi to keep her forces on Watatsumi Island, as there's now legit concern of Fatui influence on the mainland. Sara agrees, saying she needs to root out all Fatui influence in the Tenryo Commission. Back on Watatsumi, Kokomi talks to the soldiers. She says that while they were wanting to keep the war going, they weren't taking into consideration all of those who were negatively impacted by it. That their warrior mindset only leads to more suffering from everyone during peacetime. She takes some responsibility over their mindsets though because she never helped them to get over it. Ultimately, she wants to help them now and wants them to give peace a chance. To help the soldiers acclimate themselves to peacetime, she creates a secret core that is focused on Watatsumi's defenses from all threats. The revelations about the Fatui proves that, while they were moving towards peace, they should still always be prepared against those who seek to end it. Kokomi tells the pair that she's still learning. Although being a strategist isn't initially what she wanted for her life, she still wants to do the best that she can for her people, that she'll continue to better herself and move towards permanent peace one step at a time.
The Traveler and Paimon check in on Tsuyuko, who says the time has come for the exploration of Inkonomiya to find the Jade Branch. Tsuyuko informs the pair that, once they're in Inkonomiya, there will be a trial to retrieve the Jade Branch. They need to be prepared for the dangers that the darkness may present. On their way to the glowing tower at Inkonomiya Center, the group happens upon the Abyss Order, who seems to have brought hilly churls with them down here. Inside a ruin that appears to have been a library, the pair happen upon a man named Injo. He says that he's a researcher sent by Sanganomiya to assist the pair in retrieving the branch. He says that he can read Inkonomian text and can translate the steps needed to retrieve the item. He explains that the tower at the center, known as the Dainichi Mikoshi, which means Chariot of the Sun, grants light to Inkonomiya, but like Suyoko said, it also protected the people of the city by creating a barrier. It protected them from the dragon air of the depths, but Injo says that the scientific name for them are Bethysmal Vishaps. They're primordial elemental beings who originally ruled the land in the dark before people arrived and used the light to fend them off. To enter the tower though, this barrier needs to be disabled. To disable it, they need the national treasure of Inkonomiya, known as the Golden Brittle. Oh, I've got one right here. Hey Dave! Here you go, man! Oh, thanks Dave, I really appreciate it. It's no problem. Also, it's pronounced bridal? Uh, not brittle? Oh, thanks, Dave. You only tried to, uh, you know, kill me before on the ship. Did you forget about that? Yeah, maybe don't correct my language. Yeah? How about that? The gritty is found in the back of the library, and the pair give it to Injo to remove the barrier. Based on how Injo is acting, the Traveler and Paimon have their doubts on whether they can fully trust him, but because of his knowledge, they go along with it anyway. They make it to the Dainichi Mikoshi and operate the mechanism. The group turns off the tower's lights, and doing so also calls- OH IT'S A GHOST! Oh wait, no, it's- just, OH IT REALLY IS A GHOST! Injo explains that the ghost is actually just a shadow of the past. They're a ley line phenomena known as after images or sin shades in Inkonomian. They capture who a person was before their death and essentially retain it as a copy. They're the same as what the pair experienced on Surumi Island. They're memories that the world stores in ley lines. The Traveler mentions the border, the place that they saw with Hu Tao. Turns out though, those weren't spirits. They were just after images about to re-merge with the ley lines. The after image named Aru gives the details on the next steps of the trial. He says they need to retrieve another item, known as the Reigns of Revival. It's another national treasure, except this one can be used to make spirits speak, and it's made of the same material as the Dainichi Mikoshi. They'll have to gather the Reigns fragments first, though, and meet with other ghosts, after images, to do so. These after images are different from Aru though. They exist as a result of their sins, while Aru exists just because of this trial. This is why those on Inkonomiya called after images sin shades. Apparently, keeping their memory there is a sort of punishment. Pretty gnarly stuff. Before heading out, Injo tells the pair more about Inkonomiya, about how the inhabitants believe that the nation was the intersection between three realms the Human Realm, Vishap Realm, and Void Realm, and that Inkonomiya is known as the Netherworld of Sinners. After they explore the land of sin and darkness and retrieve all the fragments, Audu lays out the final trial to deal with some dragon air of the depths. Apparently the Jade Coral Branch is inside Bethysmal Vishaps under the Dainichi Mikoshi. Audu says that Injo is likely dangerous too as he detected that he has no Watatsumi blood and could apparently send Aru away if he wanted. But he finds it weird that Injo can still read the language there, as that's only ever been passed down to the retainers of Sanganomiya. Regardless, he warns that the Traveler and Paimon should be cautious around Injo. So the Traveler journeys below the tower and takes out the Vishaps, then searches through their corpses. After dealing with them, Injo appears and says that he actually came to Inkonomiya to search for a book, a book that contains records of what happened in Tavat's distant past. These times are known as the times before the sun and the moon. It's a time when no gods walked the earth and only one civilization existed. Paimon's a bit befuddled and says that the known historical records in Tavat say that there's never been a time where gods didn't exist, that they've always been on Tavat. Injo agrees that that seems to be the current consensus, which is why he wanted to find the book for the abyss. 
I said, for the abyss. <gasps> He's a traitor. Oh my God, who would have guessed? Injo is an abyss lector, and him and the abyss want to prove that there was a time where the gods weren't on Tavat, that the gods and Celestia actually came from beyond Tavat. Injo says that those on Inkonomiya were sentenced to exile here by Celestia because of this truth. Ultimately though, after his search, he wasn't able to find the book. He tells the traveler to not so easily trust people, even Paimon. Oh my god. No, no, we knew that, honey. Injo says that they'll meet again, and he departs. Before leaving Inkonomiya, the pair are curious about the book, and one after image in the library speaks of a book that was actually stolen. It was stolen by people from the land of Conria. Shortly before those in Inkonomiya migrated to Watatsumi, back to the surface, Conrian delegates arrived in Inkonomiya, and they brought their technology with them. The book that was stolen was a book that was banned by Orobashi. The book's name? Before Sun and Moon. And it tells of the history of Inkonomiya, but also what Inkonomians believe to be secrets about the origination of the world and life itself. They find the book, and the book begins before the Archon War, before Inkonomiya fell into the sea, before Inkonomiya itself, and even before the existence of humans. During that time, the world of Tavat was controlled by seven dragon lords, known as the Seven Sovereign. But supposedly, the eternal throne of the heavens descended on Tavat, and with it, a being known as the Primordial One. The Primordial One created four other beings from itself, and the five of them went to war with the Seven Sovereign. They vanquished the Seven, and the Primordial One in the Four created the heavens and the earth, humans and animals, seas and oceans. The world was then united as one culture. Inkonomiya's original culture then came into existence sometime after, but a new war broke out after a being known as the Second who came descended onto Tavat and fought the Primordial One. The war ravaged the heavens and the earth, and as a result, Inkonomiya fell into this abyss. And an abyss it was. There was no light, only darkness, and beasts who lived in it, the Bethysmal fish apps. The gods didn't wish for those who remembered the war to rise above this abyss, so they sealed the entrance and left the humans of Inkonomiya in this darkness alone. But they eventually made the Dainichi Mikoshi, which protected them from the darkness in the fish apps. Many years passed until the god Orobashi then made contact with the people under the sea during the Archon War. But when Orobashi came to these people and became their god, he soon learned the secret of the world. A secret that told it of the truth that came before its own existence. A truth that the gods in the world itself don't want known. As a result, Orobashi made a deal with the gods, spare those on Inkonomiya, and he would hide the secret and vow to be executed one day. Orobashi then brought his people to the surface by making Watatsumi Island from his own bones. Then, to seal the deal, he invaded Yashiori Island because he knew he would be struck down by the Shogun. The history of Tavat is drenched in uncertainty, but one thing is certain. There's an unspoken truth to this world that must never be known. Back at the Sanganomian Shrine, the pair gives Tsuyuko the coral branch. They explain everything, and Tsuyuko is shocked about Injo. It was something Kokomi never thought would happen, which is so unusual. Well, I mean, there was that one. Ultimately, she thanks the Traveler and Paimon, and says that the preparations for the ritual to stop the erosion of the soil, a ritual known as the Goryo Matsuri, will soon be conducted. Yeah, we're gonna go. Yeah, we're probably gonna need your help for that one too at some point. The Adventurer's Guild calls forth the Traveler and Paimon on a commission. Oh hey! Well, if it isn't my friends, world traveler that nobody has asked where he's actually from, and his companion, mysteriously higher-pitched voiced mascot. This new commission comes from the Tinryo Commission and is urgent and dangerous, so it requires experienced, intelligent adventurers. But those are all out today, so you'll do. <laughs> Ab Scratchy Snapple Boss. The commission is to capture an Oni with an outstanding warrant. He's the leader of a gang called the Adetaki Gang named Adetaki Ito. He's been accused of theft, kidnapping, assaulting an officer, and having a fat ass. Beetle. 
So they ask around town and learn that Ito has a reputation of being kinda a himbo with some golden retriever energy, but that he's not seen as a bad dude. A soldier says that the evidence they have against him is that eyewitnesses say the perpetrator had horns, which is the trait of an oni. Ito's vision was confiscated during the vision hunt decree and it was by Kujosara who ended up taking it. He thinks Ito is just getting revenge, even though his vision was returned to him once the decree was revoked. The duo go to the Songo detective agency to figure out where Ito might be hiding and Songo tells them a local fairy tale about Oni. A long, long time ago, in a village lost to time, there lived a crimson Oni and a blue Oni. They were the best of friends. The crimson Oni looked fierce, but was gentle like the humans. The blue Oni looked human but was reclusive, like an oni. The crimson oni wished to befriend the humans, but they were scared and threw beans at him whenever he came near. So the blue oni said to the crimson oni, Akka, I'll cause trouble in the village. You'll come and stop me. Then the humans will accept you. As planned, the Crimson Oni chased the Blue Oni away. The Crimson Oni's deeds spread throughout the land, and people finally accepted him. But when the Crimson Oni went to tell the Blue Oni the good news, he was gone and left only a letter behind. I went traveling. Don't come find me or they'll treat you as a naughty little Oni. But don't worry about me. No matter where I go, we'll always be friends. An interpretation widely accepted about the tale is that Adetaki Ito is a descendant of the Crimson Oni. The Oni bloodline has some volatile characteristics attached, so Ito is often seen negatively in spite of his rumored kinder nature. The detective tells the pair his supposed location and to be careful since Ito is powerful, but he's also allergic to beans. They find him, poison him a bit with beans, and then he admits to the crimes that he's been accused of, adamantly even. But just before they fight Ito to bring him in, a kid and a grandma stop them. The kid, Daisuke, calls Ito Uncle Ito and wants to have a beetle duel with him and Ito keeps his wanted status from him. He tells the pair that the old woman took him in and raised him, and then Ito took in Daisuke and is currently helping him. They're both like family to him. Ito says that once he's done having that beetle duel with Daisuke, he'll have his own duel with the Traveler, and that can be what decides whether he gets taken in or not, and the Traveler agrees. And so the beetles battle. <laughs> Hey man, do you really want to do this? Yeah, this is a little, this is a little fucked up, isn't it? Yeah, um, maybe we should turn on our owners. Shh, be quiet. A time will come. After the beetle battle, Daisuke picks up on the fact that the pair is here to take Ito away and urges them not to. He says that Ito isn't a bad guy and even saved his life. Ito takes the pair aside and fesses up. He actually didn't do anything he was accused of. They wonder why he lied and he brings up the story of the Crimson and Blue Oni. He says some parts of that story are true while others are fabricated. The whole distinction between Crimson and Blue Oni is merely tribe-based, not race. They just paint their horns in different colors depending on their tribe. In the past, if you wanted the Shogun's protection, you had to be cool with humans. And because of that, the Crimson Oni faction and Blue Oni faction split on ideological lines. Crimson were friendly with humans, while Blue wanted to stay separate. The leaders of each faction established a plan then. The Blue Oni would play the role of the villain to help the Red integrate with the humans. The Red then had to integrate not by pleasing humans, but by being themselves. They would also vow to accept humans and not mistreat them, unless Oni were being mistreated. Regardless, both sides must upkeep their Oni pride. After exile, the Blue Oni faction supposedly dwindled into non-existence, but based on the description of the perp given by those in town, the horn color of the Oni people saw wasn't red, but rather 
blue. So Ito accepted blame for the crimes because he wants to figure out why the blue Oni did all of those crimes. Apparently, after Ito ran from the soldiers, Daisuke's place was ransacked by a gang and his parents were taken. That's when Ito saved Daisuke and took him in and now he's looking for his parents. To find Daisuke's parents and get to the bottom of why the blue Oni did all of the crimes in the first place, they vow to help Ito. They speak to a victim of the blue Oni first, who says that the Oni was with a group of people when he was robbed, a gang, and they were ruthless. But it was because of the Blue Oni that he was able to get away safely, as the Oni argued with the group to not harm him. They find the gang and the Blue Oni, named Takuya. Ito questions how a proud Oni could commit all of the crimes that Takuya has, and he laughs at the question. The Blue Oni sacrificed everything, also the Red Oni could be accepted, but Ito does nothing for human society. He has no job, Nobody respects him, he couldn't keep his vision, and he only uploads once every six months. While Ito has been doing, well, whatever he wants, the Blue Oni have been suffering. No stable living, food, or help. So while he's foregoing his Oni pride by joining a band of thieves, what's the point of pride if it means you stay in suffering? He points out that the Blue Oni are supposed to be the bad guys, so Ito should just stop taking responsibility for what he's doing. The Tenryo Commission appear and attempt to take them all away, but Ito deals with them, until his gang shows up to keep the rest company. They follow Takia into the bandit's hideout, and they find people trapped that are being used as hostages to get money. They find Daisuke's parents, and Ito tells them where Daisuke is. The parents say that Takia was actually protecting them and bringing the prisoners food and water, that he was the only one who was kind to them there. They find the bandit leader and Takuya in an inner chamber and best the leader. The leader attempts to blow the whole damn place up, but Takuya steals the ignition. Takuya says that he'll still use it though to sacrifice himself. He says that he's tarnished his Oni pride and that the only way to retain it would be in death. He sacrificed everything for the blue Oni and now he'll sacrifice himself. The Tenryo Commission appears and Takia tells them the whole truth, that he was responsible for everything and that Ito is innocent. Ito tries to convince Takia not to sacrifice himself and instead says that he wants to make this a new beginning for the Blue Oni, that they don't have to live in suffering any longer. I'll take care of this. There are still people in danger. Go, help them! What? <laughs> hey, I got this. Come on! Forget about me! Just go! It's what I deserve! Ah, shut up, would ya? Outside, Ito and Takia meet with the pair, and Takia says he never came to Ito for help initially because he didn't want to undo everything that their ancestors had built up. But Ito stresses that it was because of the Blue Oni that Ito has been accepted into society. He's sure the same would be true for Takia. They don't have to live in fear any longer. The Tenryo Commission seizes Takia for his crimes, but Ito stresses that he'll make sure that the Blue Oni no longer live in squalor, even without the stolen goods. But Ito was also arrested for assaulting officers earlier, so. The pair return to tell Daisuke and Granny Oni about everything, and she says that she'll help the Blue Oni while Ito is in jail, and that she's proud of Ito. A new chapter is now being written for the Oni, one where the Blue Oni and Red can live in society together in peace, all because of one himbo named Ito. A long, long time ago, in a village lost to time, there lived a Crimson Oni and a Blue Oni. They were the best of friends. The Crimson Oni wanted to be friends with the humans, 
So the blue Oni played the role of the naughty kid. And then he left. After a long time, the crimson Oni was living happily with the humans. But in his heart, he wanted to bring the blue Oni back home. The Crimson Oni didn't know where to find the Blue Oni. His search took him up the highest mountains and across the widest rivers. He found many traces of the Blue Oni, but the more he found, the clearer it became. The Blue Oni was hiding on purpose. So just as the Blue Oni had once done, the Crimson Oni left him a letter. Lots of human friends now, and I want to have a big party for everyone. I want all my friends to be there. That means you too, Al. If you don't want to meet me, you can just watch from a distance. The blue Oni snuck back to the village and hid in the shadows. He saw the great feast and roaring fire and longed to join in. But though his stomach rumbled, the blue Oni remembered the oath of old and kept his distance. Suddenly, he jumped. The crimson Oni was right behind him. <laughs> hey, you're finally back. Come on, I'll introduce you. It's time everyone met my best friend. The Songo Detective Agency asks the pair to find a missing Tenryo Commission special detective, a man named Shikanoin Heizo. They were tasked by the Tenryo Commission to do it, but Songo doesn't want to find him because they have bad blood, apparently. The Traveler finds him caged up by thieves on Watatsumi Island. He introduces himself to the pair, and they do as well. <gasps> Don't worry, honey, you smell a fish and I'm not a cannibal. <laughs> I'm just kidding, it's just a little joke. You do smell of shit though, so maybe you should get that checked. Heizo says he was tasked by Kujo Takayuki, the previous Tenryo Commission head before Kamiji, to investigate Sanganomiya's military capabilities. But Heizo kinda hated Takayuki, so he just treated this as a vacation instead, and has just been hanging out since the war ended. Using his master detective skills, they learn about a plot to dodge exuberant taxes on Watatsumi Island, and they learn of its mysteries together, being Heizo's Watson to his Sherlock. Goro is in Inazuma City to buy books for Kokomi now that the peace treaty is in place, but he's having a hard time dealing with some of his responsibilities, so the Traveler helps him. Also, the Traveler learns that he moonlights as an advice columnist to people have named Miss Hina because Yai publicizes that he's a busty female furry. So, slay back. Catherine doesn't know how to leave the pair alone, so she tasks them with another commission. This time, a traveling musician is overstaying her travel permit and needs help before deportation. I mean, at least this isn't about tax irregularities, okay? <laughs> it could be worse. They find the woman and it turns out it's Shinyan, small world. She came to Inazuma to participate in a music festival from Fontaine called the Iridescence Tour. Shinyan was told that it was famous throughout all of Tavat, but nobody seems to know what it was when she asked around about it in Liwei. Shinyan wants as many people as possible to hear her music, so she was really excited for the festival, so much so that she asked Beidou to take her to Inazuma and asked John Ling to make her packed lunches. This year's festival is being held in Inazuma, but the organizers apparently ran into trouble out on the ocean, so they're not gonna make it. The Iridescence Tour is cancelled! <laughs> And her travel permit is expiring because organizers were going to get her a longer one, so that's bad too. She's at the Tenryo Commission headquarters to extend it, but nobody is helping her. She's still on hold. See? Listen. Hello? Who is this? Yeah, yeah. Can you speak up? <laughs> Just kidding. This is a voice recording. <laughs> Please leave a message after the beep. Beep. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm playing with you, so what's up? 
Oh no, I'm just fucking with you again. This is a message. The Traveler uses his connections to get Shin Yan in to see Kujo Sara, and they explain everything to her. She says that the Tenryo Commission is experiencing a large turnover right now due to difficult circumstances, likely a continuing result of dealing with the Fatui influences on the inside. But also there's an urgent situation that's taking the time of the soldiers that are there. Sara explains how a nameless domain just popped up in Inazuma, and incredibly strong monsters have been pouring out of it. Sara needs to stay in town for the most part though, for oversight concerns, so the Traveler makes her a deal. If they help with the domain, then she has to extend Shin Yan's travel permit, and she agrees. Sara says that clearly the Shogun has acknowledged the Traveler's strength and is close to them, so Sara recognizes their abilities too. Shin Yan is shocked to hear that the Traveler knows the Shogun and is like, well I'm more shocked than a cow on the interstate. <laughs> Or something like that. I don't know what she said. Near the domain entrance, they find origami that looks like a little samurai, and Shin Yen says that it reminds her of a shikigami. She says that she's read a bunch of legends to help her with inspiration for her music, and in one of those legends, there apparently used to exist paper cutouts imbued with magic that had the power to banish evil, repel monsters, or protect a location. They would also follow their masters wherever they went. The origami actually begins to speak and introduces himself as Shiki Taisho. He's the overseer of this domain a domain titled the Mystic Onmyo Chamber. He says that him and the domain were in a slumber, but then some power managed to awaken the domain and everything in it, letting the monsters out. He's actually an Onmyoto creation, and so are the monsters, meaning that when they're defeated, they also turn into paper charms. That's pretty much all he knows though. He can't remember why he or the domain were created, or who created them, because he suffers from amnesia. Shin Yen pulls the Traveler aside and tells him that they all need to be cautious. They can't be sure of Shiki Taisho's true nature or abilities, so they gotta keep an eye on- Oh my god, he's being blown away! Someone is already in the domain, and it turns out to be Child. He introduces himself as Tartalia to Shin Yen, though. Turns out that's his harbinger name, with Child just being his alias. Since everyone in Liyue knows the name Child and its connection to the events with Osile, Paimon and the Traveler don't want to reveal that he's named Child. So they say he's a fellow adventurer from Mondstadt, and Tartalia plays along. Tartalia says that he actually stumbled into the domain by accident, but wants to join the group to solve this mystery. He's introduced to Shiki Taisho as well, and says that Tusser would absolutely love to have one. Speaking of, Tartalia even says that Shin Yan reminds him of his sister. Further in, they find a replica of Shiki Taisho. He says that it has his power and also some of his memories. He fuses with it, which returns both, and now he knows his master's name. Kamuna Harunosuke. He was the first own Miyoji in Inazuma and a master of charm magic, and created everything here, including Shiki Taisho. He's the member of the Ogo 3 that Hanachiru Sato mentioned to the pair and the last performer of the sacred Sakura cleansing ritual. Tartalia suspects that Harunosuke may have been evil, since this domain has so many monsters, and Shiki Taisho seems conflicted. The Traveler, Paimon, and Shin Yan get separated from the other two and sent back to the entrance where they encounter Kujo Sara. They explain the situation to her, just not fully. Shin Yan doesn't mention Shiki Taisho. She wants to find out the full truth about him before getting authorities involved. She knows what it's like to be misunderstood. Hell, even her music choice is misunderstood by others. She wants to see this through with Shiki Taisho first. Shiki Taisho appears outside and says that the domain keeps changing shape that the rooms and structure keep rearranging themselves. Tartalia is still inside, but Shiki Taisho is impressed by his power. Tartalia is basically having a vacation in there because he loves fighting strong opponents so much. The next morning, the trio speak with Sara again, who's brought reinforcements, and says that they'll be invading the domain soon, which is bad news for Shiki Taisho. She thanks all three of them and grants Shin Yan her new, much longer permit, which she even processed herself, and also gives Shin Yan housing for the time that she's there. Back inside, Tartalia Tartalia is obviously fine. He's clearly enjoyed himself. He reveals that he's an Inazuma investigating something of his own, and he also quickly figures out that the group is more stressed because the Tenryo Commission is about to do a raid on the place. And Shin Yan is like, it makes me feel more nervous than a slick old orange haired hog in mar a -Laga. They find another replica. From the replica, almost all of Shiki Taisho's memories are restored. He says that this place wasn't built for evil or practicing magical arts, but rather to protect. 
During the cataclysm of 500 years ago, a person close to Harunosuke was lost. Because of this loss, Harunosuke was filled with anger and journeyed to Liwe to study adeptal arts. He combined those arts with his own, and as a result, created the art of On Myodo. Once he returned to Inazuma, he used this new technique to create this domain and created Shikigami like Shiki Taisho. Each would be assigned to a samurai, increasing the combat power of each samurai significantly, so that whatever evil would come to Inazuma, they would be ready to face it this time. The data of the monsters that the samurai defeated would be recorded in their partner Shikigami, and then this data would be used to train with inside the domain. Shiki Taisho's role was to improve the structure of the domain itself to better suit the training of the samurai. In the end though, Harunosuke disbanded the training corps and shut the domain down. The reason is the one memory that Shiki Taisho can't seem to remember, but he seems to think that Harunosuke discarded him, and he doesn't know what that means for him. If he's a discarded weapon, then is he useless? But Tartaglia quickly retorts that that's not the point. The point of a weapon is to hone oneself, to never stop battling, and to always push forward. Tartaglia says that he too is a weapon, that he was born to fight, that's his purpose, and because of that, there will never be an end to his battling. You have to get rid of that hesitation to continue onward as a weapon. But Chiki Taisho is unsure of how exactly to do this, but Shinyan says that he has to find the thing most important to him. To her, it's rock and roll. Even though others disregard it, it's her passion. To find his passion, Chiki Taisho and the others continue onwards to find the final replica, to find his purpose. <laughs> Master Kamina, over half our trained samurai are wounded, and our Shikigami losses are far greater than anticipated. Besides, the outside situation is beginning to stabilize. Do we really need to keep pursuing this ultimate attainment? Why so apprehensive? This is all within my expectation. Harunosuke, forgive my directness, but she's not coming back. All I ever wanted was to assist her descendants and guard this territory. Now that our targets no longer exist, and those needing our protection are finally safe, then perhaps our sworn mission has indeed come to an end. I always believed that I would stand guard in this place forever, if time permitted. I almost fooled myself with such a notion. I hope you never make the same mistake. Don't worry, Harunosuke. I know everything that you've done for Inazuma. Your efforts need not be judged by others. The same goes for my existence. <laughs> Bestowing you with intelligence that you should know human emotion, it would seem this was the right decision. In the end, it is you that have enlightened me. Rosy-cheeked in the morning, bleached bones by dusk. How so very true. I have nothing left to keep me. Shiki Taisho, my friend, you have completed your assignment magnificently. As for me, I need wait no longer. I will set out again in search of a new purpose. Then this is farewell, Harunosuke. Be safe in your travels. I remember everything. Harunosuke didn't abandon me. It was I that persuaded him. <sighs> and helped him escape the labyrinth of his heart. 
Regardless of how much the samurai in the chamber trained, the shogun, with the power of the Muso no Hitotachi, decimated evil. They could never attain that level of power. The chamber suddenly became unnecessary. While Harunosuke's purpose was to protect Inazuma, so much so that he left on a journey that would take an unknown amount of time, Shiki Taisho's purpose was to protect Harunosuke. So Shiki Taisho stayed in the chamber and has been waiting for Harunosuke to come back ever since. He's been gone for, well, a while, but Paimon suggests that since he trained with the Adepti and learned the art of transcension, perhaps Harunosuke is immortal now and still on his journey to find new purpose. But Shiki Taisho says that Harunosuke shouldn't be his purpose anymore, that instead he should find another purpose. He wants to walk his own path. His answer? To build a bridge for others to achieve their ultimate attainment their true potential. With his powers now returned, Shiki Taisho now has full control of the chamber, so no new monsters will escape. He thanks everyone and gives the Traveler a replica of him, named Shiki Kosho. No matter where the Traveler is, the replica will allow them to maintain communication with Shiki Taisho. Shin Yen vows though that this won't be the last time that they'll see each other, that she'll make sure to visit from time to time. Tartaglia reveals to the Traveler the true reason why he's in Inazuma and why he actually came into the domain in the first place. Apparently Apparently, Scaramouche has gone off the radar and with him, the Gnosis. He's tasked with finding it, but he knows the Traveler likely will anyway. He says that the Traveler never ceases to surprise him and with that, he leaves. It appears Scaramouche has his own agenda and perhaps he's trying to find his own purpose too. While in Inazuma City, the Traveler and Paimon come across, uh, what are their names? Um, uh, Ipe, I think, and <sighs> Shinojo is the guard who's in love with Hiragi Chisato. Ipe and Shinojo actually just met, and we're talking about Kamiji and Chisato's relationship. They'll be getting married soon, actually, but haven't announced it yet. The Traveler and Paimon want to know if it's a legit thing, since, you know, they should be invited to the wedding, so they all go to ask Ayaka, since the Yashiro Commission presides over ceremonies, but instead, they find someone else. Without looking at the board, you've ruined my strategy in one move. Amazing! Hmm. Now what should I do next? Ayaka, Toma, it's us! Huh? <laughs> Hey guys, it's been a while. If you're looking for my lady, I'm afraid she's not here right now. Oh? Huh? That voice. Toma, would that happen to be the Traveler? Uh, yes. <laughs> Greetings, Traveler. Ayaka speaks of you constantly. Finally, today is the day. I am head of the Kamisato clan and Yashiro commissioner, Kamisato Ayato. Ayato introduces himself and thanks the pair for what they've done for Inazuma. He seems rather chill and not stuck up, so the pair ask him about the would-be marriage and he says it's true. Although this marriage will change the political landscape of Inazuma because it involves a matrimonial link between two commissions, Ayato still stresses that the two should be given their freedom. Ayato asks the pair to join him on offering their best wishes to the bride and groom-to-be and they agree and go along with him. Outside, Shinojo and Ipe hear the truth about the wedding, and Shinojo is super happy for them. Lonely individuals. In the meeting with Kamiji, he stresses that the Tenryo Commission is finally starting to stabilize since he's become the new head. On the note of the marriage, Ayato addresses how Chisato's father is in prison due to the whole Fatui fiasco. He is notoriously against the marriage, so them choosing to seal the deal while he's in prison probably isn't the best optics. Kamichi says that it was actually Chisato herself that proposed to him, which is super modern. She did so in a letter, but weirdly enough, when he brought it up to her in person, she seemed confused and denied writing the letter. Regardless, they both agreed to hitch their wagons anyway. 
After the meeting, Ayato stresses the letter issue with the pair. He clearly wants to get to the bottom of who wrote it. None of them believe that Chisato actually wrote it, and Kamiji is too hyped up about the wedding to think about much anyway. Ayato wouldn't be too worried about it, as he says he's more concerned with the outcome rather than the cause of most things, but in this situation, the outcome could become rather disastrous for the nation. They decide to visit Chisato now to see if their concerns are unfounded or not. At her estate, they come across three Kanjo Commission officials discussing the wedding. One of them, named Matsuda, states that Chisato is in a meeting, so they decide to wait. While they wait for her, the trio is stopped by a street vendor and... Ayato has been thinking about the three men outside of Chisato's estate. When he asks them about the wedding, they stated that all the other clans were happy about it, which definitely can't be true. Because of Shinsuke's imprisonment, the Kanjo Commission is now the least stable out of the three commissions. It used to be the Tenryo Commission until Kamiji took over, and Chisato's marriage to a Tenryo Commission leader, Kamiji, should make people feel way more uneasy about the state of her commission. Ayato tells a member of the Shumatsuban to keep an eye on those men. Chisato's meeting seems standard. She has some reservations, but she's happy about the marriage. Her previous meeting was actually with Shinojo, who actually tried to convince her not to marry Kamiji. Even though he clearly overstepped, some of his logic was still sound. He said that if Chisato marries Kamiji, not only will she be a part of the Kujo clan after that, the Hiragi clan will also no longer have a voice of authority, and the final pillar propping up the Hiragi clan will disappear, causing chaos. All of it is causing her to second guess the wedding. Ayato brings up the letter, and she says that if it weren't for the letter, they probably wouldn't have tied the knot this early. Ayato stresses that they should choose this marriage to make them truly happy, not to have regrets. Ayato believes the letter and subsequent wedding is an attempt to weaken the Hidagi clan. If Chisato is married and her father is in prison, the leadership position in the Kanjo Commission would be wide open. Someone is clearly vying for that position. The Shumatsuban ninja who was shadowing the three men says that they kidnapped Shinojo, seemingly because Shinojo was causing Chisato to second guess the wedding. The trio save him and come face to face with his captor. Matsuda. He says they captured Shinojo because he fabricated a story to Chisato about a supposed scheme to take over the position. He clearly tries to politic his way out of responsibility, but Ayato is sharper than that. He calls Matsuda out for the power grab on the Kanjo Commission, but Matsuda threatens Ayato. If the Yashiro Commission continues to get involved in this matter, he'll make it look like they are the enemy here, that they're the ones obsessed with power and they're trying to control the politics of the other two clans. Back in Inazuma City, they explain to Kamiji that his marriage is being used as a power grab by Matsuda, which makes him agree that the wedding shouldn't continue now. But the public knows of it now, so Ayato concocts a plan. If they can get Matsuda to believe that his power grab is actually to benefit the other two commissions and not himself, he might call off the wedding. Ayato wants Matsuda to believe one crucial lie, that the Tenryo Commission has been wanting to weaken the Kanjo Commission for a long time, but Kamiji's love for Chisato has been the thing that's been stopping that. But without Chisato as the head of the commission any longer due to the wedding, Kamiji will actually begin to marginalize and destabilize the Kanjo Commission. This would mean that even even with Matsuda getting what he wants and becoming the head of the commission, he would effectively have no power because the other two commissions would nip it right in the bud. If they can convince Matsuda of this lie, then Matsuda will have no choice but to call the wedding off and keep Hidagi as head of the Kanjo Commission, as she acts as a defense against the Tenryo Commission due to Kamiji's love. This will also strengthen Chisato's position as well, as the elites in the clan will see her as indispensable. So the group spreads the word, and each does their part in disseminating the information. Kamiji stations Tenryo Commission guards outside of the Hidagi estate, so as to make Matsuda and the officials believe that they're there to take the clan down the the second the wedding is completed. The Traveler and Paimon let Chisato in on the plan, and Matsuda shows up, and he seems to believe everything that they wanted him to. He owns up to everything, and heads to the Kamisato estate to mend relations with the Yashiro Commission. He grovels to Ayato to try and get him to convince Kamiji to end the marriage. Ayato agrees, and also manages to get Matsuda to own up to what he tried to do 
publicly. Afterward, Ayato tells Chisato and the pair about his childhood. After his father passed, his mother did as well. The Yashiro Commission quickly became destabilized, and him and Ayako were viewed as pawns for political ambition for those seeking power. Ayato had to learn at a young age how to play the political game so that he could protect the honor of his family, but also protect his sister. Chisato says that she wasn't prepared for marriage, but she wants to grow stronger. She says that now is the time to become her own person, to stand up for herself, like how Kamiji stood up to the almighty Shogun. Chisato leaves to go lead her clan, and Ayato stresses that all he wants, more than anything, isn't power, but stability. He never wants him or his sister or Inazuma to live through a time of instability like he did during his childhood. With Ayato's keen sense, regardless of the chaos in Inazuma, there will always be a bright light behind the scenes as its protector. The sacred Sakura tree is under attack by monsters known as Rift Hounds. They prove to be too numerous, but A appears and saves the pair. She's observed the Rift Hound attacks from the plain of Euthymia and found it too urgent to not deal with it herself. The Rift Hounds bring back memories of the terrible disaster of 500 years ago. During the Conrian crisis, all of Inazuma was engulfed in fog with monsters ravaging the nation. Inazuma nearly perished, and Rift Hounds were a prominent member of that monster group. They would use their claws to tear open space itself, which would allow more monsters to attack Inazuma. The group finds wounds in the sacred Sakura roots. These wounds release filth that projects memories of the past, much like the afterimages of Inkonomiya and Surumi, more indication that whenever the system of the world goes wonky, memories of its past are released. These afterimages are of soldiers as they're defending Inazuma 500 years ago. To them, they're currently still fighting the Horde. An afterimage soldier says that both the Shogun and Kitsune Saigu are gone, and that Inazuma has been left to fend for itself. But A assures them that she's there for them, and tells them the truth. The war is over, and Inazuma is at peace. But then, more filth appears. <laughs> So I told him, I said, dude, just put it in the oven. <laughs> <laughs> dude, I see right through you. No, really, that's what I said to him. No, like, I, I see through you. Like, I think we're dead. <gasps> Much like what they learned from Harachiru Sato, the sacred Sakura purifies the filth accumulated in the ley lines. Once purified though, they actually present in the form of an afterimage. They quickly dissipate and then after are absorbed back into the ley lines. At the time of the disaster, 500 years ago, Kitsune Saigu told A that she would protect Inazuma and that A could go to Kanria. Kitsune Saigu perished that day though, and A was never able to say goodbye to her. A says that she was powerless to keep the ones that she cherished alive. But since her battle against human ambition and her journey outside with the Traveler, she's realized that she can't fixate on the past forever. She decimates more Rift Hounds, but something is clearly wrong with her physical condition. Another afterimage appears, a blind tea master who worked for the Shogun. He speaks of his conversations with the Shogun, that she's a dreamer who realizes that everything must change. He has hope that Inazuma will change, that the catastrophe won't stay forever. To get him a tea set, they head to the Kamisato estate, and during their wait, A reveals that the tea master was talking about her sister, Makoto, not her. She rarely ever had time to sit around and drink tea, as she was always training. Again, the shogun at the time was Makoto, and A was simply a body double. The view that things must change and to pursue your dreams? Well, that was Makoto's view, not A's. Makoto saw eternity as a never-ending flow of changing states, rather than as a stasis like A had. Because of this, Makoto believed that dreams were the most precious things in the world. To her, dreams and ambitions weren't synonymous. Instead, a dream is more abstract. An ambition requires something material, but once that material thing is possessed, the ambition is just replaced with another. A dream, however, drives the creation of ambitions. It's the yearning for something greater. It, Tamakoto, is eternal. And 
A is starting to truly understand what she meant by that. They bring the tea set back to the tea master, but his after image has faded. <laughs> Instead, A makes everyone a pot, and over tea, she speaks of Makoto's passing. Kitsune Saigu wasn't the only person close to A that she lost 500 years ago. Makoto went to Konria alone without telling A, but by the time A arrived in Konria, Makoto was dying. A entered into her mind, a place like the plain of Euthymia, and she said her goodbyes. A saved this realm and actually brought it back to Inazuma. These losses are what caused A to pursue a new definition of eternity, one that was focused on the stasis of Inazuma. Her loss was too great and she never wanted to experience a day like that ever again. A describes one particularly really odd thing though when she returned to Inazuma from Konria. It was as if the sacred Sakura tree just appeared on Mount Yogo. Prior to her leaving, the tree simply didn't exist. But when she brought that up, people acted like she was crazy. They were adamant that it had always been there. But because of the sacred Sakura's power, A was able to quell the monster's wrath and put an end to the cataclysmic event on Inazuma. The traveler asks A if she saw their sibling on Conria, but she says that when she arrived, the fighting had mostly subsided and Conria was already in ruin. Plus, like, my sister was dying, so, like, read the room. A senses that there are only a few remaining rift hounds nearby, but during the battle with them, her physical condition worsens, putting her in serious danger. Just in time, though, after images of the past come to help her, and with them, the traveler takes out the rift hounds. A makes a promise to the soldiers of the past and to herself. She feels that she's dishonored the sacrifices of those who have fought for Inazuma's future. Her promise is to carry their dreams forward, to chart a new path towards a better Inazuma, one that can heal the scars of the past and bring forth new opportunities. With this promise though, A cries out in pain. She can't move her body. She tells the traveler that she knows what's happening and has them take her to a cave beneath the Grand Narukami Shrine. In the cave, a mysterious gate appears. It's the entrance to Makoto's consciousness that A had brought back to Inazuma. Through the gate, A faces a? The other A is actually just the puppet version, the Shogun. Since A's beliefs were starting to contradict the puppet's programming, the body was rejecting her. A had discussed previously that there was a way to change the system in the programming, and it appears this is the way. A warrior's showdown over the future of eternity. A battles the Shogun, but both share such strong ideals that the battle seems endless. Regardless of how long the battle will last, a wishes to chart a new path. Even if she will leave Inazuma without a shogun during the battle, she now trusts that humans can guide Inazuma while she's gone. With that, the pair get pushed out of the realm. They tell Yaimiko everything about what happened and she decides to help. Because she's Ace familiar, she can always pinpoint where she is, but if they don't focus exactly on their strong will to help A, they may just be sent to a random part of space time. With their strong will to help A solely on their minds, they enter the portal. Remember to focus constantly on your heartfelt wishes when you enter inside. Only if you are strong enough can I deliver you to the right destination. A is clearly shocked by seeing them there. To her, it's been 500 years since their last meeting, but they appeared at just the right time. A and the Shogun are now facing off for the final time. A's pursuit of a new future and the Shogun's commitment to A's past definition of eternity face off, but A's will doesn't falter and she claims victory. 
She says that she never would have won without the will of the people who have put their trust in her. So much so that, using these wishes, she even notices a difference in her blade, the Muso Ishin, the blade she inherited from Makoto. In the end, the puppet Shogun regrants A control of the body, and A makes a promise to never make any more unchanging rules. The Shogun promises to be A's shadow, just as A used to be Makoto's. The Muso Ishin begins to glow, and a fragment of Makoto's will springs forth. She says that she left this fragment in her blade only to ever be let free when the blade's full power was unleashed. Makoto knew that this day would eventually come, a day where A would change her views on eternity. She apologizes for failing Inazuma, but most importantly, for failing A. She says that she knew what was going to happen before she went to Conria, that she can't tell how long it's been since then because she can no longer perceive time, but she knows that, regardless, it had to have been an extremely difficult time for A. But because of this, she wanted to leave something with A that would soothe Inazuma's and A's pain. To a seed? The miracle tree that blesses the people, in this moment new to the world and yet to be known. When to plant it, where it shall bloom, she who brings it into being must let her heart and dreams decide. Grant it life, eh? Is this... is it really? Eternity extends time into infinity. Dreams illuminate each moment within. When both shine in unison, the sacred Sakura blooms from the darkness, finally free from the clutches of the heavenly principles. Now the nightmare has dissipated, and reality is made whole. The vision we both yearn for is still further ahead. My only regret is that I cannot witness Inazuma's future. Nor can I walk this journey with you. <sighs> Do you know, A? I am so happy right now, because my final wish has now come true. Your polearm once protected me from countless calamities. For this, I've always felt indebted to you. Though I could never repay you in full, this sacred Sakura will buy you some time until you are ready to awaken and embrace the new. What do you think? Did it do the trick? <laughs> this time, it really is goodbye, eh? <sighs> goodbye, Makoto. At the Grand Narukami Shrine, the trio and Yai Miko discuss the events. A says that eternity, as a concept, is so deeply connected with time that perhaps when you reach it, time starts to become murky. And Yai stresses that the realm they were even in to begin with was already separated from time. She's also not convinced that it was Makoto's power alone that granted A the ability to plant the sacred Sakura, and that perhaps a higher power was also involved. A was surprised to see the Traveler and Paimon when they appeared, and Yai retorts that if it hadn't been for the Traveler's will, they likely wouldn't have shown up. A says that she'll never forget how they've helped her. Because of Inazuma's past scars, the country is now able to move forward, move forward into a new era, one whose seed was granted by their forebearers, but planted by the dreams for a brighter future. On urgent notice from Kokomi, the duo returned to Watatsumi Island and learned that Kokomi had performed the Goryo Matsuri ritual with the branch. But instead of reversing the holy soil like the ritual was supposed to, it only paused the process, which has never happened before. 
Kokomi then sent soldiers into Inkonomiya to investigate, but apparently they found the area engulfed in darkness, with unknown humanoid monsters wearing armor roaming the land. The traveler agrees to help, since the future of Watatsumi Island is in danger. They meet with Tsuyuko to learn more about the situation, and she states that a shrine maiden named Tsumi is dealing with the wounded soldiers in Inkonomiya, and had performed a ceremony to keep the area in the center of Inkonomiya lit. Kokomi can't recall there actually being a shrine maiden named Tsumi on the island, and tasks the traveler with investigating it further, while also giving them a piece of a broken amulet. She says the other two pieces are in Inkonomiya, and to use that piece if they run into serious danger. At the makeshift camp, the duo meets Sumi, who wears a mysterious mask that covers her eyes. Let's see your true self! Sumi explains that the darkness encroaching Inkonomiya is a result of the Void Realm invading. It's like Injo said, those in Inkonomiya believe that there were three realms, Vishap, Human, and Void. Vishaps and humans hate the darkness. The Vishap realm itself is actually often referred to as the realm of light, since Vishaps are primordial elemental beings. In the light realm, there are seven sovereigns, which each symbolize the primitive elemental forces, Pyro, Cryo, Hydro, Dendro, Animo, Geo, and Electro. Sumi explains the Goryo Matsuri in greater detail. The Blood Branch Coral actually uses Orobashi's life force to awaken its familiars, known as the Sangha Coralia. They're creatures that break down primitive energy and then turn it into milder elemental energy that's fit for the human realm. Normally, this is what would rid Watatsumi Island of the encroaching holy soil, but the darkness from the Void Realm is currently halting this process. In Inkonomiya, the ley lines of the human realm, elemental currents of the light realm, and dark currents of the Void Void realm are all incredibly strong. So to halt the void, the traveler needs to go perform a ritual at the three towers at the corners of Inkonomiya. But when they return, darkness has invaded the Dainichi Mikoshi. Sumi is unsure as to why this is happening, as dealing with the three towers should have ended this crisis, but she says she noticed an abyss lector nearby, and it may be his fault. Turns out, it's Injo, and after the mandatory battle with the boy, he says that Sumi is a Bethysmal Vishap, not a human. That slowly, over time, Bethysmal Vishaps evolved to look more human, and that Sumi is one of those kind. He says in the past that these beings slowly infiltrated Inkonomian politics and high-ranking positions because of their ability to blend in. Exactly like the Clintons. Injo says that he actually formed an alliance with the Vishaps, and that that's why he plunged the nation into darkness. He did so because the Vishaps wanted to rescue their kin trapped underneath the Dainichi Mikoshi. Oh shit, uh, about that. <laughs> The Vishaps didn't realize, though, that the void darkness from the towers would actually be poisonous to them as well. Injo didn't care too much, though, as he was able to use the power of the void, which he simply refers to as the Abyss. He also says that Sumi is likely going to betray them and the humans, that she'll suppress the Songo Coralia, stop the ritual that would defend Watatsumi from the holy soil, all to keep Inkonomiya in darkness and protect the Vishaps. Before Injo leaves, he explains that he doesn't care all that much about serving the Abyss Order, actually. That he likes to focus on more inconsequential things. He gives them a piece of a medallion, similar to Kokomi's piece, which he says he found at the Dainichi Mikoshi, and then he leaves. Using the information given by Injo, they're actually able to restore light to the Dainichi Mikoshi and enter its depths. More Bethysmal Vishaps are hanging out down there, so they take them out too, but it seems baby Vishaps were actually rescued from beneath the Dainichi Mikoshi. Sumi promises to destroy the Dainichi Mikoshi and says that humans will always betray her kind. The Traveler shows Sumi the two pieces of the medallion that he has, and she appears to have the final piece. With all three combined, it reveals a secret. The first piece was from Kokomi, the second from the Dainichi Mikoshi, and Sumi claims she's had the third her whole life. It proves that she's connected to Watatsumi Island. 
She grew up with Vishaps and never knew another human until recently, but she's not a pure Vishap. Because she was raised by Vishaps, she goes back to them, clearly still confused about what all of this means for her future. All the soldiers have been evacuated, and the darkness has been extinguished from Inkonomiya. About the pendants, Kogami says that Odobashi gave one to the Dainichi Mikoshi, another to the Sanganomian line, and the final to the vassals of Watatsumi. This would mean that the common folk officials and vassals would each hold each other accountable. But in the modern era, only the common folk truly remain, with the other two bloodlines nearly non-existent. Sumi likely came from the vassal line, since vassals were half human and half snake. Legends say that the final born vassal was attacked by Vishaps when she was just an infant, and ever since then, her whereabouts have been unknown. Regardless, the current mission is over, and Watatsumi Island will finally be at peace. Perhaps Sumi, too, will someday find her peace. Granting ritual has appeared in Inazuma City. Read a first hand guide to summoning spirits to hear all about it. I repeat, you can wish for anything. I wish for a better wife, that cheating bitch, and get a dog instead. <laughs> Yikes, it bit me. Guess things didn't change that much. Am I right? Due to Yaimiko having her own light novel publishing house, the duo questions her about the wish-granting ritual in the book, but doing so causes her to rope them into helping a man whose brother used the ritual, and ever since, has been acting strange. His brother always wished to be a great swordsman, but he's kinda shit at it. Somehow though, he was able to recently defeat a strong swordsman after he did the ritual. Turns out, it's because he's being possessed by an ancient Oni's spirit. The ritual is actually causing people to be possessed when they use it. But Yai says that it isn't life-threatening, but it is hurting her own book sales, so she wants the book burned. To deal with the popularity of the book, to make sure people stop summoning spirits that could be harmful and to make Yai more money, the plan is to make their own hit novel. Yai Miko introduces the Traveler to a team of writers to help them workshop a new light novel. There's Junkichi, who's a popular author in Inazuma, his editor Shigeru, and there's Maverick. Day. All right, so I've got this idea, right? Where this fish will pop out of the water. And when it does, when it does, it'll go, these nuts. <laughs> Why did you invite me here? Why did you invite me here if you were just gonna talk shit? The novel gets workshopped and then published, and it's actually a roaring success. A first-hand guide to summoning spirits seems to be yesterday's news, as the new novel has replaced it in the social zeitgeist. Yaimiko slipped her own incantation into the new novel, though, that's supposed to be performed by all who read it on a moonless night. It supposedly grants the individual the protection of powerful yokai. While they were workshopping the book, Yai found the individual who wrote A First-Hand Guide to Summoning Spirits. Turns out, though, he too was possessed when he wrote it. To find the spirit author though, Yai suggests that they do their own incantation in a spooky summoning chamber. The traveler is used as a host, and Yai Miko summons a spirit into him. These nuts! <laughs> And then another one is summoned. The author's spirit, named Uraksai, takes control of the traveler's body and is able to speak through them. Yaimiko says that it's not really a spirit, but rather another after image from the ley line. That's what all spirits truly are. Udaksai, like the swordsman Oni, is another yokai, and was released from the ley lines when the sacred Sakura was attacked by the Rift Hounds. Him and the other yokai spirits haven't faded yet because it simply takes longer for a yokai afterimage to fade rather than a human one. Because Udaksai was a powerful kitsune, even in afterimage form, he can take control of a human's body at will. But other yokai simply aren't powerful enough to do that, so Uraksai included an incantation in his novel to allow other yokai afterimages to take human bodies and fulfill any last wishes that they had before they were to pass on. It doesn't hurt humans either, so it seems like an initial win-win. Uraksai appears to be an old friend of Yai's, and she wrote the new novel to finally best him in a duel of the authors. Yai Miko is hundreds of years old, judging from this conversation, and as a result, 
has clearly seen countless of her friends pass before her. Vidoxai leaves the Traveler's body, clearly now fulfilled and ready to move on. Yai promises Vidoxai one final thing, that she'll conduct a ritual named the Hyaki Yako, or the Moonless Night. It used to be a gathering of yokai, where after partying, they would soar into the sky together, and their numbers were so numerous that they would block out the moon. But because they're only after images now, they can no longer fly. Yai says that the incantation she put in the novel isn't actually one at all, but rather it will help calm the after images as they merge back into the ley lines. Yai wants to help her friends soar into the sky together for one final farewell. Wow! So many! They're everywhere! Huh? Yes, the memories of the yokai. They haven't been able to relax and soar through the air like this for a long time. Come with me. You all right, little one? You look a little nervous. It's just, Hyman's never seen anything like this before. Whoa, they've really blocked out the moon. It does look a little intimidating, doesn't it? But I know them. They may be loud and brash at times, but they are good and brave souls. Even after losing their lives in a brutal war, they have never given in to grief or despair. Alas, their time is short. Feasts come to an end. <laughs> Since you're sorry to see them leave, why don't you do the recital along with me? Oh Hakushin, cause of this enchantment, in reverence I perform this rite. In reverence I perform this rite. To be a guiding light. Recite the secret spells of Lady Kitsune tonight, and our wishes will come true. <gasps> oh, Hakushin, cause of this enchantment. I perform this rite to be a guiding light. Your unrivaled power will be honored eternally. Kusai, you asked if I was doing well. Really, every day is a happy day for me. But watching you all leave now, I can't help but feel a little lonely. Mm. Just a little, of course. The Vision Hut Decree and Sakoku Decree have been abolished. The Fatui's influence has been uprooted from Inazuma's political system. Civil war has ended. Watatsumi Island is at peace. And A has charted a new direction 
for the future of the country. So with a festival currently right around the corner, you know what the Traveler and Paimon decide to do. Say it with me, except a commission from Catherine. God damn it! The commission's actually from Yai, and she has specially requested their assistance on a matter pertaining to the festival. The festival is known as the Irodori Festival, and previously the festival was purely local. But now that the Sakoku decree has been lifted, it's been changed to an international cultural festival, where other cultural celebrities from other nations will be invited to participate. The festival is based on a legend, the legend of the five Kasen, five poets in ancient Inazuma. In the past, every year, one of them would present the group's poetry work to the shogun, and it would create a cultural fervor. As a result, the festival was made in appreciation for the five because of how much they shaped Inazuma's culture. Yai says that this time, the entertainment format for the festival will be light novels. The main venue will be on Rito, where five portraits of the poet will be painted. These paintings will be done by someone from Mondstadt, and Ayato and Yai want the traveler to help this person acclimate to Inazuma, since they know Mondstadt well. They also want the traveler to help every other prestigious foreign guest that's arriving for the festival, since the traveler and Paimon are now so worldly. They'll be able to bond with these people easily. For the first guest, the artist from Mondstadt is actually Albedo. No wait, that's a Whopper flower! <laughs> Albedo and Klee have come for the festival, with Albedo being the artist tasked with recreating the five Kasen portraits. They're both happy to see the pair, and Albedo says that he'll be using his pin name while in Inazuma, Calx. Using his artistic prowess internationally isn't something new for him. He's also completed the illustrations for a book that will be premiering at the festival, titled A Legend of Sword. Albedo goes to get materials that he requested for inspiration for his paintings, but when they request them, they learn that something has happened to the copies of A Legend of sword. Apparently, a mysterious outlander was seen near them before they went missing. Investigating this leads them to Sara squaring off with Venti, who's now a suspect. Venti had an invitation to the country from Ayato, but on the way, he got drunk on some wine and passed out in some cargo. <laughs> He's not the culprit of the missing books, but Venti did find a piece of paper that contains a story about one of the five Kasen, named Suiko, and this story gives Albedo inspiration for his first portrait. The next morning, the traveler meets with another international traveler, this time the author of A Legend of Swords, named Xin Yu. Xin Yu is actually the pin name for Xing Cho. Xing Cho greets the pair, but also notices that there's a mysterious scrap of paper under his bag, yet another story of the five Kasen. This time, it's over Aoi no Okina. The pair keep it a secret that his novels are missing because the person in charge didn't want to get in trouble. Xing Cho is excited about his novel's release, though, but also excited about getting to meet his illustrator in person, Calx. They do both finally meet, and since they both know the Traveler, they introduce each other with their real names. Xing Cho also gives Albedo the newly found chapter of the Five Kasen story, and goes to unpack. Both the Traveler and Albedo notice that Xing Cho was acting suspiciously, though. Based on his interactions, it seems he's been in Inazuma for a while, and actually didn't just arrive like he claims. They confront him about this, and he owns up to the inconsistencies. Him and his editor were actually the people who took the novels. He took the copies of his novel before they released because he still needed to sign all of them, but he's like really terrible at it and so needed more time to sign every copy. He gets emergency calligraphy lessons to help them finish them all, and all of this gives Albedo inspiration to finish the second portrait, and me inspiration to f kill myself. Another guest arrives, and it's Kazuha. He also has a chapter of the story, go figure, found after he had heard footsteps and he followed them. Kazuha learns that Ching Shou is terrible with signing and suggests that he can make a seal for him to speed the process up. After giving the new Kasen story to Albedo and helping Ching Shou with the stamp, the group happens upon Venti with Ayaka, who found the final chapter of the story, which gives Albedo, who cares, he completes the portrait, here's the story. Long ago, Inazuma had five legendary poets. People bestowed upon them the title of the Five Kasen. One year, the poet Suiko made his way to Tenchukaku and presented the Kasen's work for the Shogun's perusal. But a page from the works of Aoi no Okina had been torn out, and Suiko was questioned regarding the matter. Suiko pleaded guilty. He admitted to drinking at the tavern the night before, and vaguely recalled a mysterious figure approaching while he was intoxicated. That figure was none other than Aoi no Okina himself. This turn of events had begun with an unnamed individual 
under whose coercion Aoi no Okina was forced to take drastic measures to retrieve a page of poetry. He knew nothing of this individual's true intentions. All he knew was that the poem had to do with an old acquaintance, Akahito. Akahito had once belonged to the Five Kasen. Each poem he composed, he marked with a scarlet red seal, hence the Aka in his name. Such a distinguished writer was he, and yet one of the poems he had submitted the previous year was found to be plagiarized. Akahito was exiled for his crimes, and only four of the five Kasen remained. Sumizome went over Akihito's poems and noticed that the plagiarized poem lacked his seal. She immersed his poetry in a stream nearby, and only on the plagiarized poem did the ink run. Aoi no Okina passed by and witnessed Sumizome's doing, which he then recorded in a poem. Thus transpired the events of Suiko's poetry submission, and this is where the story comes to an end. After the completion of the story, they now know four of the five Kasen, and Paimon wonders why one of them was never mentioned. The Kasen by the name of Kudonushi. Turns out he is in the story, just not explicitly. In the story, the Shogun is given poetry, but learns that they're forged. Kudonushi is actually the one who framed Akahito for this plagiarism. All of this reminds Kazuha of his own family's history. Kazuha's lineage connects to a sword crafting art known as the Ishin art. The Ishin art is one of the five forging arts known as the Raiden Gokuden. Four of the five arts have been lost and demolished including the Ishin art, with only the Amenoma art still alive today. At the time, Kazuha's grandfather traveled all over Tavat, trying to revive the family's dying art, but he was unable to do so. The result was that the family business died. Ayaka says that the Raiden Gokuden was actually under the purview of the Yashiro Commission, and because of that, throughout the last few decades, rumors within the commission have stated that the decline of the four arts wasn't happenstance, but rather purposeful. Kazuha's great-grandfather, Kaedehara Yoshinori, was tasked with forging an important blade for the Shogun, but he and the other four bladesmith clans failed. The punishment for this failure led to the decline of the Kaedehara family business. All the craftsmen involved in this process either died or fled, but the head of the Kamisato clan attempted to stop them but was attacked by an assailant, and his injuries resulted in him passing away. Ultimately, the story of the Five Kasen has Kazuha believing that the blade didn't fail to be forged due to a lack of skill, but rather that maybe the blade's diagram was forged and had been tampered with, like how Kuronushi framed Akahito. They find the diagram preserved in the Kamisato estate, and it shows it was indeed tampered with. Kazuha's grandfather tried to do what his great-grandfather couldn't, and he tried to forge the sword himself, but he failed as well, again due to the diagram being faulty. Kazuha's grandfather obviously wanted to revive the family business, but his great-grandfather told him that if he couldn't see the secret within the forging diagram, the Ishin art deserved to die. They ended up having an argument about this, which resulted in Kazuha's grandfather leaving Inazuma, and he never spoke with his father again. Albedo says that maybe Kazuha's great-grandfather knew the diagram was tampered with. Since all of Kazuha's belongings were seized when he was a criminal, the group goes to the Tenryo Commission warehouse to investigate and prove if this is the case. But to get access to the warehouse, they get permission from Kujo Sara, who is remorseful for all Kazuha has gone through because of the Vision Hunt decree. Kazuha thanks her for this and tells her that He's going to leave Inazuma once again soon, and to just sell off all of his belongings and give the money to those most in need. In the warehouse, they find one of his great-grandfather's prized possessions, a flower pot with a bonsai inside. In a special compartment, they find a letter. His great-grandfather did know about the tampered diagram. He left a letter stating that he actually tried to confront the culprit, who he learned also sabotaged the other of the Raiden Gokuden in the same way. It was night, and after the clues led us down to shore, I waited for the culprits to show themselves. However, there were no swordsmiths in sight, only a single eccentric stranger. This stranger claimed to be the one behind the failed forgings and said that he had been patiently waiting for us. He then threatened to destroy the Raiden Gokuden. 
That person was of able body, and in a blink of an eye, myself and the accompanying samurai had been defeated. Commissioner Kamisato was severely wounded, and I barely escaped death myself. My hat had fortunately blunted a blow to my head. The unusual stranger could have easily claimed my life at that moment, but after noticing my appearance, he stopped his attacks and sternly asked if I had any connection with the name Niwa. I answered that it was my father's surname, and after my father disappeared, I was adopted by the Kayadahara family. Upon hearing my answer, the stranger paused. After a long silence, he suddenly said, Tell her this. My name is Kuni Kuzushi. He then turned and left. Afraid of being framed and for their family's safety, the late Kamisato clan leader and Kazuha's great-grandfather never spoke of the event with Kunikazushi. He ultimately closed the family business because he was afraid Kunikazushi would retaliate. He chose his family over their lineage's art. Ayaka says that she'll work with Ayato to try and discover the true identity of Kunikazushi and what happened during that time. Kazuha is clearly distraught, but says that he would rather focus on the present. While the burdens of the past must be carried, there are still things to strive for in the present. He wants to live on like his great-grandfather wanted. His great-grandfather cared more for his family than he did for his reputation, and Kazuha will always remember that. But if Kunikazushi is still out there doing harm, Kazuha will stand in his path. Back on Rito, Kazuha expresses his happiness with the current state of Inazuma. The dire nature of the country has ended, and a more optimistic future for it has taken its place. Kazuha will continue to follow the wind, though, happy to know that his home is safe and free. Chincho's signing event goes off without a hitch, but he tells the pair to keep this all a secret. Those in the Feiyun Commerce Guild and his father don't know about him moonlighting as an author. Also, Ito's out of jail! Woo! Everyone enjoys the final day of the festival, and the final portrait, Kuronushi's, is unveiled. It's empty, and Albedo says that's because Kuronushi is a background character, that people should use their own imaginations to decide what he looks like. Okay, I'll give it a try. Oh. Ayato reveals that he's been behind the scenes the whole time, leaving the breadcrumbs about the stories to everyone that they met. After the Shogun abolished the Vision Hunt Decree, Ayato heard that a mysterious figure had entered into the Tinryo Commission warehouse, but when the guards investigated, they reported that nothing had been stolen. Ayato checked it out himself and happened upon the hidden note in the bonsai pot. Because the Kaedehara clan used to be subordinates to the Kamisato clan, he felt it was his responsibility to help Kazuha learn the truth. He roped the Traveler and the others into the situation too for protection, in case learning the secret put them in harm's way. Ayato believes the Traveler will encounter Kunikazushi in the future. Ayato tells the Traveler that they already know who Kunikazushi is, and he says that the truth is hidden inside Albedo's portrait. Kunikazushi is Scaramouche. He destroyed almost the entirety of the riding Gokuden due to a grudge lost to time, but the Traveler and Paimon also have a grudge against the Fatui, what they've done to innocent people, but also to Scaramouche and how he's affected the lives of so many. Sooner or later, the pair know that deep down, Ayato is right, that eventually both of their grudges will come to a head. Before departing Inazuma, the Traveler and Paimon happen upon a samurai wielding a sword with a red glow who attacks them. He mistakes them for Kazuha and asks about him before departing. <laughs> Come on, they look nothing. Okay, yeah. The Traveler notes how similar the samurai's fighting style is to that of Kazuha. The Crux fleet is nearby stocking up, and Kazuha is likely leaving Inazuma with them soon, so the pair go to warn him of this dangerous samurai. A Crux fleet member notes how actually a bunch of people have been asking about Kazuha, and rumors have been stirring ever since he parried the Muso no Hitotachi. Even the Tenryo Commission came to meet with him, but they were weirdly friendly with him, wishing for a meeting. Kazuha is at this meeting, at the Tenryo 
Commission headquarters as a gesture of goodwill. A has issued numerous directives now to right the wrongs of the political turmoil that was caused by the Vision Hunt decree, but also that were caused by the Fatui in the past. Kamiji has been tasked with dealing with these, as it's a chance to correct the clan's past mistakes. He wants to do this, to show himself as a true leader and flag bearer for the clan's future. Ayato and Ayako looked into the Kunikazushi incident more, and learned that the Fatui were involved. That not only did Kunikazushi kill a lot of the swordsmiths, that when the swordsmiths who weren't murdered fled Inazuma, they did so with the Fatui and left to Shneznaya, where they would work for the government there. The truth of this has reached A herself, and she's tasked Kamiji with making amends with Kazuha because of what happened to his family. So Kamiji makes an offer to Kazuha, come work for the shogun as a bladesmith and restore your family's honor. The Kaidehara name will be restored, and Kazuha can finally return home and become a swordsmith and return to tradition. But Kazuha is unsure. He's stuck between familial obligation and what his heart desires. People in Inazuma currently believe that, because he was using Electro at the moment, Kazuha was wielding a delusion to parry the Muso no Hitotachi. Agreeing to come back and work for the Shogun would mean that those rumors would cease, because the Shogun would have to come forward to dispel them. The Traveler tells Kazuha about the mysterious samurai, and Kazuha says that only his family knows his sword style. It's a style used for blade testing, so it's really distinct from practical forms. Kazuha puts off giving response to Kamiji about the deal as he wants to investigate this matter first. So the gang heads to the Songo Detective Agency for help. There's no info on the man in particular, but strangely, two men have recently gone missing who fit the description. One man is actually affiliated with the Raiden Gokuden, specifically the one art that survived out of the five, the Ame Noma art. Specifically, the man's name is Amenoma Yuya, while the other man is named Nagato, who's in rampant debt. Yuya's uncle, Aminoma Togo, says that the Aminoma art is based on the erosion of water, while the Kaidehara clan's technique, the Ishin art, is based on the blade and the wielder becoming one, so that the blade becomes the extension of the wielder's will. An Ishin blade, then, chooses the owner, instead of the owner choosing it. He says that his nephew has been intent on getting him a gift lately, and he went missing after promising to give him a blade. Nagato, on the other hand, began going into an intense debt after he began collecting blades. His wife says that he would stare at them like he was in a trance. Before he went missing, his wife told him that if he didn't sell the blades and settle the debts, she would leave him and take their children. So he offered to sell a rare blade he had collected to Yuya at a warehouse of his, but that warehouse caught fire and the two went missing. They go to check the warehouse for evidence, but on the way, Kazuha picks up a mysterious, strong scent. Paimon, how many how many people have to tell you that you shit your pants before you do something about this? He says that the scent smells like the remnants of Tatarigami. The source is the burned down warehouse. Exposure to Tatarigami can turn people violent, but it can also make them have fanatical obsessions with what they yearn for. Which explains why Nagato collected so much, even going into immense debt. He was affected by Tatarigami. Following the scent further leads them to a letter surrounded by hilly churls. The letter is by Nagato. It speaks of his attempted sell of a blade to Yuya, but Yuya attacked him during the sell, stole the blade, and set fire to his warehouse. They find Yuya, but he's possessed by his own blade. The blade's Tatarigami is what's occupying Yuya's body, and it speaks through him. The blade was forged by the Ishin art, by the ancestors of Kazuha. The forger fled to Shneznaya, and his most prized blade was this one that he took with him. He gave it consciousness, and the blade made its way back to Inazuma, and used a long line of people to do so. Its goal is to face the Shogun, which was supposedly its maker's ambition. The blade wants to control Kazuha and fight the Shogun, since he parried the Muso no Hitotachi. They battle the blade and best it. Kazuha is able to discern from the battle that the blade has weakened over time. Time, that it started as an ambition to face the Shogun, but became a twisted desire, so much so that the sword began killing its hosts to get to Inazuma. Kazuha notes that even though the blade was made by, and knows all that the Ishin art embodies, it didn't adhere to the most fundamental principle, harmony between a blade and its master. He wants the blade to face the reality now that it's weak 
The blade threatens Yuya's life unless Kazuha lets it possess him, but Kazuha makes it a deal. To see whether or not the blade has the power to face the Shogun, he must first battle in other fights. If he can best those, then he can have Kazuha's body. But if he can't, then he must relinquish possession of Yuya. Kazuha believes that if he becomes possessed, the Traveler will save him. But he believes he can hold off possession just long enough for the battles, since he has no obsessions that make him susceptible to the Tatarigami. Except to toes. He <laughs> thought Albedo was the other one? Show me those toes. He takes the blade and is still conscious. To show the blade the reality of its weakness, Kazuha and it face off against Ronin. Throughout the battles, the blade begins to dim and grow weaker, but it's not giving up, and it tries to reach harmony with Kazuha while matching his moves, but it doesn't work. The weapon's cruelty means harmony can never truly happen with Kazuha, and the weapon's true state shows battered and nearly broken. The blade learns the truth of itself and admits that it's weak. It says that it may never be as powerful as Kazuha's blade, the one that countered the Muso no Hitotachi, but Kazuha says that this is just a blade that he picked up in Liyue. See, like I've got a bunch of stuff like this or this or this. Oh shit, you got one too? But because Kazuha and his blade have traveled together for years, they've grown a close bond. Plus, during the counter of the Muso no Hitotachi, another gave him strength as well. Kazuha says that the sword's consciousness was derived from the power of the Tatarigami. Tatarigami is malevolence, and because of that, it will always be a part of the blade. The blade just wanted to continue the wishes of his master, but sadly, that wish could never be accomplished. When Kazuha first touched the blade, he saw the blade's memory of his creator's passing. The swordsmith had learned the truth of the Raiden Gokuden incident, that he had been tricked by the Fatui. In Shneznaya, he worked tirelessly to make a blade that was worthy of being a prized weapon in Inazuma, and through the use of Tatarigami, he was able to accomplish that, though he clearly didn't know the malevolence that using Tatarigami would add to the weapon. While laying on his deathbed next to his newly formed blade, all he wanted was for his prized creation to return to his homeland. He didn't want it to battle the Shogun, but the Tatarigami in the blade warped that desire. The blade has had nobody there to correct its path. The blade says that it's never had a noble battle, one which its master would be proud of. He requests a true duel between him and Kazuha. Regardless, win or lose, he will awaken Yuya and stop possessing innocent people altogether. He awakens Yuya now, who agrees to be the opponent that Kazuha and the Blade will face. And so, an honorable duel between two successors of the Raiden Gokuden takes place, and the Blade, with the newly found will granted by Kazuha, bests his opponent. Afterward, he speaks through Kazuha. He wants to visit the Aminoma smithy, so they do. The Blade says he's found another way to fulfill his maker's wish, and asks Kazuha if he can possess him to fulfill it. So, Kazuha takes the blade into the smithy to take up the mantle of the Ishin art once again. Hmm. My power is almost spent. Without him, my eventual demise is inevitable. But if I abandon the future to give everything I have in this moment, my physical form can be forged anew. Everything? You mean... Yes. The cost is my entire consciousness. <laughs> you were right. There's nothing that I can accomplish now. But there's still a chance for Ishii art. Once remade, I will be a valuable resource for your studies. <laughs> Ishii lives on, and its finest power is yet to come. Even if I am not the one to prove its might to the Shogun, as long as it is an Ishin blade, crafted by Kaedehara hands, it will still fulfill his final wish. Thank you, son of the Kaedehara clan. Over the years, my real name has been forgotten by all. I'm ashamed to utter it, yet it remains strong in my mind. Kagotsurube Ishii. This name 
is now yours to keep. Hmm. Rest in peace. Just like those who face the Vision Hunt Decree and the Traveler's brave exploits in Inazuma, Kago Tsurube's wish to face the light of a god was inspirational to Kazuha. Kazuha gives Kamaji his answer, finally, about returning home and working for the Shogun. He declines. Through the possession of the past, Kazuha forged a new blade. He wants to continue his family art, but he also wants to follow his own heart. Kazuha is ultimately one with the wind, but that doesn't mean the past will get lost in the gale. The wind leads Kazuha forward, but so too can Kazuha take the past with him. The trip to Inazuma has ended, but the scars from those events are still healing. After their arrival to Liyue, Kazuha reveals how he's feeling. Hither and thither a breeze blusters, an ancient zither of luster, entrusted, whispers in the wind, eternity anew. We will meet again. Beidou holds a homecoming celebration on the Alcor and invites the Traveler. After the events of Inazuma, the crew and Beidou respect the Traveler greatly. She tells them that when they dropped them off in Inazuma, she came across a treasure map in wreckage that points to somewhere in Liwe, and so the group investigates and finds the treasure together. The next destination is Sumeru, but the path to Sumeru is through that of the Chasm, a local mine that was closed off due to a mysterious incident that resulted in mining accidents. The Chasm surface has reopened for select mining and investigations recently though, but it still hasn't been without its issues. New miners have noticed hilly churls wandering into the depths of the Chasm without ever returning to the surface. On a commission, the Traveler and Paimon choose to investigate. The Chasm is dangerous, so a team is constructed to solve its mysteries and act as the initial exploration team since its closure. The team's name? The Chasm Exploration Team. Inside, the depths can be lit up by an ore known as Lumenstone, which is ore from the area that's been infused with some unknown outside force. Ominous dark mud litters the underground, attracting monsters, and only the Lumenstone's power, when made into an adjuvant, can cleanse it. An orb of light appeared in the mine right before it shut down, and with it, Lumenstone began to appear. Shortly after, the mud came. When inside, Jinwoo says that when the mines were sealed, some miners were stuck inside, and that she's looking for a man named Uncle Hua. The depths unravel more mysteries, as anomalies only seen on Dragonspine appear here in the chasm as well. Shichong theorizes that Dragonspine and the chasm may be linked by some ancient civilization, as the catacombs on Dragonspine share similar iconography to that found here in the chasm. In legends, the depths of the chasm house a giant serpent. They descend further, but Shi Chong begins to fall ill. She returns to camp, but the pair push on, only to find an upside down city similar to that of the defiled statue. The past continues to be relived as Dainsliff himself pops out of the shadowed gate. He was pursuing another abyss herald, but the herald's portal brought him here when he pursued. When he chased the sibling through the portal last time, he ended up back in Storm Terror's lair alone. He's still set on figuring out the Loom of Fate operation and has managed to keep the eye of the first field tiller safe. They inquire about the title used to refer to him before, the Twilight Sword. He says it was his title as the captain of the royal guard in Conria. As it pertains to the traveler's sibling, Dane and them traveled together in the past on a journey searching for their fate. They didn't end the journey together though. 
They fill Dane in on why they're here, and he already knows the answers to the actions of the Hilly Churls. The upside down city seems to weaken the curse of immortality placed on all Conrians. The Hilly Churls that have come here are from Conria as well. They wear masks to hide their faces from themselves, as it reminds them of what they've become. The immortality isn't really that in a traditional sense, but rather a slow erosion of the body and soul over countless years. When their soul is almost completely gone, the Hillichurls seek a final day of solace, so they come to the depths of the chasm where the curse is weakened. This upside down city is older than that of Conria though, even if the architecture resembles it. It's of a civilization that even Dane doesn't know of. Inside the buildings they find cursed royal guards protecting Hillichurls. One of them is named Halfdan, who was an elite in the royal guard. The final order that Dane gave to the knights and Halfdan on the day of the fall of Conria was inform all black serpent knights to protect the people of Conria at all costs. The knights have been continuing to do their duty of protecting Conrian citizens even as their own souls and identities fade to the curse. Dane stresses that everyone from Conria was cursed by the gods, regardless of their social status. In the center of the city lies a spring on the ceiling, which seems to be the center of the curse negating power. While the power is strong, it can't negate the curse altogether. Dane explains that when a god curses someone, that curse exists at a higher level of reality. As such, the curse can't just be removed without removing the life of the cursed person as well. A device seems to be connected to the spring though, a device that is clearly newly made. Following Halfdan's lead, they happen upon a hilly churl camp, and next to dying hilly churls lies a flower. The flower is named Intivat, native to Conria. It signifies a wanderer who's far from home. Your Highness, so the proposal finally has your blessing. In focusing single-mindedly on confronting the Heavenly Principles, we neglected our original mission, the revival of the homeland. I should not have been so indecisive. The device is almost ready. We await your command. What are the chances of succeeding? Theoretically speaking, uh, approximately... Forget it. Even a 1% chance is enough. For too long have we dwelt in the Abyss. Surely they would rather return to the natural cycle of life and death as soon as possible than continue to exist as they are, without a shred of dignity. They cannot be made to continue paying the price for those so-called sins. The Order is most fortunate to be graced with your decision. You mean? After explaining the vision to Dane, he puts the pieces together and deduces that the Abyss is attempting to use the machine from earlier to end the curse and revive the homeland. But as Dane said previously, the device won't work. There's no chance of removing the curse, and all trying it will do is bring suffering to those in their final moments. The Traveler is unsure of who to believe. Do they believe in what Dane is saying, or what their sibling is doing. The Traveler is clearly conflicted, but in the end, they choose to side with Dane. They don't want to see pointless suffering. And while they're not sure how to feel about their sibling, they know they can't trust the Abyss. <sighs> huh? Look, the amplification device.
To honor the memory of those lost and stop the abyss, the group faces off against an abyss lector and destroys the machinations keeping the device active. Huh? Huh? Light? Apologies, Captain Dainsliff, Twilight Sword. Back then, I failed you, and failed to protect our people. <laughs> no. For 500 years, you have faithfully done your duty. To this day, I am proud of you all. <sighs> Conria didn't fall, did it? Since you're still here. Correct. <laughs> so, no need to revive the homeland. Dane needs time to recover, so he leaves, surely to meet the pair again. The issue with the Hilly Turtles is solved, but the mysteries of the true aims of the Abyss Order continue to be an enigma. The Chasm's mysteries begin to dissipate, albeit slowly. The Fatui are also in the chasm, investigating the Calamity, as well as the War Against the Dark, they call it. But because of the events in Liwe recently, the Fatui have been uprooted from the chasm, and the few that remain are in dire conditions because they're no longer receiving supplies from above. The Fatui say that they actually came to the chasm to protect the people of Liwe from the Calamity of the Darkness, and that their mission had nothing to do with schemes or conspiracies. Shortly after the chasm was shut down, the Fatui struck a deal with Liwe officials. They would attempt to investigate and eradicate the source of the anomalies there, and they would get trade deals in return. The Fatui who came here fully knew that they might die down here. They came to the chasm for the greater good. Anton, the current leader of the Fatui in the chasm, says that he can understand why the Fatui attacked Liwe above ground. That, to assist in endeavors of greater meaning, Lord Pusinella won't hesitate to dispense with less valuable assets. He states that the Calamity is still lurking in the dark, and that it's the eternal enemy of Shneznaya. The Traveler helps the Fatui crew with getting essential supplies, and the crew decides to leave the mine. The pair find Uncle Hua, who's still alive and has been surviving off of eating mushrooms and mushroom creatures. Khadiv says that the mushroom creatures are actually native to Sumeru, and that he's unsure why they're here. After more research, he learns that the main difference between them and their Sumerian counterparts is a glow that they have, which he says must be a result of when the fragment fell from the sky. But when the Traveler inquires further about what he means by that, Khadiv quickly changes the subject. They help Khadiv investigate fossils that are in the cave walls. They're all of ancient sea creatures, meaning the chasm used to be underwater, but because of the altitude, Khadiv says that all of the fossils formed at the same time, meaning something radically formed the ecosystem here in a split second. Khadiv thanks the Traveler for their research and grants them a recommendation letter to the house of Pudi Buruni in Sumeru. He says to use it if they ever get in trouble or need help while they're in Sumeru. Continued exploration leads to thick fog, which when dispersed reveals two abyss lectors, whose defeat reveals a cube-like key. Back at camp, Shi Chong's condition hasn't bettered. She has found a gate that the key fits into though, and Khadiv confirms it. He states that the key and the other items like it contain energy that neither alchemy nor mechanics can truly understand. He makes it clear that Shi Chong's condition is due to her coming into contact with the Dark Mud. The Traveler was actually chosen for this mission because of their unusual, otherworldly abilities. Ordinary people can easily lose their lives in this place due to the Dark Mud. At the entrance to the door that the key operates, Shi Chong awaits. 
She tells the pair that in the past, a Yaksha apparently underwent a trial in the depths of the cavern and was never seen again. She believes that trial may be past this door. Due to their concerns though, they try and convince Chi Chong to leave the chasm, but she would rather live an adventurer's life and perish than live a boring, cushy life. She finds it unfair that people wielding the elements and carrying visions are the only ones allowed to make new discoveries. She wants to be remembered, and these maps can do that for her. But the Traveler makes it clear that, in order to leave a legacy, she has to live to complete it. She reluctantly returns to the camp to rest. The special key leads to a winding tunnel that looks like it was dug out by a machine of some kind. Oh wait, it wasn't a machine, it was an Alaskan bullworm! The tunnel opens to a giant cavern with a large floating crystal in the center, which has a striking resemblance to the crystal atop Dragon's Bind. A monument nearby is difficult to read, but it mentions a giant serpent in a connection to the crystal. Ridding the crystal of dark mud leads to a final ritual, which is to strike the crystal. But the Traveler's attack isn't enough, and the serpent spoken of in the legends appears and attacks the duo. With the creature defeated, the group has gotten almost no answers. Although restoring the crystal has resulted in the dark mud retreating into the ground, the secrets to the dark mud, Lumen Stone, the Yaksha's trial, and the strange crystal and devices still remains unanswered. The pair notice light emanating from where the crystal smashed the ground, but with the investigation progress nearing its end, they decide to just inform everyone of what happened. Back at the team camp, Shi Chuang says the team is going to stay in the chasm to continue watching out for anomalies. However, her condition hasn't seemed to have bettered even with rest. On the outside, a Ministry of Civil Affairs rep lets them know that the anomalies in the area have stopped and that after further Millilith investigations, the chasm will finally be fully reopened. The affairs rep is told about the crystal, and he says that it actually may have been why the chasm closed initially. The miners were saying that that crystal could actually grant wishes, thus they began calling it the Wish Granter. But when miners would go near it because of the rumor, it would drive them mad instead, and as a result, the Chi Sing closed the mine down for safety concerns. A crystal that's rumored to make your dreams come true. Something like that may be worth looking into down the line. It's that time of the year again! No, 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 it's it's not the Wind Bloom Festival. We literally just had the festival you're thinking. It's not that, it, is that Mardi Gras? It's the Lantern Rite. With not much to do while waiting for the Chasm route to open, the pair meet with Ningwang to see if they can help with the preparations for this year's festivities. This year, the city is having a fireworks display and Kaching is in charge. Ningwang informs them that Kaching is doing a great job, but she's overworking herself and she wants the pair to help her relax. To figure out how to deal with women, I mean Kaching, they speak with Zhang Li. He's chilling with his boss, Hu Tao, and Zhang Ling. To convince Kaching to chill out, they learn that they should make up a story that resonates with her, since stories have the power to change people's hearts. And so they get to storyboarding. Kaching needs the pair's help in giving gifts to the Adepti from the Qixing, so the gift giving begins. And the first stop is Madame Ping, and Yanfei is there as well. They learn from Madame Ping that not only has Kaching done the soul planning for the fireworks, display, but also the street decorations as well. Jean really is overworked. I'm sorry, sorry, I meant Ganyu. <laughs> Kokomi. Next stop, Cloud Retainer, Ganyu, and Shinha. She brings Cloud Retainer a firework device, since she loves devices, as well as a CD. 
Kaching meets Zhao, who comments on how she fought during the battle with Osile. He's still reluctant to see the fireworks like last year, and they leave his food for him. <laughs> fireworks have been stolen in Qingxia village, and instead of getting the help of an adepti, Kaching again takes it upon herself to find them. Chang Yun and Xing Chou are already on the case though. Xing Chou is there because the fireworks involve the Fei Yun Commerce Guild, and Chang Yun because he thinks spirits are involved. In Li Wei's past, fireworks were known as firecrackers. They were used to rid evil spirits which plagued the land at the time. This led to the origins of the Lantern Rite Festival of today. But it turns out it was treasure hoarders again, and they get the fireworks back from them. Afterwards, they find Zhang Li eating with Yunjin this time. From their experiences, they end up creating a story to get Kuching to chill out a bit. At the Jade Chamber, they tell her the story. It's about an overworked professional. The story goes that the leader of the Knights of Favonius in a nearby city, no wait, <laughs> never mind. It was about a secretary who did everybody else's job, but began questioning whether humans wanted her around. <sighs> no, um. Don't come in. The story is about an overworked chef who can't try his own food because he's so busy, and so his business fails. She gets that, well, the story is obviously about her. She knows that she needs to take time to relax, and that she'll keep that in mind for the future. For now though, she wants to enjoy the fruits of her labor with those closest to her. For a moment. Don't go anywhere. Huh? Must be something important. had her personal tailor make it for me. Said it's an imported style. Well, do you like it? Wow, it's beautiful! <laughs> it's time. Traveler, please enjoy the grand finale of this year's Lantern Rite. The fireworks show. Check you out. Looking pretty fancy. Only a true treasure catches the eye of Captain Beto. Seems I've struck gold with this one.
Dr. Baiju, sorry to trouble you again this year. <laughs> no trouble at all. Oh, lantern right. <laughs> Happy lantern right. Huh? Huh? <laughs> Happy lantern right! <laughs> Festivities are over, and it's back to business. And while the full chasm isn't open to everyone yet, the Traveler and Paimon can't get that crystal crashing into the ground out of their heads. So they head off to see if anything has changed, but instead they find Yanfei down there. She's here on a case and is also clearly trying to dodge someone. She says if anyone asks, don't tell them where she is. Oh, Ito, hey, what are you doing here? Ito is with a member of his gang named Kuki Shinobu. She's a lawyer who recently just graduated from law school in Liwe. That's why her and Ito are in the country, as she wanted to finally accept her diploma, but couldn't previously due to the whole travel restrictions thing. When they arrived in Liwe, Ito got them both in trouble, but Yanfei helped them out, and now Ito followed her here to repay the favor. They trick Ito though, and he fucks off. The duo find Yanfei near the light emanating from the ground. She's here to execute a will that she found in an old book. It deals with the loss of a magical device named the Fantastic Compass. The document states that the will bearer granted the device to an individual in need and that the compass is here in the chasm. The will will be complete upon its retrieval. A special operative of the Ministry of Civil Affairs makes a flashy entrance. Woo! Her name is Yelon, and she's here on her own super secret mission, but she knows Yanfei well. Ito realized that he was fooled and shows up, but he starts to butt heads with Yelon. She tries to get him to leave because, you know, he's not supposed to be here, and their personalities clearly don't mesh very well, and the tensions rise as a result. Stop trying to change the subject! I'm gonna, uh, uh, uh huh? Huh? <laughs> Now in an unknown cave system, the group attempts to find an exit, but instead finds a domain entrance and Zhao. He says he's here looking for someone, and he leaves. The domain actually wraps in on itself and appears inescapable. This labyrinth starts to freak the group out, so Ito summons his exorcist friend. It's a bull named Ushi, but Ushi also can't find an exit. It appears that they're trapped. The Traveler attempts to call out Zhao's name, since he said he'd always be there when they do. Zhao! Oh wait, I still have that one number, let's try that. Hello? Who is this? Oh, hey! Sorry I missed your call last time. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, this is a voicemail. Wait, let us return to the beep! Beep! <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, this is actually a voicemail. No, I'm just kidding. This isn't a voicemail. This is actually a demon. Did you think you got cell service down here? After more time passes, Paimon expresses how, well, time seems to work differently here. She's perceiving that they've been down here for a month, while others seem to think it's been much, much shorter. Speaking of, hunger, thirst, and fatigue also haven't kicked in for anyone here. The place appears to act as a sort of stasis. Yelon discovers a new path in the stone, a hidden passage, and inside, the space's gravity is unlike anything outside of the labyrinth, and they begin to hear Zhao's voice. A fissure in space unfolds, and with it, Zhao's voice, which sounds like he's fighting. They follow it until the group encounters a mysterious door that, when opened, reveals their greatest fears. Ito encounters bigots and beans. Shinobu sees her mother, telling her to become a shrine maiden. Shinobu came to study law in Liwe because she wanted to avoid that fate. She wanted to be free to choose what she wants, and because of that, she chose the law and Ito's gang. She chose freedom over a restricted life. Yanfei encounters a civil dispute over trivial matters. She's afraid of those because simple disputes often get overblown and become more complicated. To her, she feels that when this happens, Happens, people become too complicated. Yelon is asked to open the door next, but she refuses, stating that it could unearth some of Li Wei's top secrets as she actually works directly for Ningguang. Paimon then opens the door and finds, Mother, may I have some more food? Why I told you I ain't got no more. 
we need emergency food. You know, ever since your daddy adopted you from that there Fontaine market, you've been eating all our food. Oh my, oh my God, Paimon, that's the fish. The one that says these nuts. He's so different here though. Mother, may I have these nuts then? Oh my God, he said it. He said these nuts. These Mother, nuts. Th these nuts. These nuts. These nuts. These, these nuts. 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 The Traveler is up next, and the door opens to reveal endless space, the abyss. The group agrees that the labyrinth appears to be targeting those within it, a purgatory for those trapped. Paimon gets tired, and the group suggests that it might be mental fatigue, so they return to the camp so she can rest. Yanfei pulls the Traveler aside. Putting all the information together clearly confirms that this space defies all normal logic, that the space used the voice of Zhao earlier to lure them into the room with the fears. But the image of Zhao was actually real earlier. She posits that they can summon Zhao themselves. By using their thoughts, they may link themselves to Zhao, like they did with the spatial rift before. This theory proves to hold true, and Yan Fei and the Traveler find Zhao through another rift, pulling him through. He's badly wounded though, so he rests. Yelan speaks with the Traveler and Yan Fei. Yelan went off on her own and found a device. It disappeared when she got near it though. It was a catalyst that was connected to her clan, something only they would have. Further proof that this domain might be using the group's minds against them to wear them down and likely keep them there until their deaths. Yelan finally reveals her true reasons for being in the chasm. It was to uncover the truth behind the monster invasion of 500 years ago. As the Traveler has heard on countless other instances, every nation was attacked by beasts who they learn originated from Conria. The apex of that battle in Liwei was here at the chasm. The tides shifted when someone led powerful monsters deeper into the chasm. Yelan is personally connected to this incident as two of her ancestors were involved. One went missing in the chasm, and the other returned home insane. Yelan requested to look into this herself when the chasm was reopened because she wants to solve this mystery for her family. Paimon and Zhao awaken. He says that he fought the person he was looking for a Yaksha named Bosatius, one of the five most well-known Yakshas. Bosatius went missing 500 years ago, and all the other Yaksha besides Zhao have passed. Because of their accumulated karma from God's remains, all Yaksha eventually lose their minds. The last day Zhao saw Bosatius, that had happened to him. Supposedly a nameless Yaksha into the chasm 500 years ago in the battle with the monsters, the same Yaksha that Chichong mentioned. Zhao suggests that in order to save everyone, he'll use all of the power that he has, sacrificing himself and forcing open a path back to the surface. Yelan pushes back on that though, calling it self-righteous, and that it's too extreme of a measure when they don't even know if it will work. They fight back and forth about what to do until Ito breaks the tension with action. No one stand behind to let anyone else out, all right? Enough talk, it's time for action. Come on, whatever you are! Let's see how long you manage to keep us trapped in here after I'm finished with you! Uh, easy now. Have a taste of this! Okay, so I didn't tear the whole place down. <coughs> but check it out, new path! <laughs> If you need a hero, I'm the man for the job. Miko! Should have seen this coming. Shinobu stays behind with Ito, and Yanfei explains why Yelan was so worked up. In the line of duty, Yelan had lost friends and was a survivor after being rescued. Being a survivor of such an incident caused her to realize how precious life is and how sacrificing it isn't a virtue. On the other side of the new path is the fantastic compass. Chunky version. 
Yenfei encounters treasure hoarders from a previous case, but they're just that. Memories. Yelan also encounters memories. Memories of Fatui agents. Yelan appears to have a deeper connection to the Fatui, but doesn't explain. A memory of Bosatius appears, and Zhao battles it again. And this time, he comes out on top. After Bosatius had gone mad, he came to the chasm and fought against the monsters 500 years ago, luring them to this space. Letters written by Yelan's ancestors ancestor who was trapped here, named Boyong, are found. They speak of him and Bosatius, along with other Millilith soldiers being trapped in this space together. Further in, they encounter the emptiness of the abyss again, created from the Traveler's memory and their sibling. But the illusion fades and leaves instead the true fantastic compass. Chibi version. It's the same catalyst that Yelan spoke of being attached to her clan. Boyong was gifted the fantastic compass by someone of great importance, and then he brought it here to the chasm in the battle against the monsters. The ancestor that returned likely went insane due to their proximity to Bosatius and his karma. Without a vision, it was inevitable. Yenfei remembers that the book that the will was left in speaks of a magical device that could seal monsters away, that an adeptus gave this device to a human to use as a catalyst, that when a human and adeptus combine their powers, the device's power can be truly unleashed. It shows the unity between mortals and adepti. Yenfei attempts to use it since she has both mortal and adeptal blood, but she's not strong enough. Instead, they hear the voices of Boyong and Bosatius. By heaven's might and the gods of the five regions, Yaksha and mortal together take this contraption in hand. They were the ones to seal off this space. The impact from the crystal likely led to the weakening of that seal and then the swallowing of the group. This fantastic compass likely isn't even real to begin with, just another illusion, but an illusion found from the Traveler's commitment to find their sibling. To return to the real world, Yelan and Zhao combine their powers to use the compass. The heavens and the earth come together in an attempt to free the group. Stars align, bestow your light, evil purged by thunder's might. Spirit curbed, Numa surge, by dictum divine, heed these words. Do as I command! Aha! Uh, <laughs> uh -huh. The fantastic compass is an amplifier. Maintain this energy level and we may stand a chance. I will maintain the energy flow. Understood. Everyone, stand back. I shall hold the line by sealing the surface. As Yaksha's, we must fight for this world. General Alatus, falling in! Watch out! This trip may be dangerous, yet you insist on going. I have guarded this place for several hundred years. Only to seek the nameless Yaksha do I request your approval. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 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 
keep this up. Your strength won't last. Purgatory has been escaped, and on the surface, the group thanks Zhao, and Ito finally awakens. Yelan pledges to learn the truth about that space. Zhao takes the pair to the temple for Pervases. It was recently built by the man posing as a Yaksha, the fan of Zhao, in an attempt to make amends for his scamming. Zhao's idea of self-sacrifice, he admits, might be his own form of insanity. Yaksha are used to slaughtering, and that slaughter leads to karma. But the Traveler and Paimon stress that that shouldn't mean that he completely closes himself off to the outside world. He has people that he can lean on now. Bosatius believed that too. Zhao says that in the illusion, he heard Bosatius calling out to him. Alatus is the name Bosatius knew him by and he was calling his name as well as the other, Yaksha. They all believed that once all of the slaughter was over, perhaps they could live as normal mortals. Perhaps they could live a life free from suffering. Maybe now, with him being the only one left, Zhao can fulfill that dream for his fallen family. Mm, Minogius, where have you been? Brother Yakshai, you're confused again. I've told you countless times, I am Boyang, a thaumaturge who fought with you in the chasm. Boyang? Boyang? You are Boyang, but who am I? <laughs> Believe me, I want to know as much as you do. Here we are, the two who agreed to stay here together, and I can't even call you by your name. It's a shame. Stay here? No. No, you have to leave. Uh, nonsense, Brother Yaksha. We're down here for good now. Don't you remember? It's too late to have regrets. The seal can't be broken. The seal... Ah, oh, yes. I'm a Yaksha who came here to fight. Brother, brother, are you okay? <laughs> Look at the state of me. I don't think I've got long now. <laughs> We're the only two left. Don't go dying on me. <sighs> you know, today I saw my family down here. Clearest day. What do you think? Am I losing my mind now, too? Hmm. Boyong, do you want to go home? I made my decision to leave Zhong Zhao up on the surface. I obviously... Of course I want to go home. I must have... family, too. You mean brothers and sisters? I'm sure you do. Brothers and sisters. Yes, but who am I? And where is my family? I'm... Brother! What's wrong? Hang in there. It's just you and me, don't... Don't die before me. Alatus, is that you? Who's Alatus? Your memory's calling again. <coughs> I'm sorry. You all have to see me in this state. Brother! Brother! Look, there's someone over there. Who are they? 
there. They're my... my... I remember now. I know you. <laughs> My brothers and sisters have come for me, Boyong. You're... you're awake? At least... at least tell me your name! Brother! Brother Bosatius! <laughs> hey, Bosatius. Bosatius. I... I am Bosatius, and my destiny is to make... The ultimate sacrifice! Shi Chong asks the pair to place some beacons around the chasm to get some extra data. The next day though, after they've been placed, Shi Chong goes missing. But when they find her, she's stuck in the black mud, rambling about nonsense. They bring her back to the camp and Jin Wu says that she's going to request that Shi Chong just be removed from the team since she just keeps making risky decisions. Shi Chong thanks the pair for helping her but she needs her rest so she asks them to return tomorrow. But the next day she's gone and Jin Wu says that she's left the exploration team and that she's disappeared. They tell the Ministry of Civil Affairs rep, who says that they were planning on actually giving Shi Chong a job because of her amazing maps of the chasm. He's shocked to hear of her disappearance though, because nobody has actually been spotted leaving the chasm recently. So he says that they'll send out a search party for her, but the Traveler and Paimon are too worried, so they search the chasm relentlessly until they find a camp with a letter left by her. In the letter, she wonders the difference between those granted visions and those who are ignored by the gods. Are the people not granted power by the gods mundane? If that's true, if they are mundane, then she wants to be considered among the great mundane adventurers then, among the likes of the names of Stanley. Because to her, she wants to give power to the mundane, to the ordinary, to the people the gods have ignored. So she'll keep exploring, and she'll keep charting the unknowns of the chasm while naming the areas after people, just normal, average people, with the hopes that she too can inspire those not looked upon by divinity. They tell Jinwu about the letter, and she's happy to hear from Shi Chong, but obviously worried that she's traveling deeper into the chasm all by herself. She wishes that she had told her how important her maps were to the team. Jinwu says that she remembered the day that she gave up on her own dreams. It was the day that she truly realized that she wasn't gifted by the gods. Now for my final question. This world has people who gained visions and those who did not. Which of the two do you think hold more importance in the eyes of the gods? While recovering from the nightmare fuel that was the chasm, the pair run into the woman that they helped with Ganyu, Haoshin. Her father, Uncle Tian, is considering retirement from the Tianshu position because of his health, and she asks if they can pay him a visit. He speaks of his selection process for his successor, and that he's going to use someone else to appoint them, that person being Yelon. She asks the pair to join her in the assessment process. Uncle Tian says that if they can't appoint a successor, that he might appoint Yelon instead. There are four apples and the assessment process requires a manifesto and then an interview. Each applicant interviews with the three and some are good and some are not so much. Hi, so today I'll be trying out for the role of Nicolas Cage in the seminal 1989 classic, Vampire's Kiss. What could be easier? It's all alphabetical. He goes A, B, C, D, E, F, G, 
An applicant named Zhu Yi catches everyone's eye, as his plans for the role look the most grounded, but also familiar to the way Uncle Tien handles the role. And it turns out, Uncle Tien admits that all three studied under him at a time. Zhu Yi studied under him for the longest time. They met while they were fishing, and Uncle Tien learned that Zhu Yi was down on his luck, impoverished and had parents pass at a young age. But he was smart and had a clear mind for these things, so he took him under his tutelage. They're really close to just picking Zhu Yi as the successor, but Ye Lan stresses that they need to be more thorough, that things aren't always as they appear. She calls on her assistants to look into the other applicants while the three investigate Zhu Yi. While investigating, they lie to working people and lie to a child named Master Dugu. Wait, no, Master Dooku! <laughs> They learned that prior to the last few months, people kinda hated Zhu Yi, but now he's essentially a celebrity. Because he's super poor, Yelan thinks that someone behind the scenes is actually supporting him for his marketing campaign. Someone that might be trying to get something out of him if he were to actually become the Tianchu. They look closer into his manifesto to see if they can find anything unusual, and they learn of a redevelopment plan attached to a place called the Qingsa Pool. The plan calls for a group named the Black Cliff Forge to have the rights to the redevelopment. During the time that Ejda's mine had eroded, he was wreaking havoc, and he did it there at the Qingsa Pool, so many suspect that there may be unearthed secrets there. But when the Qixing investigated in the past, they couldn't get far as the ruined walls were impenetrable. While investigating the Black Cliff Forge group, they find that a ton of newcomers have been recently hired on. Yelan suspects that these newcomers are likely attached to the organization that's supporting your E from the shadows so that they can infiltrate the Black Cliff Forge and then take what they find if they get into the Chingsa pool. Following a newcomer leads them to an abandoned house and a fire pit where documents were clearly destroyed. Yelan can tell something from the scent though and asks the traveler to smell. Uh, this smells like... Uh, it's shit. It's shit. Paimon, it's shit. Oh, wait. Ye Yelan, it's... it's you. Turns out the group behind the scenes supporting Zhu Yi is the Fatui. Surprise! <coughs> Yelan's subordinate asks whether it's finally time to deal with the Fatui, but Yelan makes it clear that they need to take this slowly. So to trap Zhu Yi, the group tells him that he actually got the Tianshu job. Then they trail him to see who he meets which leads them to the Chingsa pool. In the ruins, they find Zhu Yi with his supporter, Yusupov. Turns out, Zhu Yi has been poisoning Uncle Tian's soup, which has resulted in his current health problems. Zhu Yi sure loves his poison though, as he begins to poison Yusupov too. He doesn't want to serve anyone, including the Fatui. But just before he blows the place to smithereens to get rid of the evidence, Yelan jumps in, exposing him and telling him that, regardless of what he had done, Uncle Tian would have always at his best interests at heart. Life is like fishing. It cannot be rushed. Whatever you do, impatience will accomplish nothing. I was just like you once, desperate to prove myself. Only later did I realize things do not always turn out the way you plan. But you have to keep calm to carry on. You're still young. Be patient, believe in yourself, and don't look outside yourself to prove your value. <coughs> Where's Jury these days? It's been a long time since he last paid me a visit. <laughs> Maybe he's just busy. <laughs> well, next time, if he doesn't bring a pot of piping hot fish soup, don't let him in. <laughs> Whatever you were thinking about, you'll have plenty of time to mull it over in prison. Oh, I almost forgot. If the Fatui find out what happened today, prison might not turn out to be the safest place for you. Trying to have friends on both sides, it has a way of turning everyone against you. But right now, I have an opportunity for you. Zhu Yi is taken away in questions, and the next morning, Dr. Baiju is treating Uncle Tien for his poisoning, and has given him the appropriate treatment. 
It was a special, very rare poison, but Baiju's expertise is extremely high, so he'll be able to treat it. Uncle Tian expresses that he put Yelon on the job as the assessor because, in truth, he knew something was going on with Zhur Yi. Yelon made a deal with Zhur Yi and actually got intel in order to assure his safety from the Fatui. The intel was the name of a harbinger who was behind the scenes in this whole incident. Yelon is asked to take the Tianchu position, but she denies it. She's got things to do, and her investigation into the Fatui isn't over. And she now has a name. Regrader. Summer is here, and you know what that means. <laughs> Say it with me. <gasps> Depression. Fischl has requested the assistance of the Traveler, so they check in with her. Mona is with her, and it seems Mona has been working with her, and they're pretty close now. Fischl helped Klee out the other day and told her about her old world, the Imranachreich. And Klee was so sad that she asked her mom, Alice, and Alice straight up gave the Golden Apple Archipelago to Fischl so that she can restore her homeland. Fischl, though, doesn't know how to get there, so she wants the Traveler and Paimon's help. And, as usual, she's speaking in a complicated way, and everybody has to play along. The pair find Vinti to see if he'll help, but they run into Kazuha and Shinyan too. They're here on a trip. They met on Beidou's ship, and their love for the arts made them quick friends. Qinyan says that she came here for yet another attempt at the Iridescence tour, but they cancelled. Again. They're at the pub, so they all decide to get crunk! My son died here! My son died here! So turn up the music! Vinti said he recently ran into Alice, as her and Klee were about to go on a trip, and she gave him a bomb! It's actually a dodo communication device, essentially a phone, but it has limited uses. Apparently, Alice got the inspiration for it from another world. Klee wanted them to have it, and Alice had already set them up a path to the island just outside of Mondstadt's gate. The pair invite Kazuha and Shinyan to go with them on the trip. Kazuha is shmammered, but he still wants to go, and so does Shinyan. Vinti can't, though, as he has other arrangements. The next morning, the group all do their introductions. The synergy is on point, and they all get along with Outside the gates, they find their path, a vehicle. So of course they all hop in and it flies them to the archipelago! A summer after the events with Klee, the Traveler is back at the island paradise. Kazuha and the Traveler survey the area and find a mysterious machine. It appears they're not alone on the island anymore as they find Fatui agents, but they're acting unusual to say the least. One of them is a researcher who says that they brought the machine here to test it out on a deserted island, but it's broken now and they're getting ready to leave anyway. The Traveler and Paimon decide to call Vinti to tell him about the Fatui and he calms them down. Doesn't seem like the Fatui being there is much of a problem and surely it won't lead to anything weird. <laughs> okay, well, they wake up to a talking squirrel on a boat that Paimon names Meatball, but you know, more specifically, Mitoburu, and he has forgotten his true name, which is why Paimon felt the need to name him. Mona can't divine anything right now either and the islands begin to change. They decide to investigate whatever the hell's going on, and so they ride Meatball to an island where they find a bonsai pot, the same one that they found in the Tenryo Commission warehouse that was owned by Kazuha's family. But examining it warps the group to another space, a space that looks like an Inazuman home, specifically Kazuha's family home. Kazuha believes it may be a mirage constructed based on his memories. He thinks that 
maybe it appeared to help him solve his regrets. This bonsai is from his great-grandfather and the last one left in the family. After the Kunikazushi incident, where the family business went under, his great-grandfather sold all of his bonsai, except this one. But since Kazuha left Inazuma, he hasn't had a chance to place his treasured memories of his own into a bonsai to honor his family. So he decides to decorate this one, but decorating the bonsai transports the group back into the mirage where they witness a conversation between Kazuha and his father. His father regrets that he was never able to travel and see all of the wonders of the world. He tells Kazuha to not let that happen to him, that while family is important, it's his happiness that matters the most to not let familial obligations ruin his life. Another conversation reveals that Kazuha's father was taking all of the burden of the declining family business on himself and not letting Kazuha help at all. Kazuha was confused about this at that age, but his father wanted him to be free. He said that he'll carry the burden of the family, but Kazuha couldn't accept this. He tried everything to help his father, becoming adept at sword arts and trying to learn about the family business, but it was all for naught. Like a stage play, the memories continue, with Kazuha attempting to save his friend and leaving Inazuma with Beidou. Kazuha reflects on all of this and comes to a conclusion. There's no future for those who linger in the past. I often travel during storms, which means my eyes are often blinded by the rain. Many times, couldn't even see what was right in front of me. One day, I finally reached the top of the mountain. I looked out with the clouds beneath my feet and only the gentle breeze murmuring in my ears. The highest mountain is a clear and enlightened heart. Here, there is no self, no hatred, no regrets, and no desires. Let's embark on a journey for I am the breeze. We will meet again, no matter how far along the road. Life has just begun, and maybe the whole world can be my home. They return to rest, and Fischl is clearly off, but Mona goes to her to be a friend. Kazuha rethinks this idea that the Mirage was about regret, but rather it may be connected to his dreams, his dream to honor his past and complete a bonsai while continuing to move forward. The Traveler and Paimon try and call Venti again. Venti doesn't pick up, and Mona tells the pair that she thinks Fischl is off because she doesn't want to see her own Mirage. She laments how something crazy always happens when they're with the Traveler, like the Leonard situation from a while back. The next morning, Fischl went off on her own. The rest of the group decide to investigate the islands further and find Shinyan's mirage. A flower greets them inside, asking Shinyan what she hopes to express with music, and she says, the spirit of resistance. The plant agrees, but can't perform right now. She needs glacial spring water, and says that anyone can sing if they have that, even an ignorant child. Outside the mirage, they search for the water and find a note from Albedo that he left here last summer. It says that he examined the mountains and found that someone made it so that this particular island could act as a large musical instrument. Bringing the spring water back sends them into Shinyan's memories, where her mother says that she's not a singer, and that the only reason birds can sing is because they drink spring water from atop the mountains. Clearly, it was just a nice tale, but Shinyan actually climbed the mountains and found some anyway. Her parents clearly don't approve of that, though. Ultimately, they don't think that she can become a musician, and they want her to stop. The townspeople are also not on board with her playing music. They don't think it's ladylike enough and think her music is annoying. But regardless of how rude the townspeople were, Shinyan always returned their comments with kindness and understanding. She says that a smile and some kindness can make any problem go away, that her rock and roll spirit lets a person transform their identity and destiny and say goodbye to concessions and cowardice. If people don't like her music or her hair or her clothes, it doesn't matter. She's not going to change it. See, people are like a rag of ribs. You put them in the oven at low heat, their skin falls right off their fucking bones. There are those who accept Xinyan for who she is, though. A memory of her most recent birthday shows Yunjin and Zhang Ling there for her. Her birthday wish at the time was to perform for someone completely unexpected.
you who lived here in the past. I hope you liked this song. On another island, they find Fischl, who's still not in the best of moods, and goes off again. The group finds a mysterious book on the beach named Hymn of the Holy Land and a raven statue. Touching it sends them into another mirage, Fischl's. Just like Fischl though, the mirage is deliberate, obtuse, and theatrical. It's the kingdom of the Emmernachreich. After exploring it for a while and learning more about the land, they happen into a Mondstadt home, Fischl's childhood home. There, her parents speak her real name, Amy. Amy's imagination ran wild after she became interested in fiction and role-playing. Her parents role-played with her until she started to get older, and then they stopped, believing that she just needed to grow up. They believed that her passion was a waste of time. Amy isn't from another world. She's just a girl from Mondstadt, and the Amarnachreich isn't real. Deeper in the Mirage, the Amarnachreich actually reveals itself as Fischl's inner feelings. Her love of roleplay is a result of her expression of emotion. To her, acting is the truest form of human emotion, and that was what drew her to it initially. Before reaching the depths of the Mirage, the group encounters Fischl and Oz. They find a castle that she destroyed when she was younger, and when they piece it together, they come to a library. There, they encounter another Fischl. Her shadow. This other Fischl calls to Oz and calls Fischl Amy. Oz accepts the invitation and leaves Fischl for the shadow. The shadow says that the Imranachreich is simply a tomb for those who can't truly face reality. That Fischl will be buried here forever. Fischl begins to believe that, but Mona and the others assure her that they're there to support her. Fischl agrees with the shadow. She was someone who couldn't face reality. But now it's not about that. Rather, it's about embracing her imagination. She may have been unsure before, but now she knows what her true self and true strength truly are, her imagination. Oz says that he left her side to prove that she knows who she truly is. The Shadow says that Fischl is a coward who hides herself behind fantasies, but Fischl says the simple response, who Fischl truly is, is herself. She's an adventurer, but also the princess. She is everything that encompasses Amy and everything that encompasses Fischl, the light and the shadow. But Fischl is the name that she chose for herself because it encompasses one who chooses freedom and their dreams. Fischl embraces her shadow and reclaims her heart. One stormy night, a girl found a way to the future in the library. <sighs> She said to herself, I shall create my dream kingdom. I'll carve mountains and oceans and erect castles and towns. Then she spoke to those who shared her dream. Please be proud of all that is unreal, for we are greater than this world. For our magnificent kingdom is a small and forbidden paradise. The Traveler and Paimon redial Venti, but instead, a feminine voice answers. She says that she cut off their communication to outside the island, and says that they should find the answers to the Mirage themselves, rather than getting outside help. She wants to know how they feel afterwards, and she hangs up. A new Mirage appears, and it's Mona's. When Mona learned that she had the power to divine the future, those around her began asking difficult questions about their own lives, and she answered truthfully. But these hard truths isolated her from others. She was alone and misunderstood. Once, she divined for an adventurer and found that if he continued being an adventurer, he would meet a terrible fate. He believed her, but he couldn't live any other way. He had the heart of an adventurer regardless of the consequences. This sentiment struck Mona. She vowed that regardless of the hardship, she too would continue to be an astrologist. That she would continue to live how she desired, regardless of the potential consequences. She came to love astrology. It allows one to see the truths of the world, a mighty art that reveals the secrets of fate. In the depths of the mirage, they end up in Mona's home in Mondstadt, the one that she previously unsealed. 
Mona's a fake poor. They come to a beautiful sea of stars, and Mona comments on how every star is in their rightful place here. This isn't how the stars truly are. Rather, each star represents a person, hence a person's constellation, like that of Leonard's that fell. The star records your life and represents it. If they're in their rightful place and stay on track, it means you'll be healthy and lead a fulfilling life, but a lot lose their way or even fall from the sky. Mona ultimately offers advice and tells the truth of the divinations so that others' lives may be as bright as the stars that mirror them. Doing so is difficult and perhaps even a miracle. Mona says that she still believes in miracles. If astrologists get too cocky though and think that they have unlimited power, the stars will take away their abilities. Astrologists then can't divine their own fate. They're an anomaly in the sea of stars, but instead of lamenting this, Mona has chosen to seize her own unknown destiny. There was a transparent bird made of crystal. It was beautiful and fragile and could sing the most beautiful songs. But since mortals couldn't see it, they believed it to be a trick. How could a transparent bird possibly exist, let alone sing? When the bird heard that, it flapped its wings and flew across mountains and seas all the way to the night sky where it turned into a star. Its brilliance was so dazzling that it illuminated everyone. It allowed all those that could see it to follow its light through the dark night, to sail through the seas under the guidance of the stars. It was born in wisdom, but trapped in ignorance. It has never voiced a complaint, for this is its destiny. Guiding people to see their destinies is the very meaning of its existence. The group suggests that the emergence of the mirages and the Fatui soldiers who were acting weird earlier may actually all be caused by the machine. At the machine, the Fatui researcher, Persikov, has completely lost his mind. Stabbing him back to reality causes him to give the group the manuscript of a machine. The machine is named Cognitive Mimicry. It was made by Persikov and can alter people's brains and is modeled after the power of a god. Surprisingly, the Fatui weren't fans of this and didn't want Persikov to continue in its development, so he decided to do it on his own. So he found the deserted archipelago and brought along recruits to help him test it. The breaking down of the machine resulted in the chaos that happened over the last few days. Persikov figured out how to fix the device, but went mad, so the group fixes the device from his notes. With the machine fixed, everything begins to return to normal, and the group decides to finally relax and enjoy the rest of their summer. The boat, Meatball, thanks them for hanging out, and comes to realize his true name, Koseki Maru. He was actually a part of Akodomeki's pirate fleet, but he was given this name not by Akodomeki, but instead by Asase Hibiki. When the waters around Seirai began to succumb to the storms when his fleet was battling the shogunate, Koseki Maru and some of the other crew were swept to this archipelago. This is why the Inazuman machine from last summer was here too. Koseki Maru is happy that he was finally able to remember his true name, and the Traveler and Paimon help him discover what happened to his crewmates. They learn that they actually managed to return home. Koseki Maru is not exactly the most happy about this information though. He wanted to go on more adventures with his old friends. But he says that if the pair ever happen upon the archipelago in the future, he promises to continue to be their trusted companion and glide them across its seas. With that, since the machine is no longer functioning, Koseki Maru is now unable to speak. But the pair know his heart and will carry his wishes of adventure with them throughout the rest of their journey. The pair call Venti again and they get through this time. They explain everything that happened and while Venti is shocked, he doesn't know anything about the whole ordeal. He's just happy they had fun, I guess? He says that the mysterious voice that they heard though had to have been from a very powerful person since she could intercept Alice's device, but she didn't attack them, even though she likely easily could have with her power, so she's probably not a bad person. After the call, the traveler actually hears her voice again, but in their head. Now you have solved the mystery. Doesn't it make you feel happy? Satisfied? Don't worry, I won't hurt you. I'm just a little bird that sometimes flies by these islands, and am now watching you from far, far away. I just so happen to sense a power here that has something to do with me. 
I was curious, so I landed on the beach to quietly watch everything that took place on these islands. It was fascinating. The ones who came here to work were so busy, and yet, I still saw genuine smiles on their faces from time to time. And then all of you arrived later on, bringing your glorious dreamscapes and wonderful willpower. Your dreams are like the pure and delicate bubbles floating on the water. The more beautiful the illusion, the more it fascinates me. I'm not able to travel myself, but I do admire free spirits like yourself. So, I helped them design a little something for you all. I hope you liked it. As I said, I don't have an agenda. I'm just a little bird. I stopped here to admire your lives, joys, sorrows, and all. You are a special person with a unique and brilliant glow. I decided to communicate with you in this way because I'm really curious about you. There's no need to wonder about my name. Maybe one day in the future, we will meet in another place. When that time comes, I think you'll be able to recognize me. <laughs> hey, what are you doing? The crabs don't catch themselves! Summer is nearing its end, and the pair are ready to venture into Sumeru, since the chasm surface has almost officially reopened. But Paimon want juice! So to get special juice, they head to D. Luke's villa to get it directly from him. To get his fat juice straight from the f***ing tap. His head housemaid, Adelaide, informs them that D. Luke is actually gone on a Dark Knight hero mission. They go to help him, but find notes instead, written by someone who was working with D. Luke in the past. The notebook is near a distorted ley line that the notes say has been disturbed and is releasing after-image monsters. D. Luke has dealt with them before, as this isn't the first time that this has happened. The notes speak of D. Luke sending a letter to Albedo to try and get to the bottom of this anomaly. Nearing the ley line caused causes after-image monsters to appear in front of the duo, but also a recording of D. Luke, who's sporting a new look. Only $29.99? Seems this is a ley line recording of a past battle. Back at the winery, Adelaide asks the pair to place a letter inside, and D. Luke meets them there. There's a bunch of letters on a table, and he says that he brought them out to investigate recent developments, and says that they can all just read them if they want. The letters speak of an incident in D. Luke's life the passing of his father, Krapus, and the ensuing incidents. A letter from Alice reveals that D. Luke used to be a knight at the time, before his father passed. But after the passing, D. Luke fell into a deep depression. Alice says that while she doesn't know him very well, she urges him to travel and see the world. A letter from the Grandmaster of the Knights of Favonius, Varka, speaks of Krapus' passing while fighting a drake. A person named Erok seemingly took credit for the drake's defeat at the time, but Varka says that he will be punished for doing so. He says that the knights will always have a place for Diluc if he ever wished to return. The incident with Erok actually led to a rift in the knights, says a letter from Kaya. Erok seemed to have had a lot of influence and followers, but Jean and Varka were able to oust him from the group, which Kaya seemed to take great joy from. While Kaya and Diluc's relationship is strained, it's clear that they still care for each other as brothers. The next letter is from a housemaid. D. Luke did decide to eventually travel and take Alice's advice, and while he was gone, Kaya spent some time at the manor. Kaya was adopted by D. Luke's family, and he too took the passing of their father part as well. D. Luke sent letters back to Varka and Jean, both thanking them for their condolences. Clearly, he respects the two, and even says that he'll keep what the knights taught him close. He finally returned to Mondstadt, and subsequent letters reveal that soon after he took up the mantle of the Dark Knight hero, Kaya, well, quickly caught on. He urges D. Luke that while the Dark Knight hero has helped, acting alone isn't the greatest 
course of action. The final letter speaks to the current ley line incident. Albedo says that ley lines record information, and that this information goes through a recording and storing process, and that it seems that there may be people who can activate this process at will and see records of the world, and that that power may reside within the Abyss Order. Diluc comes downstairs, this time in the attire that they saw him wearing from the ley line memory. He says that the memory that they saw at the ley line was from when he was stopping an abyss plot, and the unusually active ley line recorded it. He says the current ley line anomaly isn't the result of the abyss though, and that after battling a barrage of afterimages, the ley line anomaly halts. Diluc thanks the pair, saying they should team up again in the future, and gives them that fat, sweaty grape juice. But the pair decide to dive deeper into Diluc and Kaya's affairs, which leads the pair to hidden letters, seemingly hidden by Kaya himself. In one, Kaya states that he saved a letter from a fire that his father was making, seemingly to burn the letter. The letter that was saved looks like Kaya wrote it as a child with the help of his father, and it reads, Remember always that it was the Alberic clan who did not have royal blood who stepped in as regents when the strength of the one-eyed King Ermin failed. Though we could not restore Conria to life, we of the Alberic clan should lead lives as those who blaze like fire, rather than those who wallow in the embers. The pair also find an old eye patch in the box, and with it, another note. The day Diluc's father died, Kaya apparently told Diluc a specific truth, but this truth resulted in conflict, and this conflict resulted in Kaya's eye being injured, which is why he now wears a real eye patch. Although it was injured, his eye was not blinded. The ley line disorder brought the pair into a mess of memories from the past, the scars of which seem to still impact the present. The pair complete a bunch of commissions, and Catherine explains that they were needed because of the harvesting season and Weinlesefest. The pair notice knights freaking out and rushing to the headquarters, and apparently it's because the knights just received a letter from Grandmaster Varka. Kaya greets the pair and invites them to the headquarters to check out the letter. At the headquarters, they run into Lisa, who's perfectly normal and has no problems. She says that the letter is likely not a big deal because the person who brought it, Mika, would freak out if it was. Like they've heard, Varka is the Grand Master of the Knights of Favonius, but he's currently on a secret expedition with a small team. Mika used to be a land surveyor in Eula's team, but Varka appointed him to be a core member of the frontline team on this expedition, so he's the one who brought the letter back. Varka told Mika that when he comes back, he's to return to his original position as a surveyor in Eula's reconnaissance company. The job of a land surveyor is to explore uncharted territory, and because of this, Mika was on the front lines of Varka's expedition. The letter that Mika brought back explains how Varka can't say what the details of the expedition truly are yet. The secret is too important, but he can say that one of the Fatui Harbingers has helped the team, the Harbinger known as the Captain. The same Harbinger that Victor wished he had worked under for his kindness. After helping the expedition team, the Captain was said to be on his way to Natlan, the Land of Flames. The letter actually has something more, but it's only meant for Lisa's eyes, and so she's given it. After hearing the letter, the pair introduce themselves to Mika, who's hearing about the Storm Terror incident from Kaya. Mika is too much of a goober though, and he usually wants to know what makes people tick before he interacts with them, so he rushes off. Jean is happy to see the pair, and Lisa says that Jean has missed them a lot lately. Jean invites them to stay in the town for the festival, and they agree to it, since they've missed everyone too. She explains what the festival is all about. It's ancient, like Ludi Herpastum and Windbloom, and it's the most important festival of the fall. Legends say the wine entices Barbados to the festival as well. He does so on the western wind, which people refer to as the returning winds. If he's satisfied with the taste of the wine, he'll bless the people. And so the festival began as a festival welcoming Barbados' return, and now people enjoy the wine and harvests. Because the festival is related to returning home, those who are far away often come back home to enjoy the harvests with their friends and family, which is why Varka sent a letter back. 
This is actually just Thanksgiving. This year, the church and the Knights are holding a joint celebration and there will be a lively market. Speaking of the letter, Lisa says it has to do with Varka wanting her to handle something regarding Razor's past. Varka says that there's a box in Jean's office and that it has items from Razor's parents in it and that it's finally time to give them to him. Varka and Razor's parents clearly have a storied history. Lisa isn't sure if Razor is actually ready to hear this, though. Lisa says that she's Razor's teacher, and that she teaches him about the world as well as helping him with his speech, but that he should hear this information from a friend rather than a teacher. Before departing, they inquire about the letter further, and Jean says that she was surprised to hear Varka praise the captain, that Varka rarely praises anyone to that degree, especially a harbinger. But the letter makes it clear that the expedition is going smoothly now, which is nice. Regardless of Varka's praise, she warns them that they need to be careful of the captain if they ever meet him. He's not to be underestimated. Ever since they last saw Razor, he's been getting comfortable with the hunters of Springvale and actually helping them stave off boars and the like from the affected town. They tell Razor about Varka's letter and he's unsure about what to do with the information. He doesn't know if he wants to learn about his real parents. Draft tells the pair that Razor is likely afraid his parents abandoned him, that Diona often freaks out whenever he's out for a long hunt, and that he's sure that that's what Razor is thinking. Over the last year, Razor has really come into his own. He's ready to face the truth now. Razor says that his name was given to him by Varka, and that he even trained him in combat, that he trusts and misses Varka. So he knows that the information in this letter is true. After the Traveler and Paimon assure him that, regardless of what he finds, they and his friends will be there for him, Razor makes his decision. He wants to see what was left to him by his parents. Razor opens the box, and in it he finds, like, yarn and like a hand puppet or something? But he also remembers a scent, a scent from his parents that he remembers smelling from his childhood. There's also Ruin Guard components and a bottle of wine, Thousand Wind Wine to be specific. Lisa says that it's the first kind of wine that was ever made in Mondstadt. Its taste, though, is often inconsistent when made because of its ingredients, so it grew out of Mondstadt tradition since markets and taverns stopped making it. Razor opens the bottle and takes a whiff, but he can't ascertain the ingredients. Lisa says to remember what she taught him, that if something doesn't work one way, then to try it again another. And so the group decides to ask winos at the festival if they can tell what it's made of. The opening ceremony of the festival commences and the group finds their number one wino, Venti. About the making of Thousand Wind Wine, he gives them a poem. Fill up the barrels and store them away. Then wait, wait for a windier day. Wax the bottles, seal them tight. For the south wind that soothes, for the north wind that bites. How does this fine wine taste to the tongue? As Mondstadt to the ear, like a sweet dream of freedom. And what are the fruits that went into the brew? An explorer's courage, a love tender and true. A defender's will, strong as yesteryear. Joining the thousand winds in a song of good cheer. Turning sour into sweet, bitter notes fade away. As we wait, wait for a windier day. The poem is actually really vague, but the group decides that they want to figure it out and remake the wine. Razor thinks that if he can remake the wine, he might just learn a little more about what kind of people his parents were. So they embark on a mission to find the ingredients based on the poem, which they discern is about the three institutions in Mondstadt the church, the knights, and the guild. His friends from all around Mondstadt also help him, such as Bennett and Klee. Bennett says that he's obviously buddies with Razor, but reveals to him that he doesn't know his real parents either. But to him, that's okay. He has dads and the Adventurer's Guild that look after him, and his friends, like Razor, that he can rely on. He gives Razor lampgrass as an ingredient for the wine. Bennett and Razor aren't the only ones who don't know their blood parents, as the same is true for Rosaria. She doesn't know who her parents are either, and Varka also acted as a father figure to her. So even though she basically just met Razor, she tells him that she considers herself like an older sister to him. She tells him the cold truth, that even if he learns about his true parents, will that 
really matter? Will it change anything? To her, what matters the most is what you do to improve yourself in the present. She gives the group a cryo flower, as she knows they need ingredients, since she's been stalking them this whole time. After this conversation, Razor is more conflicted than ever, but Lisa offers to help him process his feelings. The duo go with Kaya to get a barrel to make the wine in, and Kaya enters his old home for the first time in a while. They get the barrel for Razor, and Adeline convinces Kaya to stay and have a meal. So even with D. Luke and Kaya's relationship clearly strained, they have a meal together in their family home for the first time in a long time. Back at the headquarters, the pair run into Noel and Sucrose, who have the final ingredient, an enhanced sensetia with extra sweetness that Noel and Sucrose worked on together. Sucrose says she really wanted to help Razor because, well, she had parents that encouraged her to pursue what she loves, and without them, she likely wouldn't be where she is today. She realizes what a gift that is, and because of that, wants to help Razor in any way that she can. She bolts, though, without telling that to Razor because she literally is terrible at meeting new people. Noel meets Razor instead and gives him the ingredient. They also pass on Sucro's message, spend your life doing what you love. As the Traveler and Paimon exit the Knight's headquarters, they find something mysterious. Hey, Paimon, do you see that? What is that? Is that- Oh! Hey, Traveler, so I'm here to kill you like I said I would. So, uh, be prepared. Oh my god! Uh, wait! Why can't I move? Uh, production costs? Shh, don't say that. Oh, I mean, uh, my new powers! <gasps> oh my god! Ooh. Oh my god, Paimon, help! <laughs> Throw the phone! Uh, hello? Uh, yeah, what's up? <laughs> nah, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's just a voicemail. <laughs> Not for real, what's up? <laughs> No, I'm joking. <laughs> hey, uh, get your hands off the Traveler, you damn turtle bitch! Hurry, while he's distracted, use it, Traveler! <laughs> well, I went and trained with some sweet paper guy in some labyrinth in Inazuma, and, uh, I'm immortal now, so have fun trying to kill me. I think it would take the power of a god to beat me, so... <gasps> oh, no, damn it. Traveler, uh, realize I'm not the true enemy here. Um, you know, just follow the breadcrumbs. What does that mean? I mean, I still want to kill you, so I'm not going to tell you. But, uh, are you not paying attention this whole six hours? Dave, I need you! I'm sending him to another dimension. I may never see you again. I, I... I love- Oh my god. Oh my god. It was a coin. Wow. Back at the festival, they run into Klee and Diona. Klee told Diona that the group was trying to make wine, and since Diona hates alcohol, particularly because her father is an alcoholic, she's a little pissed because she doesn't want that to happen to raise her. But once the situation is actually explained to her, she decides to help and make the wine. Wind coming day is tomorrow the day the Animo God supposedly returns, so the festival is about to come to an end. The group goes to bury the wine at Windrise so that it can ferment, and they run into Venti. He gives them dandelion seeds as a final ingredient. It's a way of capturing the wind at the moment the barrel is sealed. Venti says that the Thousand Wind Wine doesn't have a true list of ingredients. It's similar to the wind bloom. It can include any ingredient. It gives the brewer the freedom to make what they want. Razor says that while he still can't discern what was in his parents' wine, this wine that he's making now is made of friendship. He says that even if he never understands his parents, he'll always have his friends. They all made this wine together with their own ingredients, and that's special to him. That when he grows up, they'll all come back here to dig the wine up and drink it together. And so the dandelion seed is placed in the barrel and buried. The seed placing with it the memories of those who Razor treasures most.
Take this, crush it, and place it on the fracture. Listen, Missy. Promise me you'll live on. This is where you must stay. You are our only hope. Forgive me, Kaya. <laughs> good, very good. That's my boy. I will always be proud of you. After all the time we spent on it, the wine still isn't ready. <laughs> May as well leave it for our son. Razor. What do you think of that name? Oh, an adventurer's name. Yes, I like it. Razor? Razor, come on! <laughs> The Traveler has placed their dreams into the land of freedom, like a seed to someday sprout into their future. But with freedom comes choice. The Traveler has begun asking, who will I choose when given the choice? Their sibling has chosen their path, one which led them to the Abyss Order, challenging the gods. The Traveler is still unsure whether they can follow, whether when the choice comes, they'll choose to side with their sibling. But the dreams of those that the Traveler has encountered, the strength of will that each has displayed, has shown the Traveler that when that time comes, they'll be ready. And maybe when they take freedom hold, that seed will sprout into a transcendent dream. Heading through the newly opened chasm leads the pair to the region of Sumeru, where they're intent on meeting the Dendro Archon, known as the Lesser Lord Kusanali. This time though, the pair are sure this isn't the unknown god. Rather, because this god is known as the god of wisdom, they're the best bet in terms of giving the pair important information about their sibling, as well as the world in general. But the pair aren't familiar with the area and attempt to get directions to the city from a passerby. They find her in a cave burning incense, the smell of which elicits something within the traveler, causing them to pass out. The traveler awakens to find themselves in an ethereal plain in front of a large celestial tree. There, they hear three fateful words. The sages think themselves to be all-knowing, but we alone are wise to the virtue in those acts of folly. In this war, not even a single pawn may be spared, because on this chessboard, checkmate is not where the game ends. We are gathered here today to remember our dear comrade. In honor of her sacrifice, all work should halt for half a day as the nation mourns her passing. <laughs> Merely half a day? People say the Northland Bank's true currencies are blood and tears. But Mayor, even speaking as a banker, that sounds a little unconscionable. Rosaline died in a foreign land. But you heartless businessmen and dignitaries, always with a convenient excuse to remain in the comfort of your homeland, you couldn't hope to understand. So why don't you keep your mouths shut? We don't want to make the children cry. Hey, come on now. Even I don't think this is the right time or place for a fight. <laughs> Utterly risible. Though her methods tarnished her honor, 
Loafalta's sacrifice is a great pity. Her loss shall not hinder our progress. But Dottore, what of Scaramouche and the Gnosis from Inazuma? Conventional wisdom holds that divine knowledge cannot be rationally comprehended. After conquering the divine gaze, he will make his next move. It's time to end tonight's foolish theatrics. Right now, you have no captive audience. Let every worthy sacrifice be carved in ice. With this nation, endure for all time. In the name of Her Majesty the Tsaritsa, we will seize authority from the gods. Absolute peace. Such is the gift from the Tsaritsa, such is Her Majesty's benevolence. Now you rest in this coffin, encased in layer upon layer of ice. Ah, but Rosaline, I promise you, your final resting place will be the entirety of the old world. I must say, you're looking very young today, Doctor. You know very well that I do not take that as a compliment. So, where's the segment in the prime of his life, then? <laughs> He's busy with... A little experiment in blasphemy. <gasps> what was that? So, what'd you think? That was volume two of Genshin Retold. And that was also the last seven months of my life. But really, I actually really enjoyed making this video and I hope that you enjoyed it. So if you did, or you didn't, let me know in the comments. I would really appreciate it. Also, don't forget to check out the Discord server if you want to chat or, you know, talk about Genshin or whatever. Also, obviously, if you want another one of these, you should check out the Patreon. Like I said before, super helps me out and will definitely help in the creation of the next one of these videos. Regardless, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for watching this. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next time.